Dzień dobry Państwu, witam bardzo serdecznie. Zaczynamy naszą konferencję. Cieszę się, że są Państwo tak licznie zgromadzeni. Cieszę się oczywiście też z obecności wszystkich tych, którzy są z nami dzięki transmisji online. Dzisiejsza konferencja jest dopiero pierwszą, która rozpoczyna cały cykl. Dzisiaj będziemy rozmawiali oczywiście o technologiach, o nowych technologiach w medycynie, ale także o tym, jakie instytucje wspierają innowacje w medycynie. Cieszę się bardzo, że jesteśmy w tak szerokim gronie, bo Państwo dobrze wiedzą, że ta współpraca między samorządami, firmami, uniwersytetami jest bardzo ważna. Konferencja LubTech Digital Health 2021, która powstała z inicjatywy klastra Lubelska Medycyna. To jest największy klaster, który działa w obszarze zdrowia i medycyny w Polsce, a współorganizatorami tego wydarzenia jest Urząd Marszałkowski Województwa Lubelskiego. Urząd Miasta Lublin, Uniwersytet Medyczny w Lublinie i Uniwersytet Marii Kiri Skłotowskiej w Lublinie. Z nami dzisiaj są, z czego bardzo się cieszymy, przedstawiciele administracji publicznej, przedstawiciele nauki i biznesu, podmiotów leczniczych, nasi dzisiejsi paneliści, eksperci, bardzo serdecznie witamy. Bardzo się cieszymy z obecności online z ekspertów z zagranicznych uniwersytetów. Dziś z nami także przedstawiciele mediów. No i witam wszystkich Państwa, tych, którzy są tutaj, tych, którzy oglądają nasz stream. Najprostsza szansa, by zobaczyć stream, który będzie także tłumaczony, to po prostu wejść na stronę lubtech.lublin.eu i tam jest stream z tłumaczeniem w języku angielskim. A ja zapraszam już na scenę członka Zarządu Województwa Lubelskiego, pana Sebastiana Tojaka, który przywita Państwa w imieniu Marszałka Województwa Lubelskiego. Serdecznie zapraszam. Witam Państwa bardzo serdecznie, Szanowny Panie Prezydencie, Szanowni Panowie Rektorzy, wszyscy Szanowni Państwo, Pani Minister, która jest z nami zapewne online. Mam wielki zaszczyt i wielką przyjemność przywitać Państwa w Lubelskim Centrum Konferencyjnym w imieniu Pana Marszałka Jarosława Stawierskiego oraz Pana Marszałka Zbigniewa Wojciechowskiego, który również zapowiedział swoją obecność dzisiaj na tej konferencji, ale z uwagi na inne ważne obowiązki służbowe nie może być z nami dzisiaj fizycznie, na pewno jest z nami mentalnie i wspiera nas w naszych rozmowach i dyskusjach. Szanowni Państwo, miałem przygotować formułę bardzo otwartą i bardzo luźną, natomiast zadzwonił do mnie dzisiaj rano właśnie marszałek Wojciechowski i poprosił mnie, abym jednak z uwagi na tak zacne grono, które dzisiaj będzie nas tutaj słuchało, obserwowało, abym zasugerował mi, abym jednak posiłkował się materiałami, materiałami profesjonalnymi. Dlatego pozwolą Państwo, że otworzę tą swoją przygotowany wcześniej materiał i, i powiem parę słów na temat polityki regionalnej, która wpisuje się w to, o czym Państwo dzisiaj będziecie rozmawiali. Z całą pewnością muszę zaznaczyć jedną bardzo ważną rzecz. Zdrowie mieszkańców naszego regionu jest dla nas priorytetem. Jest to element bardzo ważny, na który kładziemy bardzo duży nacisk. I nie będę tutaj, muszę to powiedzieć, oczekujemy od Państwa bardzo wiele. And we do expect a lot from you. Uniwersytetu Medycznego, Uniwersytetu Marii Kirii w Lublinie bardzo duże oczekiwania spoczywa na nas, jako na przedstawicielach władzy samorządowej i regionalnej, bardzo duża odpowiedzialność. Ale, ta odpowiedzia ale tą odpowiedzialnością również chcielibyśmy się z Państwem podzielić. Dlatego bardzo się cieszę, że takie spotkanie dzisiaj ma miejsce, ponieważ jest to bardzo dobra formuła do tego, aby, aby rozmawiać, aby dzielić się swoimi doświadczeniami, swoją wiedzą, aby tą wiedzę przekazywać, aby szczerze rozmawiać o tym, co jeszcze możemy zrobić, aby poprawić sytuację w służbie, w ochronie zdrowia. Szanowni Państwo, te elementy, o których mówiłem wcześniej, one z całą pewnością są przez Państwa dostrzegane w dokumentach programowych, które przygotowujemy, przygotowujemy na perspektywę 21-27 
nawet z taką ramą czasową do 2030 roku. Z całą pewnością zapisy dotyczące zdrowia odnaleźli państwo w Regionalnej Strategii Innowacji do 2030 roku. Tutaj pojawiają się elementy i obszary naszej aktywności, którą chcielibyśmy, do której chcielibyśmy państwa zaprosić. Władze województwa inspirują, animują podmioty z naszego regionu i zapraszają je do, do wspólnej pracy na rzecz poprawy ochrony zdrowia, poziomu ochrony zdrowia w naszym regionie. Również, szanowni państwo, proszę zwrócić uwagę na to, że aspekt zdrowotny jest u nas bardzo mocno akcentowany w strategii rozwoju województwa lubelskiego do 2030 roku. Tutaj mówimy o promocji i rozwoju usług prozdrowotnych, uzdrowiskowych oraz gospodarki senioralnej, a poprawa jakości świadczenia usług zdrowotnych jako konieczny element wzmacniania kapitału społecznego w regionie. Te elementy są dla nas strategiczne. Pamiętajmy, szanowni państwo, o tym, że definiujemy nasz region w dwóch obszarach strategicznych. W obszarze żywnościowym, czyli traktujemy nasz region jako element, ja to nazywam, obszaru żywieniowego, gdzie staramy, staramy się wprowadzić do mentalności, do, do, do sfery publicznej informacji o tym, że region lubelski to jest region, który zapewnia strategiczne zasoby żywieniowe, ale z drugiej strony mówimy również o strategicznym znaczeniu zdrowia. Mieliście państwo namiastkę tego zagadnienia w czasie trwającej pandemii. To tak naprawdę otworzyło nam oczy na to, jak ważne jest zdrowie i jak wiele jeszcze elementów jest do poprawy w tym systemie. Ja sam doświadczyłem sytuacji związanej z moimi najbliższymi, gdzie tak naprawdę pewne sytuacje musieliśmy dopiero kreować. Nie byliśmy do końca przygotowani i to musimy sobie powiedzieć otwarcie i szczerze na to, co nas spotkało. Tutaj wielkie słowa uznania dla, dla państwa środowiska za tą kreatywność, za tą odwagę, gotowość do wprowadzania ad hoc bardzo ciekawych rozwiązań, które pozwoliły nam tą sytuację w miarę opanować. Chciałbym tych sytuacji uniknąć. Chciałbym, aby region lubelski, no i oczywiście cały nasz kraj był przygotowany na tego rodzaju scenariusze, aby to, to zaplecze i za, zarówno technologiczne, techniczne, ale zwłaszcza zaplecze związane z wiedzą na temat zagrożeń było już przygotowane, było gotowe, abyśmy te rozwiązania mogli po prostu wdrażać, a nie dopiero nad nimi pracować. Ja wiem, że to jest trudne, że, że życie pisze bardzo nie... Bardzo nowe scenariusze, które nie zawsze da się. I know not everything can be foreseen. Not every scenario can be foreseen, but we should be simply ready as much as we can. Please have a look at our uh, healthcare promotion strategy uh, of uh, Lubelskie for 21-27. This program, this document also highlights the relevance of integrated uh, e-services in healthcare, digital services in healthcare, meaning also upgrades of existing ICT systems, smart hospitals, smart networks, IT tools, supporting uh, medical profession and the development of medical profession, including specialized targeted solutions for um, geriatric care, for cardiology, etc. Et so this is all seen in the in the in our healthcare program for 2127. Uh, and of course, we can we can meet, we can talk, but the key to success is funding. Poza tymi dokumentami programowymi władze samorządowe Besides programming documents, uh, regional government also remembers about funding. So a large part of our program to absorb EU funds for the coming years is also focused on R&D funding, on innovation, on development of healthcare services, because this is what we believe to be a priority, one of the priorities in the development of the region up to uh, 2030. 
kończąc szanowni państwo, bo trochę się rozgadałem, bardzo przepraszam, bo nie miałem informacji, nie mam czasu. All in all. Tylko pozwoliłem sobie na troszkę dłuższą wypowiedź, ale już kończę. Thanks for being patient. Bardzo so far, anyway, just to close, let me stress, the implementation of local development goals is not possible without the support of the, the bigger R&D sector in the development and commercialization of knowledge and applications of advanced technologies. This is particularly true about our healthcare policy. That's why our appreciation and thanks for, for the support of the cluster, of your environment. And this is really happening under the leadership of, of a Medical University in Lublin. Thank you again for joining us. I hope this will be a productive day. I do believe your expertise, your experience will help the region grow to the benefit of uh, the residents of Lubelskie. Thank you. Sebastian Trojak, członek Zarządu Województwa Lubelskiego. Bardzo dziękujemy. Sebastian Trojak, thank you very much. Let me ask uh, uh, Mayor of Lublin, uh, Dr. Krzysztof Zuk, welcome to our meeting. We are happy to have you here with us. Ladies and gentlemen, this conference is a consequence of many year uh, activities uh, taken within our medical cluster in Lublin and our university activities, uh, activities at Lublin-based universities. We've been trying to build a convergent strategy for development of the city of universities. We, as a city, we wrote in our strategy that uh, academic nature of Lublin is a priority that we wish to follow, and we take a long-term action to follow this uh, strategy and to build university strategies uh, in a similar way. But also universities co cooperate or, or take part in long-term projects, uh, and this is why our region can be said to have uh, numerous uh, achievements uh, on, on this line, along these lines, and we have created an environment for further investment and further co cooperation with business and other units. It's difficult to talk about innovative development of a city if if there is a missing element, if there is no developmental uh, drive at the level of universities. You cannot talk about the same at the level of regional without academic potential. So using regional uh, uh, funds in operational projects and other uh, fund channels, we manage to develop good practices for other cities and regions because we used, to a large extent, the innovative potential of our universities. We have wonderful teams, uh, research teams, and research projects developing online. What we have, uh, what we have uh, behind us is certainly a success, but we realize we have a very long way ahead of us. And I believe university members absolutely realize that development takes time, uh, developing uh, conditions, for instance, for startups, requires a lot of environmental or infrastructural uh, 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 solutions that we still need to develop, need to work on. We know that uh, financing at the first stage is relatively easy, but then uh, commercializing uh, the ideas and commercializing companies can be a problem. Still, Lublin stays a very good example of a city that is a leader on a Polish market, or at least among leaders, uh, that uh, uh, allow development of over 30 uh, startups with uh, Lublin based uh, university uh, researchers, we risked that step and we are successful to a large extent.
extent. This conference is also important for yet another reason. We have uh, over, uh, we have almost, uh, uh, almost 2,000 companies in Lublin uh, working in IT sector, and we see that this uh, industry uh, develops in Lublin is an uh, important part of the economic sector of Lublin. So we have a successful strategy of developing that uh, sector. Uh, two uni uh, universities that uh, also join this uh, sector with new technologies developing there and being marketed uh, in, in companies. So now, let's try to put all these things together. Uh, let's try to put the academic environment in IT sector and not only in medical universities, but a lot of other universities research and development, and then great uh, IT companies whose potential is growing stead, uh, steadfast. And let's maybe seek for the convergence effect or uh, synergy effect that I believe is uh, available to us. Also, international contacts uh, of universities and businesses can give us additional impetus uh, on the way to uh, developing new technologies. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your being here. Uh, let me uh, pass my uh, uh, words of support for all your actions, all the actions that you're taking uh, in a part of a uh, strategy of the vivership, strategy of the city, strategies of development of uh, academic environments, that, uh, but also in day-by-day uh, -day solutions uh, at, you can count on us when all kind of problems are uh, to be solved uh, with any help of us. And we also hope for uh, uh, cooperation with uh, with Vivership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your voice. I mentioned that uh, uh, the conference is interpreted and uh, uh, interpreting is available in uh, stream and also uh, in sign language uh, prepared by the company Migam. Let me ask uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Wojciech Zauska, Rector of Medical University of Lublin. Mr. Marshall, Mr. Mayer, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Rector, ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests of the conference, I um, feel privileged and joyful uh, for having me, uh, for your having me here, and um, uh, I've been participating in the actions of a medical cluster for many years, and I feel a need to uh, thank Mayor Krzysztof Zsolk that he has been so intensely involved in developing, in uh, in, uh, in developing the uh, city infrastructure. Uh, uh, that also translated onto good infrastructure for our students, so in, but also institutionally. And uh, uh, he was very helpful in developing all our initiatives. Many, many thanks to the uh, Marshal Office of Lublin. And I believe uh, the, the cooperation as we are having right now is the best uh, from uh, the best uh, unprecedentedly good. We have a very open approach. We have understanding of our ideas, which helps us. And we find it very helpful on our way to initiatives and development. We are just about to open a new sporting uh, uh, facility. And without uh, Yaroslav Stawiarski's uh, um, uh, uh, interest and, and support for this initiative also when he was a uh, vice minister of sport. Uh, and also the uh, uh, Mr. Wojciechowski's, uh, 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 who is vice marshal, his uh, effort to support our ideas. So let me once again thank you very much because this cooperation is extremely important and uh, builds us power, gives us power for further initiatives. Having this, uh, having uh, large uh, international uh, experience and expertise uh, developing our English division with uh, ac academic programs that we uh, that also gives us uh, new ideas for education and uh, and we are going to develop this project 
Uh, we have a new meeting uh, scheduled for 21st of uh, September. I think it's going to be extremely interesting for our developmental purposes because, you know, with all the changes uh, in political situations uh, in countries from uh, in countries where our students come from, we have a domination of Taiwan and Thailand and uh, also Scandinavia and uh, American students, but we are also trying to uh, acquire students from uh, eastern parts of Asia and Japan. And I think our offer is going to be extremely important on that map. Our meeting today is mostly related to the idea of uh, IT-based or ICT uh, technologies and using the knowledge and expertise of many specialists in digitization, uh, data analysis and modeling to allow all kind of uh, medical stuff to develop effective solutions, effective tools for diagnosis and treatment. We are a specific region on the map of Europe and the world. The region where access to medical services, particularly in terms of specialist treatment, is not equal. There is a problem with equity of access or equality of access. That, that is related with how certain institutions are distributed. And we hope that the use of ICT uh, uh, technology may not only help us improve our services, but also to reschedule, reshape the way our institutions are distributed. Uh, I'm talking about what is usually called the Eastern Wall, Eastern part of uh, Poland. This is a traditional division between Western and Eastern Poland uh, in, in terms of civilizational levels. And I'm absolutely sure that when we take a good direction, we can become a source of good practices and good solutions uh, and showing others how certain, certain problems can be translated onto successes. So we are so happy to have uh, representatives of a uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Health and Health Support, uh, uh, and we are enjoying close cooperation with two uh, uh, ministries, obviously of health and health uh, care. Uh, we are cooperating uh, with uh, uh, Minister Niedzielski, but also uh, also Minister Czarnek, Minister of Education. Uh, who absolutely understands the need for telemedical uh, uh, solutions and the uh, projects realized within the Ministry uh, uh, of Education. Uh, Professor Radak is a perfect example, a conference uh, for telemedicine for uh, school students. Uh, and the thousands of people engaged in developing the project uh, for all over Poland for telemedical solutions. But that's only one strand, one, one direction. We want to be active on many other uh, ideas. And I believe that uh, with that uh, kind of engagement, that kind of readiness for participation, we hope for fruitful cooperation and solutions. Other universities are also open to cooperation. And let me thank to uh, uh, other uh, uh, rectors uh, to the director of Maria Kiri Skłodowska. Uh, so we developed the uh, development of a, a data analysis or digitization center uh, to develop tools for all kind of uh, solutions that are needed in social space of the Lublin region and develop uh, good practices for other regions. Let me once again thank for the invitation. Uh, let me uh, uh, promise you our active participation in all innovative directions and sections. And uh, I'm so happy for uh, for uh, the support of uh, our munis municipal and uh, voivodeship uh, authorities for our projects. Many, many thanks, uh, Mr. Professor. And let me ask uh, the Rector of Maria Kiri Skłodowska University, Professor Radosław Dobrowolski. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, uh, Mr. Marshall, Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, Mr. Rector, uh, honourable uh, honourable guests, rectors and directors of uh, of Lublin-based universities. 
After those many years and uh, many words and declarations that were that have been spoken by uh, by my pre speakers, there is not much to add. But maybe I could accent certain particular uh, elements of what have been said in what have been said uh, so far, because I think uh, extremely vital ideas for what we are going to do in the future, and not only in the context of our conference today and the wider context of building good practices of cooperation, of building synergy, of building convergence of our main strands of activity. The conference that we are just opening that uh, offers a promise of being a very important one is, first of, first of all, important because of what it, of its content, uh, but on the other hand, it's uh, it's because of its importance of uh, idea of cooperation between Lublin-based uh, items that can add something to the common good. Without uh, municipal and voivodeship, uh, uh, voivodeship leaders, this integration wouldn't be possible because they are showing the main strategic directions uh, and allow us to work together supporting and uh, empowering this cooperation. Uh, we obviously, uh, the importance of the conference is also because it deals with innovativeness, digitization, implementation of new technologies in various uh, uh, spheres of public life. And one more element is still uh, stressful, this integration thing, integration, cooperation, synergy. In the reality as we know today, as complex as it is, without this constructive cooperation, sharing of ideas, we wouldn't be able to get any strategy. Strategy has been mentioned by Mayor of Lublin, uh, Dr. Zog, and I strongly believe that the declarations uttered by us all can be translated in the future onto real life actions and effects implementations, which I wish to uh, all of you and to myself. Referring to uh, uh, Rector uh, Zawuska, I think that for a year, uh, during our last, uh, during, uh, for, for, a last for, for the last year, I think this cooperation has uh, become more um, visible, more tangible, and think that in the coming years, we are, we will be ready to say, uh, to, to list our successes. And we have working uh, boundary criteria developed uh, that also have to do with our conference, uh, which promises a good environment, good framework for, for the work. So um, let me also add uh, thanks to the list that uh, uh, let me also thank to, uh, to the panelists, to uh, organizers, and I wish my, myself, let me wish you very fruitful proceedings and effects of the conference. And once again, let me repeat that uh, that soon all those positive ideas uttered during the conference will be translated into implementations. Many, many thanks. Thank you very much for uh, your voice. And let's move to our session one, uh, because we have four uh, sessions, four panels ahead of us. Uh, and uh, with with uh, with our uh, members uh, here, and also uh, our uh, stream uh, 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 members not present at the so we are going to talk about trends and about uh, trends, objectives, national support systems, and I hope we have our first. Uh, 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 digitally present uh, 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 guest, uh, Mr. Ptaszynski. I hope we will be able to connect soon so that I could uh, pass first question to you. Uh, but you, uh, if you if you can see the slide, you will also be able to see uh, who are going to be the first, uh, who are also going to be our next uh, members of the panel. So my first question is, uh, about uh, uh, EU financial. Uh, hello, Mr. Director. Uh, I hope I hope we have you here. I hope you you, you found time for having us here, uh, having uh, for for uh, being us. Okay. In previous EU financial perspectives, significant resources have been allocated to implementing certain platform to support healthcare processes, but. We know that there is a strong need for further investment in this in this area. 
So what type of e-health investments will be funded using EU funds in the new perspectives in 21-27, and what value of investment can be expected in the coming years? So that's uh, my first question. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your invitation. I'm happy to be here among you. I think that thanks to such uh, programs uh, that we are working on, like Digital Poland, we can meet. Uh, and this is, you know, that offers us great connectivity. And we can be all around the map of Poland and still contact and talk without obstacles and have a wide debate. Thanks very much for your question. It's, it's rather difficult to talk about the future without summing up what, what has been going on in the, in the, in the period that is uh, coming to its end. I'm, I'm talking about 2014, 2020, because a lot of actions have been supported or were supported within our project, uh, this Digital Poland program, operational program. But we have to take into account that uh, implementing a lot of ideas within within a health region, not only e-health, but generally e-health, is uh, reserved for operational digital program, but also for other regional operational programs. But we also have to remember that all the initiatives realized under the premises or under the health sector is also realized by within big infrastructure and environment and in, uh, intelligent development. So we have to take into account that the streaming of funds come from many sources, and they obviously are, in a way, in an overlap, in a, in a financial and functional overlap. Now, as for the future, and for the future perspective, 21-27, that we are programming, that we are planning, that we are going to implement soon, or in a way we are going to negotiate with the uh, European Commission. Actually, we our programs are there, and we are just preparing for the negotiation stage. And of course, we do communicate with uh, European Commission so that uh, to avoid problems within with final acceptance of the projects. And we hope that in the months to come, we will be able to get full negotiations for the projects or for the program and uh, have it accepted, approved. And, uh, and this is going to be uh, FETS uh, uh, project. I'm going to use this European Funds for Digital Development. So, uh, and this is actually a continuation or a new phase of digital public. And I hope the first bids or the first uh, projects will be uh, will be uh, announced in the second quarter of 2022. Uh, this conference is uh, definitely about giving a wider perspective on the projects and the panel uh, that we are in today. Let me say a couple of words about the huge success of what we have, what we have done so far. Uh, I mean, uh, growing or enhancing availability of public services uh, in an e-platform. So when you take a perspective of an average poll. Uh, is a uh, is a patient gov.pl, patient gov.pl, or internet uh, internet account, patient internet account. It's called ITP. I think that perhaps each of you, at least a citizen of Poland who uh, who who are here on on the floor or uh, uh, in in the room, can see uh, that this is a spectacular success of a project, and obviously it has been to a large extent. Uh, um, uh, th this success was in a way forced by the pandemic. So, you know, because we needed to stay at home, but on the other hand, you needed, uh, you needed health support. Uh, you know, the, the access to referrals, to uh, uh, receipts. So certainly you needed to have to, to, to have to migrate to the virtual world with medical care. And the uh, numbers uh, say for themselves, figures say for themselves. Uh, 
from 800,000 uh, of, uh, of users at the beginning of 2020, and now you have 5 million users at the end of 2020. So it's like uh, well, more than five time growth of uh, users. So almost, uh, obviously, these numbers come from nothing. They do not come from nothing. Um, the, 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 uh, a lot of people who uh, used vaccination program uh, used uh, used this IKP used their uh, patient accounts because they needed the uh, COVID passports when they wished to travel or all over Poland or abroad uh, during last uh, holidays. I won't be able to mention all the functionalities available under the uh, under the account under the portal, but you need to stress that this is a direction that we are going to follow in our operational project in the new perspective. We have a technical problem with connectivity. Digital and uh, we can see huge, we can see growing, we, we can see growing demands uh, of uh, social demands. So certainly we are going to support uh, further the initiatives and, uh, and to further develop the fa f functionalities available uh, and also allow them further integration, make them better, make them further, uh, make them uh, available to more platforms and more users. And still, there is a lot to do at that stage uh, 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 in in that field. Preparing for our meeting today, I allowed myself to to uh, refer uh, to refer to uh, to the funds to the amounts that were spent in the in the last in the last time perspective uh, you know that uh, this uh, closing this perspective will still 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 take some time so we have been developing 17 projects within our program and they are at a different stage of uh, maturity and advancement some of them have been closed three projects are closed uh, the scale uh, of all these projects is uh, 80 uh, 800 million zloty so uh, for you to realize how much money has been spent for the projects we are running sorry another uh, lag uh, in investing in all technologies supporting health and healthcare, uh, supporting of uh, data analysis and data um, transfers of different kinds. Uh, and of course, we are uh, connecting more and more users uh, who are adding more and more data to the systems so that they are more and more available to uh, to the users of our applications. The largest projects that I could mention here is, is uh, I'm sorry, we still are in problem. There is a connectivity issue. Um, okay. Okay. Let, okay. We we need just uh, we need just a couple of minutes for a little bit shift in 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 connection. For Director Tashinsky, we are absolutely interested in uh, in in your answers, and and still there is a number of questions to ask. So I'd be happy to. Can you can you read me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's try once again. Sorry for. Sorry for. Uh, Okay, so we are back to uh, to the issue of um, 
of the, those most spectacular and most uh, important projects within this operational program. So number one is uh, what I called P1 or the portal for collecting all kinds of data uh, about medical uh, uh, medical um, uh, various medical um, operations or actions taken. You know, it, it's a database on what happened medical uh, with medical operations concerning a given patient, and of course, allowing access to data to different stakeholders of the projects. Other projects uh, whose value reaches 80 or 60, 70 million uh, zlotys concern concern development of various public uh, services for patients allowing access to all kinds of public data uh, but, uh, uh, and also with participation of a uh, ministry of uh, ministry of internal affairs uh, various health uh, providers uh, Ministry of uh, uh, National Security and others. So uh, this uh, lost financial perspective, I would say that a lot of money went to support health and e-health and to develop uh, accessibility and availability of all kind of services and e-services in that field. Once again, I mean e-receipts, e-leaves, uh, or e-referrals. Uh, we cannot, obviously we have to take into account that uh, these operations and these projects must uh, go hand in hand with building infrastructure because availability of services is only possible where, where they are technically available. So certainly uh, we are trying to allow internet access to all uh, interested patients because we want to avoid a situation where where connectivity is a barrier in the in the use of uh, services it's extremely difficult to build um, you know um, functional infrastructure and and uh, hardware infrastructure all over Poland but in the coming uh, financial perspective Sorry, in the in the finishing in the ending perspective, we have increased uh, uh, the accessibility, availability of internet all over Poland. Uh, uh, the, 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 we, we developed it by two million uh, households. I mean, two million households more uh, have have access to uh, internet, including uh, e-health services. But of course, we mean generally all kind of services is in all kind of uh, functionalities uh, available to two million uh, households more in the last perspective. Another important issue, which I think is worthwhile and maybe a key factor for increasing access, public access, and also increasing the need and uh, the supply uh, for all kinds of services is the issue of digital competences. I strongly believe that the way uh, uh, that we are and Pelza are uh, uh, to come along uh, is is uh, is rather long. I mean, convincing or persuading Poles or educating Poles uh, to switch to uh, digital access and digital services uh, is it, it requires a lot of effort. It's true that four or five million people using uh, digital services in e health is a lot, but still, it's one fifth or one fourth of people who could use it. So yes, there is still a lot to do, 
um, there is still a, a lot of effort for us to take. Uh, what can we do? I mean, the question is, what, what is it that we can do that um, people, uh, when people use so much, when people rely so much on banking systems, and there is a larger number of users in that field, so how to translate that success onto, uh, onto absolutely easily accessible services uh, uh, dealing with e-health? So somehow we are, we, um, we are to invent, we are to think uh, over a system to make our uh, uh, system more popular. Now, as far as our future is concerned, we will have a similar amount of money uh, in the coming perspective. The e-health component is vital of the new project, a new program, and, uh, and the document that has been prepared and will be negotiated and is obviously available publicly because uh, we have been discussing it in a wider or a narrower public and the uh, social consultation of it are over, almost over. I believe this e -health, our e-health proposals are positively assessed publicly, uh, and it's strong support uh, in uh, all kind of public services or in strong emphasis uh, in, in the whole sector of uh, public services to be financed is also uh, uh, assessed positively. Uh, by the public. However, we are not ready to say which particular projects uh, will be uh, will be realized, for instance, without contest-based uh, uh, approach or competitive-based approach. Uh, Five million euro that we plan for uh, for those services will uh, will perhaps be devoted to that. This is more or less what we plan to do. I'm not talking uh, only about publicly available services, but also um, all kind of information, data use, data analysis. We uh, believe uh, two, uh, two million six, uh, sorry, 260 million euro to be able to develop different projects or different institution and field in the health uh, sector for initiatives in that field. Let me also say we are going to continue projects or programs for developing digital skills. 200 million euro was spent last in this last perspective. Now we wish to spend 100 million euro. And the reduction in this figure may, be, may come as a surprise, but, but, uh, but the, the truth is that uh, digital skills, uh, financing digital skills moved uh, from our program, was moved from our program to other soft skill projects. Uh, also regional projects, operational projects within within EU funds. So that's uh, that's not a reduction in the sum of money spent to uh, digital skills, but they were re, uh, reprogrammed, rescheduled to other projects. Uh, let me stress that our project, our program. We showed, we emphasized a number of competencies, competencies within particularly field of e-health services that we would like to support in a particular way. Also, as far as uh, the use, uh, the use of such services by public units, uh, uh, by healthcare units, and we would like that a huge amount of this money could be spent for healthcare and health institutions. So we talk about different sources, and uh, I would like to I would like us to shift to the topic that you have started on, the issue of how COVID nineteen, which is still remains a 
a larger challenge for health systems, and we know it's not the only one. How do you think this uh, funds for uh, combating the uh, COVID pandemic and how the money spent on that helps, uh, how the money for digitization helps uh, combating the pandemic? Well, indeed, indeed, I have already mentioned uh, a couple of initiatives. The pandemic, uh, global pandemic, surprised uh, our country as well, like like um, everywhere else. But I think we uh, took action relatively fast uh, to mitigate uh, the effects of the pandemic. I think the most spectacular, the biggest project that we launched was the so-called P1 platform uh, project, uh, which is a, a digital platform uh, registering medical incidents, medical cases. Uh, we funded the platform with uh, 120 million uh, Polish losses, about 30 million euro. This was to enhance the functionality and to make um, medical services, e-services available to citizens. This was, for example, electronic registration for specific uh, medical procedures. E-services are not implemented overnight. To prepare a, a project, and the project's life cycle is about three years, so certain functionalities can be implemented right away, but we have to still wait for the final effect. So the uh, online patient account will be uh, enhanced with certain new functionalities and uh, teleconsultation uh, was another step. We are not sure when uh, the pandemic uh, finishes, so we are still expecting the fourth wave in Poland. So uh, this uh, system will support the teleconsultation system, and the platform will be really a strong uh, foundation for the overall um, e-transformation. We want more medics to be part of the platform, to provide more advice, more services. Another thing is online e-prescriptions. At this point, we are using the system, so e-prescriptions are available to patients who have used specific uh, medicine before and continue their treatment. So now they can uh, register the needs online, uh, uh, needs for a new recipe, a new pardon, a new prescription online, so they don't have to really talk to a physician in person. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for um, elaborating on this uh, question and uh, for for touching on on the sources of funding. We do have. Um, Digital Poland operational program. We have EU funds for digital development, but I'd like to ask for for other sources of funding of e health services and development. Well, in my first um, in the first part of my of my answer, I, I also mentioned different sources of funding. EU funds for, for digital development are certainly there. We do have a support for e-health services under regional operational programs. These programs are managed by, by marshals, uh, local self-government in each region. The, the question is how much money will be available for, for health services. but. 
Starting January this year, we uh, have uh, talked to the regional governments about what responsibilities, what scope of responsibilities will be shifted to the regions under the program and what can, what can be done under different national programs to make this financial intervention effective and uh, so that the funds do not overlap from different sources. And we have also discussed how we are going to intervene. I think uh, major agreements have been made and we will uh, conclude a partnership document, a partnership um, agreement that will put together all initiatives under different programs and covering different sources of funding. Speaking about e-health, there is a follow-up uh, program to infrastructure and development, a new program that uh, envisages major funds allocated to hospitals, to clinics, and uh, still some funds or a sizable amount of funds that I believe uh, we will be able to negotiate with the Commission under the National Recovery and Resilience Plan. This will uh, show what kind of action or what kind of individual projects will be undertaken um, owing to this source of funding. And this is uh, a really major a source of funding up to even 57 billion of euro. So the funds allocated to uh, healthcare services in the coming programming period will be really greater, as a matter of fact, than in the previous programming period. But still, the most important thing is to plan your interventions in such a way as to spend this money, money wisely and effectively so that they benefit everyone to the largest possible extent. So we have appointed a steering committee for health. They will keep uh, their fingers on the pulse and we'll see how these interventions will be divided among the national and regional level to make them complementary and simply to reap uh, the greatest benefits possible. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Director, for your contribution, for joining us for this talk. Michał Ptaszyński, Deputy Director for Digital Development in the Ministry of Funds and Regional Policy. And with us, we have another expert, Hubert Zeciński, Ministry of Health, Department of Innovation. We will talk about the funding of, of projects in terms of uh, digitization of the healthcare sector. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for for invitation. So let's move on to uh, questions, questions about the new fund financial perspective uh, and the targets for digitization in um, medical services in the new financial uh, perspective. So can you please elaborate on that? Well, thank you. Uh, Director Ptaszynski, a moment ago, showed you, gave you a picture of what possibilities there are in terms of funding of e-health services. Indeed, we, our situation is uh, that of having uh, uh, major resources available and to support the process, the process that is very dear to us in the Ministry of Health. I mean, for a number of years, we have been working hard to digitize medical healthcare services to make patients or to allow patients uh, an easy access to health services to make them at the very heart of the system uh, to be real partners 
in the system uh, partners who can manage their own health, who know a lot about their health, who really want to be healthy, and who are interested in uh, the means that are available in terms of um, also illness prevention or prophylaxis. Digitalization is no doubt what we need um, very much at the moment. And for the last year, we have seen how important digital services were and how helpful they were in the managing of, for example, the national uh, vaccination program. Without certain IT solutions that are in place, you, we wouldn't have been able to, uh, to manage certain processes. Just to mention e-prescriptions, uh, the vaccination management, registration of patients. So all these systems made it easier for patients to access uh, certain services via their online patient accounts. Digitization of healthcare services is not uh, the best possible solution that will resolve all, all issues, all problems in the system. This is just a, a set of solutions that are certainly helpful or conducive to certain optimization effects that we want to see. And this will benefit all, all the stakeholders in the system. I mean, the medical personnel, uh, medical facilities, so the, the, the personnel in general, and of course patients and, and service providers. Digitization will streamline uh, the whole system time-wise, but it, this will also improve security and safety of personnel and reliability of the system. So, our efforts throughout the pandemic uh, do not only focus on e-prescriptions or patient registration. We have a number of services that are being launched uh, all the time uh, that contribute to, to a better quality of health services in Poland. This is, for example, uh, uh, the Gabinet Gov.pl, which is the, the surgery, uh, e-surgery, exchange of uh, medical documentation or exchange of um, data on medical cases. Speaking about active users of um, online patient account, this is uh, a few million last year. Now, which is September 2021, we have close to 12 million active users of um, uh, e-patient account. We are very happy to see so many patients uh, trusting the system and actually using using the e-patient system effectively. We believe this growing trend will continue. Um, of course, and this is not a secret, this is thanks to the pandemic and its effects, but still we believe it makes uh, great sense for every poll, for every citizen to be able to access data on their health status and such an, such an online account is the best possible place, best possible destination for patients to, to check and manage their health data. And the director also mentioned certain new um, capabilities and, and capacity in terms of uh, funding uh, under National Recovery Program and, and several other sources. These funds will, of course, uh, uh, help social development. I mean, the first uh, program and uh, REACT EU instrument. Out of this array of uh, sources of funding, we will uh, try to make the best use 
by our standards using these diverse sources of funding revolves around a number of components that together make up uh, the whole e-health uh, system. Uh, just to mention uh, public e-health services, system services. Another thing is uh, clinical decision-making support tools. Uh, then there is the use of artificial intelligence in terms of, uh, for example, analysis of big data and, and prophylaxis. And there is, of course, uh, telemedicine. And one more thing that we should not overlook is uh, cyber security. Uh, why cyber security is, uh, is part of the list? Um, in healthcare services, cyber security is uh, absolutely fundamental. When we deal with uh, the processing of uh, health data of, of citizens, this data must be safeguarded because it's a very valuable data set that should be used only for strictly defined purposes, medical procedures, or uh, related uh, to diagnosis or, 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 or healthcare. And we will uh, uh, certainly put pressure on that. And each of these aspects I have enumerated is, is really a complex one. And we don't have time to, to explain all that. Uh, but still, speaking about cybersecurity, as it is in the case of all the other areas I have mentioned, for cybersecurity, we program certain activities intended for particular stakeholders because cybersecurity is a certain interest that um, or a certain aspect that affects all stakeholders and also imposes other duties on different stakeholders. There are different duties to be assumed by, by medical personnel, by system admins, by patients, but all participants of this system of health data processing has a specific set of duties and at least should be aware of a, a certain basic, uh, say, hygiene of data processing and cybersecurity, cyber threats. So this is really relevant in the whole uh, constellation. Well, we have with us representatives um, of, of all these um, stakeholders you mentioned. So. All these goals you're talking about, how are they going to translate into specific action in the in the coming years? How do we put this theory into practice? And no doubt, digitization of uh, healthcare involves a certain uh, transitional period or grace period, and this will be this this really applies to all stakeholders to healthcare facilities, patients, or other groups that are part of this system. Uh, speaking about um, healthcare facilities, there are two important um, areas to talk about, both related to certain regular regular activities promoting the development of such facilities. One is digital maturity of healthcare facilities, and the other is the development of or, or competence building or awareness building of uh, digitization among medical uh, personnel. So these two areas must be addressed, and they have to go together 
And they should be, there should be certain activities implemented in, in both these areas. Whether we speak about a central or regional level, such activities should contribute to the overall development of e-health um, system. So even the best IT solution will not do the trick, will not work when the users cannot use it, when the users cannot benefit from that because they lack competence. And this is true about all um, solutions that can be implemented, whether, whether now or in the coming uh, financial perspective. In a nutshell, this is relevant for, for healthcare facilities to have appropriate infrastructure to get connected to existing e-services, whether this is the, 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 the e-surgery or data exchange or different systems integrated with the, the P1 platform. And another thing is to develop competence of the medical personnel, but also managers who, uh, who manage such facilities. They should have proper IT competence and be knowledgeable of, of certain solutions, certain tools uh, that are implemented. They also should have knowledge on cybersecurity that I mentioned before. So this is our shared goal when we look at um, digitization of uh, healthcare services to develop the proper infrastructure and awareness of users. So let's close with the innovation in um, healthcare services, which is one of the leading motives of our meeting today. So what healthcare innovations are going to be uh, implemented? Uh, supported by by your ministry and uh, financial um, or financing institutions. Well, innovation is uh, is a really uh, is a subject that is really close to to my work to my um, uh, program. Our department uh, performs several analyses on um, innovations in healthcare services now. Uh, one of such initiatives which is currently running is a system or platform for post-COVID patients. This platform uh, employs uh, the best uh, diagnostic uh, technologies like uh, telematic strip or stethoscope or remote monitoring. Uh, all these innovations source data remotely. They measure specific parameters in the patient's environment. And uh, through certain apps and algorithms, they, they analyze data. They make decisions on specific patients uh, through a, a centralized monitoring system. This is a, a very important idea. We want to continue growing this idea through a number of pilot projects for specific solutions. We are looking carefully at areas where we can explore some possibilities that e-medicine offers. And there are, there are many such areas. Certainly, we should mention in the first place a cardio monitoring. The monitoring of, of pregnant women through through the KTG, uh, augmented reality. That's another area that can uh, help uh, optimize uh, the operations of healthcare services and facilities at different levels. But also the monitoring of. Um, uh, devices such as such as pacemaker so this is something 
um, that we are going to look at in the future, and also telemedicine that we want to grow in specific areas, medical areas. This is already happening through, for example, a project funded um, uh, by Norwegian funds. We want to continue this in the new perspective. We are looking at the possibilities that artificial intelligence uh, offers, for example, for analysis of individual uh, health status and in the context of supporting clinical decisions. AI is able to analyze uh, big data sets, uh, for example, for medical imagining and using algorithms that can detect anomalies, irregularities, and draw conclusions based on uh, large, large data sets. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director. Hubert Rzyciński was um, our guest. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you very much for your being here with us. And we are connecting with uh, another expert. And we are going to talk about uh, developmental issues. We are trying to get connected with uh, with uh, Ms. Alexandra uh, Mościcka Studzińska, Deputy Director of Expert Management Department in the National Center for Research and Development. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, let me start with a uh, question. Let me move to question. Taking into account uh, uh, what you usually do, that uh, you uh, that you support development, what kind of uh, what kind of uh, trends can you see? Uh, our area is a very important uh, area in our uh, in the development of a pandemic, and we, as an agency, we are trying to co-finance and develop research and development uh, programs. We cooperate in uh, intelligent development and uh, similar projects. Uh, we. Uh, uh, we uh, grant more than six million uh, uh, billion zloty uh, annually to finance innovation works, and we have announced more than seventy competitions. Our support offer is uh, used by research groups, uh, broadly understood IT working on broadly understood IT solutions for medicine. Uh, and our project, uh, which provides involvement of entrepreneurs of, uh, in the implementation of projects, and then uh, the implementation of project results, we observe a continuous strong trends visible in the applications in the field of medicine and medical biotechnology with use of artificial intelligence, machine learning and diagnostics, drug development, telemedicine. So uh, we believe that these solutions can add, can, um, can, can, uh, can be used in further uh, objectives of a Ministry of Health and Healthcare. Um, other uh, solutions uh, concern uh, changes in development of uh, uh, development of disease uh, on the basis of other uh, 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 techniques like uh, X-ray or uh, MRI. So, using uh, using uh, artificial intelligence allow analyzing huge amounts of data, which was unavailable by classical methods. So this is how we support the work of uh, uh, doctors, and we reduce the overload by, by the work of specialists, uh, allow them to analyze data, not to collect the data, not to browse for data. So uh, uh, they get algorithms to, uh, to flag certain changes and to allow the doctor to uh, concentrate on particular uh, d d difficult problematic areas. Uh, also, the telemedical uh, solutions allow us uh, mm, data, uh, analysis of data coming from different sources and making therapeutic decisions uh, uh, supported by this IT analysis uh, or AI analysis. That is extremely important in long-term diseases or chronic diseases, but also in individual solutions um, uh, for people wishing to care for their health state. Uh, the third area is broadly understood pharmacological or pharmacy, a development of uh, innovative solutions. Uh, AI solutions are uh, used on uh, 
on planning such solutions, on analysis of uh, 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 biomarkers and other substances for targeted substances, for targeted uh, uh, treatments. So, to sum up, we try to reduce the all aspects of healthcare problems, healthcare uh, loads on people. Now, when we have a look at the portfolio of the projects you offer, uh, and uh, RIT and digital innovators willing to create solutions for, for medicine, and what's the trend on the market? I think that di uh, digital and IT area covers over 30% of all submitted applications. So in this sense, it's a dominant area in our portfolio. In the area of progressive automation of various kinds of processes is a natural phenomenon to observe. For several years, we have been constantly observing an increase in the number of applications in artificial intelligence, machine learning. In the years 2016, 2009, the, there was a fourfold and tenfold increase, respectively. Poland has world-class specialists and developers. Uh, they, they enjoy recognition at the top international rankings. Projects in the field of IT and digital areas are very strongly interdisciplinary, and um, they support various complex areas of our lives and functioning. Medicine can also count on this support. However, we must take into account that, the specific, that there are specific requirements in terms of e-health, in terms of data security and data transmission, uh, the cost intensity of research work based on specific uh, data difficult to obtain files, and uh, finally, the requirements placed on the devices and software that must be certified before being applied to its use, let alone the cost of its work, operation, maintenance, um, and, and purchase. So obviously, you have to plan uh, certification, you have to plan purchases, you have to plan maintenance. And uh, you have to build into uh, disciplinary teams, uh, specialists, medics, uh, because, you know, now to take that into account, um, startups are perhaps not uh, happy to start uh, activities in that field because it may seem too complex to start with. So uh, we may have a, an example that can still be unsolved, second competition in InfoStratic uh, program. Uh, which included in mothers the intelligent speech processing system for doctors, but there are a growing number of projects in that field. So uh, we have financed uh, innovative AI-based technology for ECR Act to develop a new in silico uh, uh, receptors for um, uh, for tumor. Uh, recognition tumor uh, uh, diagnosis, and it's developing a new technology for immunotherapy. Uh, other uh, other uh, contests, uh, competitions concern uh, other uh, platforms uh, using AI to support dysfunctional people, for instance, with eye dysfunctions. This uh, device resembles a camera uh, put into a Bluetooth-like device, Bluetooth, uh, uh, you know, Bluetooth uh, headset kind of device, and this device uh, allows uh, uh, recognition of symbols or sign, and will inform a uh, 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 person with uh, blindness or eye uh, 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 dysfunction what he she can see or read around. Uh, WOMI is another uh, project, I mean, project run by FEMI, uh, company WOMI, running for temperature changes by means of a sensor and an application on, on the person's software, uh, smartphone. Uh, 
Peldoc is another project, a platform that is tracking uh, the pathway that the um, that the uh, patient gets when looking for a particular uh, uh, medical solution. And it's integrated with a telemedical uh, platform. So we can see such projects uh, are very complex, but there are some companies that are trying to get that pathway to this very, very complex world. Uh, there are huge challenges, and there is a supply of very interesting uh, uh, Polish uh, solutions. OK, coming back to the COVID pandemic, the third question will concern that. It has forced an acceleration of digital engagement in healthcare. Um, and uh, on the one hand, it required fast solutions. But on the other hand, we cannot allow ourselves shortcuts. So we can see acceleration of digital engagement in healthcare over the past uh, months. And uh, have research projects responding to the pandemic had a chance to receive support in this short period. In the era of pandemics, we have observed that healthcare security depends so much or is so much influencing social healthcare and social security. Our center um, our center reacted very immediately to the emergence of pandemic, organizing targeted support in the fight against the pandemic. So supporting the hospitals in, uh, uh, in mitigating the spread of the disease. And also there is a fast track program for uh, developing, uh, developing solutions as a program financed uh, by the European funds. Corresponding to the pattern of previously announced thematic fast track uh, projects. The second undertaking, support of uh, so called uh, uh, dedicated hospital, COVID dedicated hospital, uh, financed by uh, uh, national uh, financed, uh, because it simplified uh, getting access to funds. It was possible to get uh, uh, financing by both kind of projects, supporting diagnosis uh, with AI solutions, creating ITUs for gathering an analysis of epide ep epidemiological data, autonomous or robotic systems, supporting medical services. In this uh, pathway, uh, the gathered 70 over 70 projects and uh, over 20 uh, a million uh, zloty. Uh, 32 projects went to the stage of implementation. In 2020, we developed our strategy for 2021-2025, and one of four priorities is high operational effectiveness. The strategy anticipated, uh, the, uh, practically anticipated the challenges posed by the pandemic in institutions and allowed the center to carry out actions uh, in the period of lockdowns. We are planning to improve operational effectiveness uh, implementing and developing our plan for digitization and optimal uh, optimal uh, improvement of internal processes to better um, uh, to better um, face the challenges of the projects. So please feel feel invited to our website and to learn about current offer. Thank you very much for your participation in our conference and showing us the challenges and solutions you are developing and sharing it with. Uh, with, with us. Uh, thank you very much. And let's move to uh, the last uh, presenter in our panel, uh, Deputy Director of the Department of Innovation and Industrial Policy of the Ministry of Development Technology, uh, Mr. Piotr Zabadawa. Uh, good morning, Mr. Director. Good morning, everyone. OK, you, you can ask yourself a question, uh, how, how is it related, how this Ministry of Development of Technology is, is related to our conference? But it does support the development of MSPs uh, and, uh, and the entrepreneurship in general, which is extreme, who are play, uh, vital players in uh, e-health uh, and the digitization of data and services in, in the field we are talking about. So uh, that ministry is uh, the department that uh, that is headed by Mr. Sabadawa is responsible for developing policies and solutions in uh, um, uh, innovation and industrial uh, uh, solutions, also in e-health. So my question is, 
that what support, what projects will support the uh, digital revolution of MSPs in Poland? Well, we did have certain uh, abbreviations dealing with financing, financing uh, uh, and the main projects I would like to refer to uh, in developing the uh, financial operations of uh, uh, low and large scale entrepreneurships and entrepreneurial uh, is, is the project THEC. This project uh, has two priorities, uh, supporting, uh, supporting uh, entrepreneurships, uh, uh, developing framework, entrepreneurial framework, and the budget is 8 million euro. The majority of tools uh, planned for the project is continuation what we have worked on in the previously known operational program intelligent development. The new aspect and the new perspective is the way of implementing the project. Within the project, we plan a module-based support for uh, companies or consortia, uh, R&D consortia. And this is, uh, and this is, uh, uh, this is to allow the players, the stakeholders, to decide on how they want to implement, uh, uh, and uh, without necessarily, without necessary uh, uh, interplay of uh, other state agendas. So the module of digitization focuses on uh, digital transformation of uh, uh, companies. The the project focuses on most advanced uh, digital solutions, but also in allowing them, allowing access to them, uh, optimizing access to them, and optimal, optimal use in economic activity. An important element is developing skills necessary for effective use and development of uh, digital uh, uh, solutions. So the program allows support and educational initiatives for those implementing these solutions. Support will uh, particularly be addressed to mid and small exercises, because these uh, these uh, entrepreneurs uh, show lowest level of uh, show us level of uh, lowest level of uh, awareness of how they can use uh, uh, top-notch technologies. Uh, so we are planning the so-called uh, uh, digital innovation hubs. They will be responsible for for qualifying specialists, for educating specialists, uh, focusing on both uh, advantages and risks uh, of uh, global digital transformations. So. Uh, all that to enable the users uh, to plan initiatives, but also to assess uh, risks of their implementations. An institution, uh, the foundation of the industry of the future, uh, which is a foundation which is a key player in building key connections uh, for as, as a broker of uh, those who supply and those who can need technologies. And uh, it negotiates between the partners in Industry for Zero Revolution, seeking for best po potential uh, solutions for this industry of the future. The foundation also cares for cooperation of uh, stakeholders and uh, recognizes the potential barriers on the pathway to the fourth uh, industrial revolution, it runs a lot of educational initiatives, uh, including the, uh, the uh, four zero leader, uh, mostly addressed to the second, uh, to the mid and uh, small uh, entrepreneurships. 
it allows better planning of industrial of a digital revolution in companies to allow uh, to optimize uh, a competitive advantage of these companies uh, and of course it's uh, to um, develop uh, digital revolution leaders in companies it also offers uh, consulting and uh, uh, advisory uh, support mentoring um, various kind of audits based on the on uh, e-learning platform the foundation shares knowledge about digital transformation taking place in industry and about the advantages that uh, companies can uh, uh, achieve through the uh, through joining in this revolution okay let's now talk about uh, about building networks uh, of cooperation, like clusters. Uh, they are uh, more and more popular. Uh, your department performs tasks within the scope of a cluster policy and national key clusters. Could you explain the assumptions of this new cluster policy you are working on? And what scope of support can clusters expect, depending on the level of their development? Uh, in and what can be decisive in uh, giving this cluster, uh, uh, naming the cluster a national key cluster? Uh, thank you very much. In, uh, thank you for this question. In uh, 2019, uh, the, uh, the relevant ministry developed a working group for cluster policy and the sum up and the, and the um, uh, working result of this uh, of, of the work of this commission was a uh, was a document entitled directions of developing clusters after 2020 and this document shows or this do document uh, claims that uh, support for clustering will depend on the level of development of a given cluster so uh, by principle we assume that regional clusters can be supported at the early uh, and the second stage of their development, but the center clusters will mostly focus on at the stage of a uh, highest potential. That's going to be that these are going to be national key clusters. Uh, they they will be um, they will have the strongest impact for national uh, economy and also international work. So obviously that will uh, our support will focus on in uh, investment, but also on soft skills like uh, education support and uh, uh, consulting. Those national key clusters develop in bottom-up um, uh, methodologies. So we start with huge engagement and participation of institutions that build cluster from scratch. Uh, we uh, develop or ministry develop uh, contests for clusters to reach the uh, status of a national key cluster, and then. Uh, uh, five elements, five areas of activity are assessed. Uh, social capital, uh, functioning uh, and uh, uh, financial potential, uh, sorry, economic potential, transfer of knowledge and activity towards uh, social policies and uh, client orientation. Those areas uh, provide parameters of assessment and show or uh, determine the development of how we want clusters to, ve to develop. Now we are working on uh, the contest. Uh, the, the contest is actually on. Uh, until mid-September, there is an open contest for either renewing the, the status or, uh, or, uh, or allowing new clusters to become national key clusters. Uh, access is absolutely free, and there is no initial conditions boundary criteria for clusters to join in. However, because eHealth uh, is is a very very it has now a very huge potential for public economy and for public and economy, we strongly believe that at least one cluster uh, is on the list, and we expect um, a new. Uh, clusters to join in. Life science is one such cluster on our list. Now, what about tourism and medical tourism? 
Do you think that uh, digital development, digital uh, development of digital solutions like platform for patient communications, uh, consultations, solutions in the field of telemedicine, uh, how uh, can they change uh, 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 this, uh, this so-called uh, medical tourism? OK, in my answer to your question, let me move back to uh, COVID pandemic and the overload of um, overload of technological overload uh, when 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 the system was moving to the virtual uh, um, virtual sphere. We can see that this overload must can be handled only thanks to analytical techniques and AI. Thanks to these new technologies, patient can be monitored uh, from distance, and, and he may be subject to telecare. So uh, he may be placed physically in at his home or in hotel, not necessarily at hospital, and can be mon uh, monitored from the distance. This can be easily translated on to medical tourism, and uh, Poland is a leader on the market. Uh, Polish, uh, Polish players, Polish health, uh, medical health um, uh, institutions are very attractive on the market uh, because quality and 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 uh, and uh, the value for money aspect is very high, and uh, dental care is perhaps one of the leading players. Polish dental care also with its innovative uh, aspect is a uh, top-notch world world level uh, uh, player a lot of uh, a lot of players on the market needed to realize they need to join digital revolution uh, to succeed on the market and to su uh, survive on the market so you know before the pandemic people thought that they will have time to wait for certain solutions for years. Now, pandemic caused it that we needed to implement certain solutions. Uh, a lot of those solutions mentioned by my pre-speakers um, that it actually we needed to implement them in weeks. So we are running after. We are successfully running after uh, uh, such uh, countries. We are we are catching up with such countries like Estonia. So the pandemic is a revolution in the approach to digitization of offers. So broadly speaking, development of telemedical offers, uh, te telehealth care will stay with us after the pandemic. And that also concerns tourism, medical tourism. Apart from staying with us, perhaps we will also have huge increase in development of such technologies the years to come. And th those players on the market who will fail to adapt on the, uh, on, on the, to this revolution will rather face it difficult to survive. Digitization, uh, digital revolution does not only allow access to new to, to existing services, but will actually triggers new services because the growing number of um, clients uh, teaches uh, uh, entrepreneurs to, to think about new services. And perhaps this is an argument that requires no explaining and no uh, no persuasion. Throughout last month, a lot of companies required to revise, the, reconsider their strategies and to adapt to new uh, situations. But I think the largest challenge uh, from the economic point of view that uh, companies uh, face, uh, that, that companies face, is the growing, uh, is, is the need to enhance the competences, the capacities of the staff without, uh, without moving on that direction direction in that direction uh, still there will be, there will be uh, barriers thank you very much for all your answers we uh, had an occasion to to listen to Piotr Zabadawa and uh, we wish you over day. thank you very much for having me and uh, I wish you good proceedings so we learned a lot about objectives and challenges and different sources of financing uh, in the perspective that is ahead of us uh, ahead of us now is a coffee break, and uh, the second panel, uh, and uh, we will have uh, we will have a topic on digital transformation in healthcare system, post, post experiences and new perspectives. Uh, but we have still a lot of time to talk about the topics because the the panel starts at ten forty five. So enjoy your break.
Ladies and gentlemen, let us uh, let me welcome you back to our uh, to our uh, panel number two, and uh, our guests are also joined by Mr. Michał Lava, Vice Marshal of our uh, Voivodeship. We are happy to have you here among you, among us. And our panel is uh, devoted to digital transformation in the healthcare system, past experiences and new perspectives. The panel is run by Professor Marek Nizgutka, who is director of the G Digital Science and Technology Center at uh, Cardinal Stefan Wyszyński University, and a uh, member and uh, director of many, many uh, projects uh, dealing with mathematical science, uh, uh, data, program, data uh, uh, modeling, and so on. Let me remind you that you may follow the conference online on the website, and also you can use uh, you can use English interpreting and signed interpreting uh, uh, online. Okay. Uh, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce uh, information about my affiliation. Uh, I, until 2018, I was at University of Warsaw. Now I uh, am affiliated at Cardinal Stefan Wyszyński University, and I run this. Uh, I am the director for Digital Science and Technology Technology Center there. But I'm also privileged to uh, be uh, a member of expert group, uh, chairman of the Digital Council of the Medical University of Medicine. But this is not actually the, the, the uh, center of our debate. I'm happy to be a moderator on the panel uh, of the uh, digital transformation in healthcare, both uh, uh, experiences of today, experiences of the past, but also the new perspectives that are opening up. Transformation, digital transformation, which does not only concern medicine or medical system, is a key to real, actual, actual uh, uh, to actual implementation of the global program, the largest global program introduced by UN, the uh, the, uh, the initiatives of global growth. As it was realized, digital transformation forms a basis for the effectiveness of the whole agenda for world, for global growth. The program has been developing or had been developing uh, up until 2020, and then the pandemic happened, the pandemic came, and it turned over the table, and it turned out the digital transformation becomes a critical condition for, for the success or survival of projects that are to mitigate, alleviate the scale of the pandemic and to lead to uh, new ways or ways out of different risks and hazards that we are able to recognize uh, because of the pandemic or that emerged because of pandemic. Even though this issue is mentioned many times, let me stress it very much that digital transformation is much, much far more than the development of infrastructure, digital infrastructure, computer infrastructure. But it's first of all, structural reshuffle of all the elements of different public systems, of different systems, and adding a lot of uh, elements, strengthening its value. So the panel for today is much, much broader, and it's very, very broad. And we are only able to touch upon very um, uh, best visible, or let's say the most urgent uh, challenges solving or meeting which um, is a condition, is a precondition for our effective handling of risks that are ahead of us, that looming, uh, are looming ahead, and uh, that will allow us to use chances that, that, uh, that, that we will be able to face in the nearest future.
Digital transformation of a health system, of medicine, deals with a lot of actions that concern an emergence of a completely new scale of infrastructural organization and new ways of its implementation because of uh, handling medical data. But I do not mean data, you know, in this purely informatic way, but the way they are used, implemented, and the global scale of access to data, to different res data resources, they mark a starting point for the whole transformation of the medical healthcare system and developing new directions of medical activities. That deals with uh, fast growth of, uh, of uh, development of analytical industry, which is uh, which is handled by uh, which is which is which also covers using artificial intelligence as a tool for data analysis for big data analysis. There, in the background, there is another huge uh, area. <coughs> Uh, that uh, that emerges in the context of the uh, data analysis, and uh, 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 and that actually uh, concerns targeting uh, health services to individual patients, and the natural consequence of this situation also occurs, which is a. Uh, uh, up, uh, which is an uh, in-depth uh, transformation of the structure of the health and social care system uh, because of the change of paradigms uh, that concerns health, social care, and other public services. So we are uh, moving out of the box uh, with thinking about different classifications and categorizations, practices that we are used to. Uh, we have to rethink about certain barriers and divisions, division lines, because what we need is cooperation and convergence of uh, many uh, areas of expertise, from technology through social uh, and, of course, medical. COVID turned out, COVID, COVID as a shock process led to a, uh, a shock effect, and it led to a sudden acceleration of the transformation processes. And the figures say that this, uh, this acceleration perhaps reaches, uh, that, may, uh, that may stretch over decades. So what turned out to be impossible or difficult to realize in limited amount of time became a necessity. And the competence of those who implement the processes is one side of the problem and one side of the, um, of the phenomena we observe. And there's yet uh, another side, the other side of the coin that also <coughs> that uh, allows uh, transformation to take place is access is reaching the higher level of public awareness and allowing them access to new solutions. Yet another topic that we are going to talk about, that we are going to handle uh, during our panel, is how to refer these transformation processes to what we have a chance to realize and what I believe we should realize and implement here in Lublin, Lublin region. So that's the question of how important it is to cooperate of the local government, of the Voivodeship Board, with the medical and scientific community. One example of an area which is, which is interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary understanding of, uh, of, uh, of this, uh, understanding of this uh, digital revolution is Smart Villages program which means uh, programs for sustainable development of non-urbanized areas. 
in the context of building uh, uh, sustainable chances of life, equali qu equality, equ equality of life, uh, to make them match the quality of life in urbanized areas. What has been prepared for a number of men, months uh, on the program level is building a, a concept for Eastern Center for Digital Medicine to be run by Medical University of Lublin. And another initiative that is a huge uh, elevated idea uh, and a program that uh, offers huge vistas for Lublin as a city and for universities and for the region is the actions uh, around building the Lublin Digital Union a program for participation, coordination, and cooperation of all Lublin-based university uh, uh, and also in the Lublin region and other universities in Poland. Let me present the uh, panelists. I have an honor to introduce the Prorectors of uh, Lublin-based uh, uh, universities, Professor Dariusz Czerwiński, Vice Rector of the Lublin University of Technology, Professor Dorota Krasowska, Vice Chancellor of uh, Medical University of Lublin, Professor Pastuszak, Prorector of Maria Kiri Skłodowska University, <coughs> and uh, particularly close to my field of interest is Professor. Robert Reidak, Vice Director of the Medical University of Lublin. And because we are talking about changes uh, in, the, in medicine, in the digital uh, field, uh, let me also uh, wholeheartedly welcome professors of the Medical University of Lublin. Mirosław Czuwar, Czuczwar, uh, Konrad Reidak, Radosław Rola, and Piotr Waciński. Ladies and gentlemen, Uh, we are starting the panel and the uh, and the questions and and responses to our of our guests. The panel will take uh, the form of three runs of uh, speeches, and we start a section or round one, and. Uh, uh, this will consist in this will consist in giving uh, the simplest possible answer to structural questions first of all what is digital transformation in your opinion Trans uh, digital transformation of healthcare system is it a necessity or is it still a kind of fashion and i'll start with this question i'll start with asking this question to people who see the problem from a little bit from a, a side namely I would like to start uh, to ask uh, to start with asking professor Zbigniew Pastuszak thank you very much for this question apart from the fact that I'm an, uh, I have my administrative function I also work as a specialist uh, in uh, uh, in, in the field of uh, uh, systems and uh, data infrastructure and uh, in terms of uh, flexible or agile uh, production, agile manufacturing system. Uh, for some time, uh, for, for some time uh, they were uh, so how to automate uh, pr production, uh, dealing with uh, all these ideas. Uh, uh, we started in the 1990s. Uh, at that stage. I'm also dealing with the development as a, as a specialist, uh, dealing with development of uh, uh, digital technologies and its influence on humanity. And, and of course, we are now talking not only about Industry 4.1, we are talking about Economy 5, uh, sorry, 4.0, but 5.0. So my answer is simple, uh, and perhaps there is only one, according in, in my mind. Uh, there is no debate and there is no discussion. We are at the stage of development of the world that relies on digital technologies in all areas of uh, human life, human activity. And we can see that economies that rely hugely on IT, uh, building IT 
processes and, and somehow to adapt social processes to, uh, to those changes like education, uh, adult education, children education, lifelong learning. Uh, these are economies that are top economies. For instance, Nordic countries, Scandinavian countries, but also Singapore, Taiwan, or New Zealand, or Australia. These are societies uh, where education uh, relies hugely on technologies, on, on, on the applicative approach to technologies. Uh, but also telemedical issues are highly uh, developed. And they are no longer laboratory issues. They are everyday issues. From my own perspective, uh, a large a large hospital in Warsaw in Poland before the pandemic uh, 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 they found it prob problematic to implement uh, e receipt uh, system in Poland uh, e electronic somehow there were always some problems doing this now when the pandemic came, it took them three weeks to catch up uh, b before that. They had taken it uh, two years to somehow struggle with the system. So you see, that's an illustration of how it's going to be, how, is it I how it is going, and how it is going to be in the future, in shaping our life today and in the future. Thank you very much for this concise answer. And I'll pass voice to Professor Czerwiński. Ladies and gentlemen, historically speaking, of uh, I've been running a team for uh, IT, uh, IT issues at, at our university. And I'm happy that our university is present in the debate. Why technical university at, um, at a medical uh, uh, conference? Well, I think the answer is simple. Without technology, medicine would be far, far behind where it is now. And I'm so happy that we can support uh, our colleagues, our medical colleagues in digital uh, transformation. Is it necessity or a fashion? In my opinion, I agree with uh, Professor Pastuszak. There is no other direction. There is no other mm, civilizational direction that we can take. Two years ago, I participated in a conference where Americans presented a model of uh, 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 ultrasonography that uh, uses a telephone. So it's very likely that doctors will cease to work in health centers they will work in data centers, uh, co looking through the data, analyzing the data, and then uh, making a detailed but distance, um, distance um, uh, diagnosis. This is a direction we are following, uh, that, uh, that the, the contact between the um, patient and the doctor uh, also because of the um, shortage of doctors uh, to make it as effective as possible. And of course, data, uh, digital data, is is vital, and a lot of aspects we have to take into account in in uh, in that area. We have to take into account that we are people, and uh, we approach data as people. As uh, as you, as you said, that um, there were some barriers in implementation of uh, of uh, of the system. So what I'm trying to say is that we need technical solutions, but we also need a change of our way of thinking. Uh, because um, technology is not enough to make people uh, use, use it. Access to data is vital and crucial, not only on the diagnostic level and not only for treatment, but also later on uh, on the level of rehabilitation. So this is why we are striving for. Uh, and development is possible uh, with, two, with those two sets of criteria on board. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, digital transformation in medicine uh, has a new dimension because of the pandemic. Uh, but before that time, uh, we, we have to realize that before that time, uh, there had been some development and digital transformation did cover all the system of uh, global economic, social economic system. It covered the scientific world or research world. So now, thanks to new technological vistas that we face, thanks to the growth uh, and uh, uh, increase of algorithmic solutions, 
something started, something emerged, which is actually a, uh, a civilization revolution of an unprecedented scale, uh, of the scale of data analysis, for instance, research data analysis. So that scale of activity um, delivered by technology of data analysis leads to an emergence of uh, research domains that were not thinkable of uh, and they were not built because of the barriers or hinder hindrances, either formal or content-wise or methodologically impossible. Now, coming back to the main topic of our panel and the, and the question I asked, I would further like to, uh, uh, to, to, to have an answer uh, from a magician. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, Professor Radosław Rola to share his uh, ideas on that point with us. Thank you very much for giving me the voice. My view on the issue is somewhat different from the two previous uh, 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 speakers. Uh, they represent uh, they, they they represent a perspective where cooperation with med medicians, medics, is something basic. Okay, let's start with point number one that digital transformation is indispensable and necessary. There is no debate about that. As a representative of a specialization, medical specialization, I may call myself uh, technologically intense. I mean, I couldn't be able to move ahead in, in, my, in the development of my um, uh, treatment uh, techniques without technology. So uh, even very, very basic issues now are handled technology, technologically. Let me give you a uh, just an example based on COVID because perhaps we are um, because we have many cases to talk about. Okay, with the with the with the rise of the first lockdown, uh, our uh, dedicated hospital was one in Puave, which is 40 kilometers uh, from Lublin. And now it turned out that all patients with COVID, but also with other um, conditions, need to be transported to Puave, 40 kilometers. Now imagine a patient who has a problem, some kind of traumatic situation uh, with, uh, with cranial trauma. Uh, neurosurgeon needed to go to Puave and do the surgery there. So the problem is, before I go and I'm able to operate, I need to have an insight into, uh, into data, into diagnosis. Uh, so, so it was like this. I mean, I, uh, uh, the patient, the patient uh, in Puave was diagnosed, data was sent to Lublin, and consultation took an hour and a half. Um, whereas you need something like no more than two hours uh, before the trauma and the operation. So it turned out the COVID became a barrier for discussing this, but it turned out that we can do it in uh, IT way. We, de we developed a, um, a digital, uh, digital uh, storage for sending the data faster in a more reliant way uh, and we have a telephone and 10 minutes for diagnosing. So this is my answer for why digital transformation in medicine is necessary. However, we will not able to handle this problem with uh, with the help without help of specialists in in organizational structures and IT. Okay, but following this uh, neurosurgeon surgery. Uh, I think we may say that we that there are new solutions necessary, new digital solutions necessary in your field, because that means that translates onto are you going to be competitive and will you be able to function as a research uh, center to develop new methods of handling? Yes, I fully agree. It's a very, very broad uh, uh, issue. But as I said before, we develop along technological lines. Any uh, intervention uh, in the cranial region requires real-time uh, imagery, uh, and this is an uh, this is an IT solution that we may rely on only. Another issue is to introduce robotics. Uh, on, this, on, the, uh, on the operation theaters, which took very long time. 
uh, and robotics was used at the beginning in 1998. Uh, that was partly, it was only uh, a kind of apparatus for keeping uh, instruments uh, ready, for, uh, ready for operation. But today we have a far more expanding range of, uh, uh, of, uh, ther of therapies for patients because well-implemented technology leads to a huge improvement of quality and reducing the time of operation. I've no, I've no doubt about that. I'm fully aware that we can continue on that uh, on the end, but of course we have to proceed to other speakers and other voices. So uh, let me move to this idea of the uh, effect of pandemics on change of, uh, of, of the reality as well. So I'll ask uh, Rector uh, uh, Robert Reidak to answer the question, to what extent, in your opinion, of course, in your experience, the pandemic stimulated new practices of digital uh, strategies or expanding their use. In this context, what kind of experiences you can share your own uh, national or worldwide, as you can see, that you can refer to. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor, Professor. This question is relevant. Our entire medical fraternity, I mean, both global and, and local, I, I mean, uh, Lublin and uh, Professor Zauska who spoke earlier today, uh, he appointed a body, which is uh, an office for digitization within the university to help implement new solutions during the pandemic. And we um, dealt with uh, digitization of uh, ophthalmology much earlier. We had some previous experience uh, based on cooperation with uh, American centers. And the pandemic, which of course surprised everyone, uh, made us prepare a new approach uh, and do it very quickly, uh, both in terms of diagnostics, because this is the level or at this level, uh, patients wait too long. Of course, it's a matter of organization. It determines uh, how long patients wait, and it also depends on a specific condition. If you have life-threatening uh, illness or um, uh, chronic illness, it may differ. And segregation of patients that should be only monitored and patients that should be treated immediately, if, especially if there is the, the, the early stage of, of illness, it requires telemedical solutions. Just to give an example, uh, diabetic patients or um, eye problems. This is where we can, uh, for example, we can reach uh, uh, patients in small towns or villages uh, in a local uh, outpatient clinic. We can install uh, diagnostic tools, remote tools supported by artificial intelligence, and these patients can be diagnosed remotely at an early stage of the problem. Then there is short-sightedness in children. That's another example. And of course, we have a number of um, a number of uh, medical sectors present here. But anyway, the pandemic has affected us all. Thank you, Professor. We have epidemiologist here with us, uh, Professor Chuchvar. So uh, the epidemic has also affected your job uh, at an unprecedented scale, and I, I believe you have some conclusions drawn out of it. 
Uh, of course, thank you uh, for, for inviting me, for giving me this opportunity to share with you. It's hard to believe that it's been already uh, a year and a half since the pandemic started and uh, my uh, hospital became involved um, on the first front line. Now with hindsight, we never expected what it uh, would look like. It was very difficult to get ready and to even imagine what we uh, had to expect. But um, all this experience gathered so far has made us stronger. However, we have come here to talk about how to make the best of this, of this challenging time. Because next to uh, suffering and tra tragedy, this, this time was also very um, uh, beneficial in terms of uh, experience uh, gathered and certain initiatives that were started uh, at a scale that was not seen before. And this uh, year uh, taught me a lot. And uh, in February 2020, we thought we were very well prepared. At our hospital number one in Lublin, we have um, intensive therapy, emergency unit, high class equipment, high class uh, specialists. When we got first patients, we thought we would be able to secure this, uh, this part of our work and provide best quality services. But the scale of the problem very quickly surprised everyone and the biggest experience we had was our uh, April mission uh, to Chicago to see how Americans were handling the situation and what we saw in the USA made me uh, realize well we are going to have a problem because if we saw that even Americans didn't manage the problem uh, when we visited the, the, the clinic in uh, Chicago, uh, patients lying in the corridor, uh, personnel recycling a disposable uh, protective clothing, something that we perhaps had not seen since, since 1950s or 60s in Eastern Europe, it came back to us at the beginning of the 21st century. We saw that um, very basic uh, resources were depleting and back then we saw them implementing systems of uh, optimized resource management and if you see that even the USA is lacking personnel and equipment, well perhaps uh, we thought it's a matter of time before it really hits us in Poland. And we saw them uh, calling different different clinics, uh, institutions, saying we need something right away for yesterday. And uh, very quickly, they transformed this into a centralized management system that really changed a lot, despite the lack of uh, resources or the lack of personnel. They managed to overcome this uh, initial problems and what we tried to do was to transfer some of that experience and to create a center in Lublin to assist patients, uh, COVID patients uh, and in fact mm, we were able to manage uh, patients uh, within 50, 500 kilometer radius from Lublin. So we had many institutions involved, uh, even, even the Polish military and we, we manage that. Now it's time to make it work to react uh, faster, better, in the most um, optimum way in the future and build on that experience to make it work in practice, to make our system, healthcare system, work even more effectively. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, an area of medicine which is strictly related to, to COVID is neurology. It's a very 
extensive area of uh, of problems of conditions. So we have Professor Radak with us, and we would like to hear from uh, Professor about the influence of COVID on his on his uh, sector. Indeed, neurology is is a field which shows. Uh, what we are dealing with, uh, I mean, both uh, chronic and, and sudden, uh, if I may put it like this, um, uh, diseases, diseases. Speaking about COVID, we, we designed a project which actually originally started two years before, and COVID stopped this, this pro program from developing. But in fact, we gained some experience uh, on how to how to uh, uh, manage this i mean it's a project on uh, treating uh, stroke uh, stroke is a popular lifestyle disease very often ending in death uh, we had thousands of we have thousands of patients suffering um, uh, in the region every year and our project aims to integrate stroke uh, treatment centers, uh, this is uh, 13 in the region, to shorten to maximum the time of response uh, in case of stroke. Uh, these uh, treatment centers within the region are able to share data immediately Share it with the central hub, uh, the, the, the pilot, as we put it, which is in Lublin, to make it fast, to respond fast, because every second, every minute lost uh, reduces uh, uh, chances for successful treatment. So that project uh, was started independently of COVID, and in fact, Lublin Lubelskie leads Poland in terms of the number of procedures. 50% uh, of procedures uh, in Poland is done in Lubelskie. So we are more or less at the level of uh, Bavaria in Germany. and. In order to improve the operation of the system, we need teleinformation systems. So whether this is either through wireless means or wired means, which is faster, of course, and well, this infrastructure does uh, exist. And we hope this project will keep uh, moving because it might be uh, a flagship project uh, for the country, uh, for our, for other regions to follow. Uh, it shows how we can overcome infrastructural barriers or even distance. And uh, Lubelskie is varied in terms of access to uh, broadband internet. And the other component related to COVID is uh, our system of uh, of uh, e-consultation with medical boards. We can have uh, online consultation with uh, patients in real time. Uh, this is not for the most acute cases, but for cases where we have certain doubts. And we can, through this, make it easier for our colleagues in other units, in other hospitals, to make a decision. We know that uh, there are certain shortages, vacancies uh, in hospitals, so uh, the continuity of treatment is becoming a challenge now because of the lack of personnel. And so, so based on existing human resources and technological resources, these solutions will help streamline operations and maybe even avoid the vacancy crisis and there will be more and more illnesses, not less illnesses. We have aging society, more or less one of four people has some neurological troubles uh, during their lifetime. So we need to look ahead. We need to think in advance how to uh, tackle such, such problems without any uh, 
big financial outlays because these projects do, don't really cost much money. They're relatively easy and cost effective. Uh, even if we look in the long term, if we look at demography, which, uh, which is changing in the country. Well, there is one more area, one more area that has come up. I mean, long-term consequences of COVID for, uh, for, for different types of neurological diseases. I understand this is a, a, another subject that we are not able to, to cover now. Uh, certainly, it goes without saying that we are not dealing with some temporary uh, problems. It's uh, the question of our future, the, the future of our medicine and healthcare services. Let's move on to the second round of questions. And I'd like gentlemen to hear, gentlemen and madam, to hear uh, very briefly about about priorities in terms of implementing e-medicine uh, solutions. So what do you think are major priorities? What is most promising? Because we have uh, heard from Professor Redak especially, we have heard some references to infrastructure and the significance of infrastructure. So let me ask and technical specialists and management experts about their opinion, their opinion on the significance of developing integrated, uh, distributed regional in, in infrastructures of um, medical data and medical services, and what, what, what system benefits can we have from, from these? Uh, given our specific technological level of advancement. And there's one more aspect to it. I mean, what is the significance of competence development? Let's, let's call them info medical or IT medical competences to be able to um, reap the benefits of ICT and combine them with, uh, with the medical application uh, competences. Can we have uh, Professor Czerwinski? Well, thank you. Uh, uh, speaking about what we already have at home, uh, if you want to access the internet, you perhaps still remember uh, some time ago, computers used a telephone modem. And the speed of connection wasn't fast to, to, to open a website. We had to wait a couple of minutes sometimes. Today we have access to fixed lines, to broadband connections, and it opens up new perspectives for, for our solutions, for our designs. Um, I mean, digital data and their collection of digital data. Whether we speak about local centers or some big data centers, central data centers, Lublin um, is, an, is a university town. It has numerous specialists at the technical university uh, and its engineers are part of multi-year projects, R&D projects. Uh, whether we take data analytics or imaging analytics, uh, we, we sometimes even don't know it, but this is happening. So this is where I can see some prospects. I mean, medical data collected in data centers, they will help new competence uh, to grow, and this competence, this new set of competence will support medical personnel. These people of these competences will be data analysts, uh, people who understand how to program uh, an application that will be able to use AI to help uh, medical personnel in diagnostics. So for example, say, look, there has been a case like this before. This is the medical picture and this is the possible diagnosis. So why do we need these data centers? If you look at what data we collect about the human body or, or health status, there's a lot of it. I mean, this can be data uh, like images, uh, 
This can be data like like voice, uh, like digital signals. I mean, your heart rate, your your brain waves, uh, blood pressure, and more. So the most complex, the most challenging data is is uh, computer tomography and um, MRI. These are big files. Uh, if you wanted to develop IT systems to to support diagnostics in medicine, we would need uh, really large and mighty data uh, processing centers that in the future will enable us to take a different approach based on historical data of many patients, uh, and they will be able to show us the right direction or basically speed up uh, decision-making processes and diagnostics. Professor Bastuszak, if I may. Indeed, what Professor Czerwinski has just said, I mean, this, this, this IT component, whether, whether integrated or distributed databases, that's a question to be, to be established uh, at the level of technology. But I'm really happy t that Mr. Marshall was here for a moment with us. Uh, be, uh, and we know that any development needs funding. And this is also true that every system uh, will be as effective as it's uh, the least effective um, components. So we have some outstanding uh, medical experts in Lublin. We know that we have this, this competence here, uh, probably at universities, but also in, in clinics. And these people are there. They, they develop, they learn, they stay in touch with the world. So the natural uh, venue, natural location for such a center would be, uh, of course, Lublin. And uh, this is where the most relevant components of the system of the system should be. And well, I mentioned Mr. Marshall because um, I cooperated on the development of the new um, uh, development strategy for Lubelsk, which provides for the development of, of uh, broadband internet network, because still we have some some white spots across the region uh, that do not have um, fast internet, which means they are digitally excluded. And if we manage to obtain uh, funds, European funds, this financial support uh, to help this infrastructure grow will be will be there. And what some professors um, have already said, we should also um, take this this uh, social perspective and business perspective, because if we are connected to the world as a region, if we have um, a local airport and high level of medical services, we have we we are a place of potential interest for patients with uh, chronic diseases who may who may um, uh, come here for treatment. Uh, who may enjoy themselves in our region uh, doing rehabilitation uh, or, or regardless of, of, the, of the problem of the disease. So if they are connected to Lublin, to a big knowledge center, we will be able to offer um, certain services and simply make a business uh, benefit out of it. So to sum up, local authorities or, or municipal authorities should be really um, uh, 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 ready to be able to absorb uh, these funds and uh, make it something really unique um, on the global scale. We have this cooperation between local universities. We have the digital union or digital alliance. We have. Lubin Medical University as the medical leader, and at the same time, units that need technological support. So this support can be provided by the Technical University of Lublin and my university with, with our IT and AI experts, uh, but also experts from uh, University of Life Sciences, because human environment 
nutrition, food, this is all connected. And any expert, you know, whether psychologist or, or sociologist, or they can have some area to show off in this whole uh, constellation. So if we have an initiative that is growing, that is flourishing, if it has a major uh, financial support, we can really achieve something unique, at least in this part of Europe. Thank you. So we have uh, returned to uh, the question of sustainable development, a development that does not limit itself to metropolitan areas, that also benefits distant, uh, um, remote, um, less urbanized areas. This is very uh, useful, but let's go back to our medical topics, because uh, we can see how important it is to create a mighty telemedical solutions and implementing such solutions, such services in Rubelski might be um, a role model for, for other regions to copy. In specific areas of, of medicine, we have um, the question of uh, teleconsultation, telediagnostics, teleintervention. Uh, Professor Krasowska perhaps will be able to tell us from her perspective concerning dermatology, uh, an area that we haven't yet discussed today. So we would like to hear from you, Professor, because I know that the scale of needs in, in, in dermatology, um, uh, telemedicine in dermatology is really huge. Many thanks for this question. I agree in the field of medical services, the pandemic time put us under much, uh, those services were put under much uh, pressure. Uh, there was a huge, uh, uh, there was a huge reduction of, uh, so to say, possibilities of, of uh, building a visit or making a visit. And uh, dermatological uh, treatments uh, sometimes can also be uh, uh, hazardous and, and may constitute a life hazard that require urgent actions, urgent diagnostics and treatment. So thanks to, uh, thanks to the limited uh, uh, resources that we have or we had, we were able to uh, help uh, to help our colleagues from Lublin region who send us images, clinical images from diagnosis, uh, dermatological diagnosis, and we help them to take uh, strategic uh, decisions concerning treatment. So that's one aspect. And uh, we did have very limited means, so there is a huge area for improvement also to standardize these tools so that when we use these tools locally or regionally or even globally, and, uh, and if we are able to use our tools with our partners, uh, with our partners all over the world, so if they are standardized in uh, taking into account all types of work uh, and types of uh, platform and uh, uh, service delivery that will employ diversity of models uh, like a real time or asynchronic model, more of an offline uh, uh, methodology where data are sent uh, with delay and uh, and. Uh, and the decision is delayed. Or, uh, now, another aspect is reliance on artificial intelligence in data analysis, in sorting out, in sieving um, the patients who are in uh, need of urgent need and those, and, uh, and those who can be uh, served by means of telemedical uh, instruments and uh, 
applications. Of course, competencies and the competence pool, building, uh, developing a competence pool for such services, and then uh, changing or building social awareness of these services, because obviously service, uh, uh, social access and social willingness to use them is crucial in making this such model a success. Thank you very much for this answer. And you mentioned uh, this uh, contingency areas where urgent intervention is is a key. One area which comes to uh, which comes to view, which comes to mind uh, in this field is cardiology. So I would like to ask uh, Professor. Uh, 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 Piotr Waczynski to talk about telemedical solutions which are key uh, in uh, cardiological aspect and also in uh, in the region of Lublin uh, in the in the Lublin region thank you very much for this question and and for invitation to to the panel I am uh, in charge of uh, uh, invasion uh, uh, surgery clinics or invasion treatment cl clinic and thanks to the support of rectors and uh, of our uh, clinical hospital, I am also an expert of European Union concerning new, new medical technologies. And my experience is concerning this, uh, um, this overlap of technology and, uh, uh, and, uh, and medicine is uh, I, I, I brought it from Canada and from my work in Canada. Uh, so the Technologies that were introduced there in Canada needed to needed to come uh, uh, earlier than in Poland, and obviously, uh, but still, they went through the phase of fast uh, growth of technology through pandemic. Uh, but because of their previous experiences, they are a very good field of uh, uh, observation, uh, like a case study for us. We are developing a telemedical center for for the whole region to be able for us to be able to deliver help to patients uh, uh, in a uh, in a distant way. All uh, all cardiological uh, uh, implants that we are using do have technological uh, possibilities with uh, various uh, with various uh, ap ap appliances like telephones or uh, other monitors so it's telemonitoring which is possible another issue which you mentioned that I would like to add to this is we need uh, we need uh, inter or trans uh, disciplinary approach we do cooperate with IT and uh, unfortunately, whether you like or not, the number of numbers per population in Poland is very limited. And this won't change soon, if ever. So what we definitely need is uh, being able to analyze a lot of data, like imagery, uh, ultras uh, ultrasonic graphic design. They must be switchable and sendable, tran transferable. Uh, between stuff, uh, but the uh, but the te tests or um, testing procedures do not have to be done by uh, doctors. They may be done by skilled technicians. However, the qualification and the diagnosis is then uh, when the image is sent to the doctor is done to the doctor. So we are. Uh, the Eastern Center for Cardiology uh, using a transfer allowed by IT technology will be able to provide a diagnosis and treatment with reduced uh, personnel um, cost, uh, cost and overload. Obviously, we need a lot of uh, we need a lot of um, uh, dedicated equipment for. Uh, uh, for post-processing scans, uh, so that scans are sent and processed uh, by IT technologies, and diagnosis is done somewhere else, okay, uh, in a, in a distance um, by a doc by a qualified doctor. Uh, we have to remember that building this network, building this um, ecosystem, is one thing, and we are doing this. However, we need the whole program, long-term program for financing and support of the system in its application. Without stuff, I know it's, uh, 
it, uh, it, it may sound um, self-contradictory that we are reducing uh, a personal cost and personal number, but this is uh, this is not that simple. Uh, we need uh, we need very highly qualified staff for highly qu technically qualified um, uh, telemedical solutions, and Lublin has a chance to be. Um, uh, to be a center for this kind of service. And um, we are not talking about such simple solutions like um, televisit, um, uh, like, uh, you know, like talking, um, like, like a visit uh, of a patient to a doctor uh, with the use of um, uh, teletechnologies. Well, I'm talking about um, distant uh, in, uh, distant interventions in the human body, medical in interventions in the human body, um, uh, and di di distant diagnostics. So to sum up, I think that COVID pandemic was definitely a catalyst for uh, uh, fast change. And I think in three years, we'll be able to offer full electronic diag uh, diagnostic, uh, digital diagnostic for the whole region, and also for patients, for post-COVID patients, uh, because this is yet another thing to, to, to strengthen here. Neurology is this field that uh, certainly, uh, certainly um, forces even medicine to move towards uh, the use of IT systems. I agree. Um, uh, uh, neurology, neuro, neurosurgery, uh, cardiology, uh, uh, intensive care, all these uh, uh, all these domains require IT, require robotics, uh, require AI. Uh, all these elements are moving in neurology into uh, into the field of neurology. We participated in the project in building a robot with uh, uh, with the people suffering from Alzheimer. Uh, the robot was created and and uh, and uh, uh, and was functioned. For the time being, it's in Barcelona. Uh, it seems to be living its own life. Uh, but care uh, with a chronic care with uh, care over patients with chronic diseases, um, uh, like Alzheimer and other uh, other uh, uh, other similar problems, that will require more and more comprehensive help. And obviously, uh, human factor is crucial. But you cannot imagine twenty four seven. Um, help uh, for for such for such patients. Um, they shouldn't be cared for at hospitals or at health centers. We should move towards homes. Um, only because of or only thanks to uh, health conditions, we can increase the functionality or reduce the dysfunctionality. And thanks to robotic solutions, that could be possible that could be uh, viable. Um, uh, Robert can join in a linguistic or a verbal uh, interaction and can also send um, uh, emergency information to doctors. And I'm so happy that Lublin is a uh, uh, active player uh, on in the sphere of development of such technologies. We have companies here in Lublin who are engaged in building robots. These are small startups that are able to build such advanced um, bits of equipment uh, that are compatible or comparable to solutions used in Europe because we cooperate with uh, London Robert Shadow Company who build very precise solutions for, um, uh, uh, for palms, for robotic palms that can deliver uh, uh, medicine uh, pills to patients. So there are no barriers because we, have, we, we talk the same language in neurology, psychiatry, and, and such domains where we, we have to face uh, or handle the face, uh, the type of disease or the 
um, the uh, progress of disease, the progress trajectory of the disease. So we need solutions that will adapt to the changing clinical uh, state of our patient. So these are examples where, where technology is a matter of fact, and when I expect a very, very fast progress in the coming years. OK, so uh, neurosurgery uh, like uh, actions absolutely improve quality of the system. Professor Rola, I absolutely agree. Uh, my colleagues uh, have said about telediagnostics and a lot of uh, data analysis and uh, decision making based on uh, exchange, fast exchange of information. We can also think about telesupport in terms of uh, medical intervention. Sometimes it's just a simple thing. It's just a question of getting in touch uh, or getting a video connection to the surgery theater where the patient uh, is not in a condition allowing transportation. So the uh, local surgery team uh, can take intervention on condition it's supported at least uh, in the form of support or consultation that in this form is relatively easily accessible. Another thing is uh, mentioned in, in cardiological cases, the fastest growing domain is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, Im implants for a changing of the modulation of the disease. Uh, electromodulation, uh, so uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, this is a kind of, uh, uh, and in in the coming time, this may also cover psychiatric diseases. And the research on that respect, uh, clinical research on that respect, uh, neuromodulation tools are uh, on on the way to develop. So the point is, patient does not have to reach a specialist can be treated uh, in a distant mode uh, because the point is to allow communication, allow consultation, and to adapt technology to make, uh, to make uh, uh, medical solutions work better. Thank you very much for this statement. One more dimension we need to talk about in the context of telemedicine is uh, campaigns and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, safe uh, research or screening research. Uh, that uh, is very um, frequently implemented. And talking about representatives of education, we realize the role that, um, that the role of doctors uh, has in, uh, or actually in, uh, the role of uh, the role of uh, professional operation has in a public life and public functioning. Uh, I strongly believe that for social life, uh, work and education side is a key uh, capacity, is a key sense. So it's extremely important to have early diagnostics and, uh, uh, and treatments for uh, eye diseases, ophthalmological diseases. Uh, retina, uh, uh, macula is, uh, is, a, is a reduced, uh, is a tiny little uh, a bit of our body that is responsible for so much of a uh, uh, for so much of, of our functioning. When the illness touches this tiny part of body and is uh, fully functioning, becomes a disabled person. Is become the person becomes dependent in a social sense. So for a decade now, we've been building. We've been uh, we've been introducing. Uh, screening research, uh, especially concerning the uh, macule-related diseases. That deals with diabetes, but uh, uh, other, uh, uh, other disorders related with macules, short-sightedness, uh, other uh, related with 
uh, vascular um, um, uh, systems and all these uh, diseases I have in mind, all these uh, diseases that when influencing the uh, macular, retinal macular, um, cause serious problems uh, and long-term or uh, un uh, irrevocable diseases. We had a pilot project for that, and we are applying for resources uh, in uh, Norwegian grant or uh, Norway grants, and we are talking with different representatives of uh, 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 of, uh, uh, of uh, local authorities and uh, and uh, uh, state authorities, because early diagnostics and early diagnostic projects in the regional scale is extremely vital. Another big social issue is is short sightedness, which uh, depending on uh, uh, depending on continent, uh, Asia is hugely dominated by uh, short-sightedness related um, uh, impediments or, or uh, problems in Europe uh, we are over 50 percent of population uh, with a short-sightedness issue and it concerns children in uh, school age school age children short-sightedness is actually something that accompanies us from from uh, from birth to to uh, to death but it needs treatment because without treatment it may lead to further complications uh, in uh, at later life stages and this is why uh, here in our region we are beginning this uh, screening project uh, run together uh, with uh, colleagues including uh, professor Marek Nisgutka uh, because we want to develop it on a scale which is going to be a pioneering project in, in, in Poland. Asia has this kind of research. Uh, I did discuss it. Uh, uh, also, Germany is also interested in our results uh, for their own implementation. Thank you very much for this voice. Um, I think we have a recurring, a recurring uh, notion of consequences of the pandemic. And one is mitigating the results of long-term or long COVID or, um, or all kind of effects. Uh, and there is a number of um, initiatives and ideas uh, emerging in the Lublin region. And I would like to ask Professor Vaczynski to, to address this issue. I think it's a more than topical issue. I believe that rehabilitation is a key factor for patients treated at hospitals and in the pandemic under pandemic circumstances I don't know if you are, if, if you know that that 70 percent um, uh, also suffer from uh, uh, from cardiac complications uh, serious uh, uh, symptoms are rare however uh, the complications uh, is there so th they definitely need post covid rehabilitation uh, so it's not only about lungs and uh, pulmonary issues but also about uh, cardiac issues so we are looking uh, uh, we have two centers uh, in uh, in the Lublin region which is now 30 kilometers uh, uh, from Lublin and there's yet another center uh, that is growing to be a, a, a cardiological and a neurological uh, center which is something like 100 kilometers from Lublin and we are we have a project uh, with those two spots uh, central in our project for rehabilitation of post-COVID patients. So what we want to do is um, is we uh, want to allow students out of ho the hospital as soon as possible and move them to the stage of rehabilitation. So we shorten the, uh, shorten the uh, hospitalization period, and then we uh, ensure that those patients are rehabilitated, not only for, neuro, uh, for neurological and also for cardiological issues. So we introduce AI and telemedical solutions in this project. So our patients will be, say, electronically uh, monitored uh, by us, uh, doctors and physiotherapists who will be ta taking care of them. 
will have access to uh, uh, to to the data and also will have AI solutions to to tell them what to do, to suggest them what to do. And of course, uh, those patients can stay at home uh, after hospitalization stage. So the system also allows a lot of actions to be taken without any specific um, specific uh, presence at centers like Choroniec or Nawenchov. Yes, you are right. I mean, uh, I started with those people with uh, with high level syndrome or stronger syndrome, but obviously with people with uh, limited syndromes can be uh, rehabilitated at home still with the whole monitoring uh, uh, machinery, so to say, available thanks to IT. So these are two main features of the system. It allows better access of patients to uh, healthcare, better use of uh, medical uh, optimization of, of, um, of uh, personal use, and it's much more cheaper than hospitalization. Because our system in Poland is very expensive, is very costly, uh, because most of procedures is based on hospital treatment. <clears throat> Apart from anesthesiology and uh, intensive care, the majority of specializations can be used as outpatients, which is mostly possible uh, thanks to IT technologies as supportive, not, uh, not uh, substitutive. I think this was mentioned by Professor Krasowska particularly, but I would like to ask uh, Professor Robert Reidag for your experiences concerning rehabilitation, post-COVID in particular. We are noting down a high percentage of patients um, of advanced uh, illnesses, diseases, which I did not remember in a pre-pandemic uh, pre -pandemic, uh, cases. So we had a problem, for instance, covering or, or touching upon uh, problems with two eyes. Uh, we, usually we had a single eye uh, problems before. Now, referring to Professor Vaczynski, we had a, we have some projects. We are still working on them. So let's say it's more like design uh, of, of certain. Uh, we are trying to develop um, a center. Uh, a health center, uh, which could be, um, which could be a condominium of buildings, uh, uh, a resort, or in a way, a medical resort, if I may say it this way. So um, the idea is that we install the equipment there. Uh, patients go there; they are uh, treated or they are diagnosed for uh, uh, for uh, those particular um, items. Uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, particular items. Uh, uh, so, uh, like macula, I mentioned, and so on. So, actually, that could be a reduced cost of diagnosis, of very comprehensive diagnosis, because one spot could be responsible for very comprehensive diagnosis. Okay, so you mentioned. Yet another um, aspect of this uh, of this whole problem, which is a, which is the problem of social awareness, of uh, um, of, of medical care, of uh, distant uh, distant uh, medicine, and so on. Um, I think we have this example of vaccination and uh, uh, the question of how it influences awareness. I think it's a spectacular um, uh, case, and I would like to ask Professor uh, Professor Pastushak. Uh, for his reflection concerning how to or programs of developing social awareness uh, and uh, uh, from the perspective of of his uh, of of his uh, uh, experience in this field i agree this is a huge uh, problem and it's a huge topic we can see that awareness uh, perception or social knowledge so called social knowledge concerning healthcare in our society, it's it's a very broad issue. There is a lot of research that you can quote and would approach a multi-aspectual uh, approach to the issue. One, uh, the, the, this issue of, um, uh, let's say, a liberal approach. Uh, why should I be forced uh, to be vaccinated uh, and so on? Another uh, is uh, 
uh, this anti-vaccination or vaccination skeptics. A lot of it is for uh, sociologists or sociologists who would uh, investigate the uh, rationale for such uh, uh, attitudes. Now, for me, as an economist, I believe that each process that uh, causes uh, uh, causes that some person has problems uh, with access to some kind of service, whatever it is, um, is an anti-economic process. So in a way, it will have uh, civilization-related consequences. Uh, certainly, technologies occur that uh, sometimes help us, for instance, reduce our mobility because they, they allow distant access to certain uh, services. For example, an ex uh, when we talked about with, with our students um, about, uh, about distant learning, they do like, students do like distant learning because it makes their life far more flexible. They are, they are you know, time scheduled. Also, a lot of patients would be happy to use uh, a televisit or virtualization of medical contact. Uh, but, but certainly, certainly the attitudes concerning telemedical solutions or all kind of uh, medical support and, and increasing access to medical um, services will be more and more popular, will be more and more widespread. And as you mentioned, uh, a lot of technologies that is that is around us, like smartwatches and uh, uh, and uh, uh, telephones or smartphones, you know, the sensors that are there in those those machines, they do allow right now huge amount of information transfers. Um, and if we are able to develop solutions and systems for monitoring, for instance, for monitoring um, people with chronic diseases and uh, uh, real-time reaction, along with potential suggestions for rehabilitation, uh, like in cardiac, uh, like in cardiac um, cases where uh, where. Uh, 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 where a person can be stimulated in a particular way. But I'm trying to say that we are moving towards a growing um, participation of technologies, of an influence of technologies in what we do and how we live, including medical <coughs> procedures. Lately, COVID made those problems of more visible. Uh, they expose those problems. So, in a way, in your uh, Professor uh, uh, Chuchvar uh, clearly saw in in your you clearly saw how it is important to build the uh, uh, to build the uh, social awareness uh, in 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 all these contexts. Thank you very much for this question. In the moment, in the historical moment where we are. Uh, uh, partly after, partly in the pandemic. At the beginning, um, I may say that at the beginning, I, I must say we were not ready to address the issue. And we are developing tools, but still I wouldn't say we are ready with, with solutions. However, I may say that in a very, very reduced time, global society, global community uh, was uh, offered a uh, universal tool for reducing a lot of problems dealing with uh, whether medical or not, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, economic uh, for reducing all kind of problems, uh, which is vaccination. However, for reasons unexplained, a lot of people also here in Poland decided to say no to the solution, to reject it. Honestly, I cannot explain it to myself. Um, I remember this period when vac vaccination came into view, came into existence, like early last year. Uh, they were available to medical staff, and then uh, in February uh, 20, uh, 2021, uh, I imagined, you know, queues uh, and, 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 issue, and people quarreling, uh, uh, making there was nothing of that happened. And for me, this is more than a surprise. I'm stunned. 
uh, how is it possible that uh, you have so many uh, bits of information, you have so many information outlets, um, you promotion, uh, social media, you name it. And uh, how is it possible uh, that our message, mm. our message of the saving role of uh, vaccination has no effect, has a very, very limited uh, effect. Um, you know, uh, I, uh, I, uh, within last uh, 38 uh, hours, I had patients who, uh, uh, who, were, uh, who were consciously avoiding uh, vaccination, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, they were conscious not to choose. Uh, they were dying. They cannot see their families, and their families still believe they shouldn't get vaccinated. They shouldn't get a jab. Uh, so honestly. Uh, I don't know how to handle this. Yes, I agree. This is a huge challenge. And I think one form of approaching, of addressing this challenge is perhaps what Lublin-based universities decided to implement, or to try at least, to, to take uh, integrated action to create, uh, take uh, uh, cooperative, co co cooperated action to educate on all levels uh, to develop digital solutions in medicine, but also to address the issues of social awareness of these solutions. And I would like to, to talk a little bit about these solutions and ask uh, prorectors to uh, to talk uh, with us about them. I, I'm glad to uh, to hear what my colleagues say uh, that modern medicine, we can even say digital medicine, because even in my field, when I operate on a patient, I can't imagine. Uh, all these, uh, you know, blows and whistles, uh, robots, lasers, uh, different devices operated by uh, surgeons, specialists in different different areas of, of therapy. Uh, in a way, naturally, we agree that now we are going to plan further development together, the development of medical, digital medical services together with uh, Technical University, Mercury University, uh, and in fact all uh, Lublin-based uh, universities to create uh, our Lublin Digital Alliance so that experts from different fields get together to uh, provide conceptual work to propose um, ideas for future grants, propose legal solutions. And as Professor Pastuszek said, uh, this project can be um, even referred to as, uh, uh, broadly speaking, post-COVID rehabilitation program. Um, and it's not you know, to rehabilitate patients uh, literally, but also there is prophylaxis, there is treatment, all based on new technological solutions. Now, now, thank you. Uh, let me pass the floor to, to, to the colleagues. Professor Pastuszak. Re referring to Professor Chuchval's uh, opinion, there is, of course, a lot that can be done by uh, the academia uh, experts who can speak uh, in a competent way about um, epidemics, about uh, all the changes that uh, university um, environment should um, uh, should uh, really uh, face, because among um, scientists. We have also uh, people who are skeptical about um, certain new technology, uh, medical developments, uh, just uh, to take the example of um, COVID vaccine. And we, we sometimes lack uh, tools as, as academics because we, we cannot force our colleagues or students to get vaccinated against COVID. 
even though um, in uh, the light of the latest uh, um, medical findings, uh, uh, the vaccine can help us avoid uh, serious disease or death. Um, of course, uh, we will encourage students uh, and colleagues to keep the distance, to keep reminding of, uh, of um, the threats to, to, to go on. Uh, speaking about the digital uh, alliance in Lublin, we have, our university has prepared certain work uh, as contribution to our cooperation. And in the future, this, I believe, will become operational uh, when and the project will be ready to uh, apply for funds. Uh, can we have, can we hear from the Technical University? Uh, well, I think maybe it's the first time in the history of Lublin when uh, the authorities of Lublin universities have come together to do something together. The idea of Lublin Digital Alliance is uh, particularly close to me because I've been um, an IT expert, an IT guy for years, and I know how IT can help humanity. And for me, and how it can shape our awareness. I think universities have a great role to play to shape uh, students' awareness and graduates' awareness of information. Why so many people don't believe in, in the, what, what the mass media or what um, scientific communications provide. Well, according to public opinion polls, many people believe that 60% of the social media uh, is fake, um, is not true. So sometimes some people say um, uh, in the internet is a big is a big garbage bin. Uh, if you put garbage in, you get garbage out. But this is the role of universities, whether in this region or elsewhere, to tell um, to sh to spread reliable, good quality information uh, to to everybody who's around, who wants to listen. Well, we can see questions are getting more and more difficult. And this question I'm going to ask is particularly difficult. Um, speaking about the Lublin uh, Digital Alliance, it aims to uh, develop some horizontal structures that will uh, work in R&D programs. Uh, something that, well, this integration, I imagine, doesn't need administrative effort. Uh, that is why Lublin, for, for a third party beholder, Lublin can seem more integrated. But this panel discussion has yet another goal. I mean, we wanted to arrive at certain conclusions concerning social effects of digital transformation including the effect uh, that we can call a uh, new quality of, of medical services. So, Professor Krasowska, what expectations do we have um, as regards um, digital transformation, if you look at the state before and after? A difficult question indeed. Uh, well, these expectations uh, are multi-layered. Layer one is the expectations of various uh, groups of interest, stakeholders. The patient is, is the central stakeholder. So since every one of us can be a patient, so we would like to have a quick and uh, Mm, uh, proper medical intervention. Another expectation is easy access to medical procedures, to consultation, to to mm, surgeries. Uh, so so many aspects that have been discussed today. Another point is another layer is uh, for patient uh, education. Um, awareness raising that will create or shape the patient's social awareness. 
for example, to to follow certain uh, reliable, rational health policy that will produce desired effects. So, for example, if we communicate that we want to vaccinate the population, uh, the population should uh, come to a conclusion that this is fine, that this, and they should be open to uh, such uh, policy. Um, another aspect from patients' perspective is education on um, illness prevention and uh, say control of uh, chronic diseases so that when a patient suffers from a chronic disease can be contained um, to such an extent that the quality of life is not dramatically reduced and the person can uh, work professionally, can uh, continue their regular routines. Um, so there are also expectations from other stakeholders other than patients. So for example, service providers. And this is in the interest of all service providers to have uh, the e-services, telemedicine services be funded by the state. And they should follow certain medical standards. They should rely on uh, medical and IT staff. And yet, uh, the knowledge that uh, is used should be Should, should work to the best possible effect and among the largest possible group of uh, recipients. As a result, medical services uh, should also reach uh, locations, places that uh, have been deprived of, of access to, to healthcare services. Uh, but I don't not only mean uh, uh, distant um, locations geographically, but also also um, social assistance centers or, or, or homes or care homes. Uh, also, there is this aspect of sensitive data and the collection of sensitive data and cybersecurity. So there is still the expectation of yet another group of stakeholders um, who will supply, but also receive services or who will pay for services. So they expect that this data will be properly collected, properly sorted, archived and secured because uh, this is sensitive and we have heard of cases where data leaked into um, um, in, a, in, a, in an illegal way or, or out of control, so this is something we would not, not would not like to see as stakeholders. And of course, uh, all these uh, stakeholders want to deliver and receive high quality services, services that are also reasonably priced because they need to be available to the biggest possible group. So. I can go on listing all these expectations, but we are pressed for time. So I, um, I, I feel we have not exhausted this subject. Um, there is still a lot to add. Maybe new concepts, new conclusions are still there. Uh, well, indeed. Um, and I imagine we have only uh, touched on the surface of many subjects today, but there's no, no other way to go, I'm afraid. And uh, also a question about the future, the future in healthcare and services in Lubelsk. Uh, let's go back to Technical University of Lublin. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that our university can be uh, part of this um, alliance that will make the system better. But from the patient's perspective, uh, every patient should have an e-card so that wherever they go, whether this is a 
clinic or outpatient clinic or some other medical center, they will be able, thanks to this e-card, they should be able to get the service. And the facility will, thanks to the card, will have access to all medical data about this person. And of course, only authorized uh, people in the facility will be able to get this data. In other words, as a patient, uh, I should not go uh, with the whole f mm, folder of files, documents, or copies from one doctor to another mm, uh, to get my service. Thanks to this digital um, uh, card or passport, I expect I will get the service everywhere um, in, a, in a trice. All right, gentlemen and madam, thank you very much for this exchange. Let's let's uh, round up um, this discussion, Professor Raidak. Well, I, we've heard very interesting opinions and insights from uh, Rector Krasowski, from Professor Czerwinski. Um, if I'm if I may stress uh, one thing, we come here together because we are entering um, the era of uh, digital medicine. In Lubelskie, we have certain ideas, ambitions, and ready projects that we would like to implement. The funding is the key. That's why we are establishing this um, uh, Lublin Digital Union or, or Alliance, uh, you name it, because this may be the way to work together. And we would like to transfer um, or transform this, this part of Poland, where we are, into digital uh, Poland. And telemedicine, because of the pandemic, has become a strategic component in this system. And we have seen frequently in all our fields, we have seen different innovations, different concepts that later became a standard. And now I believe that uh, digital medicine solutions will soon be just a standard. But to make it possible, we have to be open to cooperation with um, cyber and IT specialists. They will be just uh, as important in our hospitals and universities as medical personnel, because our, these um, digital systems will need maintenance, supervision, upgrades. So uh, this is maybe one of the conclusions of today's talk. As uh, the governance of the university, we have to focus on uh, forging cooperation, maybe mm, sourcing uh, talents in, in uh, IT or high technologies to go to this new stage of development as quickly as possible. Well, the, no institution or no university can achieve a breakthrough uh, change all alone. This is possible only when we mm, have a shared conviction that Together we can do more, that together we can develop a new quality, and that this process is um, a, a win situation because nobody loses. There is a great uh, sphere of new opportunities in medicine, in uh, social sciences, but also in the area of environmental sciences, climate sciences, and, and re respect for climate and its uh, resources in the natural environment. And these resources um, are, mm, uh, are not unlimited. And the challenge that we are facing is not to waste uh, these chances, these opportunities. The, the, the years to come, 
will will show whether Lublin, among other Polish academic centers, uh, makes the grade. And thanks to cooperation, we can do it. At the same time, this will translate into the quality of life, standard of life of local residents. And these solutions, many of them demo or pilot solutions, I believe, will become a standard and will be transferred into other regions in Poland, as it is the case with, with telemedicine in ophthalmology, for example. And it seems that maybe we should close this uh, talk with the following conclusion. It's only up to us whether we will grab this opportunity and, and use it, because funds will be perhaps easier to, to, to obtain sooner or later. Uh, anyway, all our effort will help rationalize the whole medical system, medical care system, and it will lift the standard of living, not only in big cities, but in the most distant rural areas. I want to thank to all speakers for your very valuable insights and contributions. I would like to thank you, um, dear audience, for a great atmosphere that you have created, because from our perspective on stage, I think, uh, and this is a commonly shared impression, we, we, we see that you are listening very attentively. Thank you for your resilience. Thank you for staying with us until the end of the talk. And I hope you will be also part of this break, of this great idea, of this great project of the future. Thank you, uh, Professor, for chairing this uh, panel. Ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, take a lunch break. And we're back in the room at uh, 1 o'clock sharp. Thank you.
Drodzy Państwo, zaczynamy kolejny panel. Bardzo się cieszę, że są Państwo z nami. Przypominam, że ten panel będzie także tłumaczony, jeżeli ktoś z Państwa i będzie prowadzony w języku angielskim, jeżeli ktoś z Państwa chciałby skorzystać z urządzeń, tak by słyszeć tłumaczenie tu na sali, to tu jest miejsce, gdzie można te urządzenie pobrać. Zapraszam Państwa na panel trzeci pod tytułem Prawne, ekonomiczne, ekonomiczno-społeczne i etyczne bariery wdrażania innowacji w obszarze e-zdrowia. Ten panel poprowadzi pani profesor Ilona Biernacka-Ligienza, koordynator naukowy projektu Reinitialize Uniwersytetu Marii Kirii Skłodowskiej. Jej zainteresowania badawcze to między innymi media lokalne, komunikowanie masowe, demokracja lokalna, globalizacja, globalizacja, media i polityka. Uprzedzę też Państwa, że na zakończenie będzie możliwość zadać pytania naszym ekspertom. Jeżeli będą Państwo chcieli w tym wskazanym momencie zadać pytanie, zachęcam, by unieść dłoń, a wtedy przekażemy mikrofon tak, aby Państwa pytanie było słyszane także w wideo, streamie i inni mogli również usłyszeć Państwa pytanie. Ci, którzy biorą udział w naszej konferencji dzięki transmisji online. Pani profesor, przekazuję głos. Dziękuję serdecznie. Uh, thank, you, sir. thank you so much for um, inviting me to that panel, uh, for inviting my dear guests from University of Macerata, University of uh, Leven and University of Aarhus uh, to take part in this magnificent conference, uh, which is absolutely gorgeous and uh, important for uh, everybody who is caring about health. And I think there's nobody who uh, do not uh, care about our health. Um, I would just give a, a short introduction uh, about our project and the project ideas, and then I will, in, uh, I will briefly uh, describe our experts. So first of all, Project Reinitialize um, is a quite new uh, project. It's been running in our university since this year, since, the, since January 2021. Uh, um, and its basic um, aim is to strengthen and stimulate scientific excellence and the innovation capacity of uh, University of Marie Curie uh, Skłodowska uh, in the design and use of digital technologies in the sector of health in a way that adheres to the ethical principles. Um, shortly speaking, the aim of the project is, first of all, to enlarge our knowledge and research experience in terms of uh, e-health systems, uh, especially from the perspective of uh, active aging, and also uh, to strengthen the capacity of the University of Marie Curie Skłodowska in terms of internationalization of process of uh, research. Uh, so uh, we are going to, first of all, um, bring added value to our researchers, but secondly, we would like also to improve the strategy of uh, our university in terms of uh, e-health uh, research and apl uh, application of those research results into the business sector. So that's the main issues of our project. Um, the um, core uh, institutions who are participating in our uh, project are University of Macerata, uh, the uh, university uh, which is based on social science and humanistic science. Uh, that's why we are focusing in our uh, project not only on technological aspects of uh, health sector, but also on the ethical, legal uh, aspects of uh, introducing new technologies into the uh, society structure. So how to uh, create effective uh, applications, how to communicate uh, through the digital media, media with the society in an ethical way, uh, in a way which doesn't harm any legal aspects of contemporary uh, society. So uh, that's, uh, that's why University of Macerata is supporting us mainly in that Scale. Uh, the second partner of our in, uh, in institution is uh, University of, of Q11. The University of Q11 is specializing in uh, international research and interdisciplinary research. A Q University of 11 is one of the most important uh, 
institution in Europe and in the world in terms of uh, digital uh, health uh, research. And also, what is important to underline uh, is very effective in um, resourcing from the EU, in uh, gaining resourcing, uh, resources for uh, research from a European Union fund. So that's why we may, the, may have the opportunity to learn how to be effective in that uh, way. Uh, so uh, also uh, the third our partner is Eurocentro, um, the um, institution from Italy uh, who is specializing in, in terms of uh, managing uh, and designing the EU uh, project. So uh, this cooperation uh, really um, is very effective and uh, I hope uh, in the future brings uh, positive uh, values, not only for us as members of the project, but also brings uh, positive results to the society uh, because we are planning not only to educate our, uh, our staff at the university, but of, uh, first of all, we would like our results, which we are gonna to produce, uh, be uh, adjustable to the society needs. So the application which we are thinking of uh, to produce as a final result of our, one of the final results of our project may be uh, useful for the uh, Lubelski region and hope not only for the region, but also for the um, people who needs any kind of help in terms of digital communication uh, about uh, important issues connected with uh, e-health. Um, it is worth to underline that uh, the uh, cooperation which uh, has uh, started between us uh, was uh, really um, valuable from the perspective of EU uh, grants. We got a quite high score while we were assessing uh, uh, during the, the process of ass assessment. Reinitial Noi project is part of the Horizon 2020 uh, call, which is one of the most prestigious ones in, in terms of EU funds. Uh, and while we were uh, uh, sending the application, we didn't know that e-health problem will be so important for contemporary global uh, reality. Uh, that's why the um, project is somehow closely related to, to what we are facing now, to the pandemic situation, as it, and it's un, it, and it answering to the needs of contemporary uh, world of communication. Um, that, that is basically the, the very general overview of the project and the project ideas. Uh, we hope that in two years, next two years, uh, we will be able to uh, produce results. Uh, and uh, the final, uh, the conclusion of our project will uh, be uh, used by our institutions, by partners from the outside the um, uh, academia. Uh, we are cooperating in the project with, uh, uh, with uh, Cluster uh, Lubelska Medicina. Uh, we are cooperating with uh, the company Netflix Venture. We are cooperating with Marshall Office. Uh, we are uh, cooperating with NGOs, uh, which is representing uh, by um, people, uh, but by elderly people, and all our partners, all uh, our members of Innovation Board uh, are extremely important for us, because due to their uh, support, due to their opinion, we know how to structure our work how to structure our future results. Um, that's, that's why I think that uh, the next two years uh, we will base mainly on the cooperation between us researchers and uh, our stakeholders because we are planning to do a lot of events, a lot of uh, common uh, activities uh, for the uh, stakeholders. So that's basically the, the, the our future um, cooperation plans. And except uh, the 
rule and the importance of innovation board, we have also in our project very precious uh, representative of other uh, universities uh, who are members of scientific board. We are cooperating with uh, University of Dublin, uh, with Professor Margaret Berry, uh, who is very uh, experienced and wise researcher in the sector of e-health. We are uh, cooperating with uh, Professor uh, Ryan Thunberg from uh, University of North Carolina, uh, who is an expert in digital technologies, in digital uh, communication, and he's supporting us with his knowledge and experience in terms of uh, digital aspects of, of communication. And we are um, uh, cooperating with uh, Dr. Andy Bleeden, who is supporting us with his knowledge in terms of uh, e-health ecosystems, uh, especially from the global European perspective, how those ecosystems are uh, cooperating in uh, European um, uh, countries. Uh, I suppose that uh, this brief introduction which I have uh, given to you um, let you uh, know uh, our project and our ideas um, uh, more uh, deeply. Uh, we are, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are just at the starting point. It's the first year of uh, our project. Uh, the project uh, has three years, uh, so we are finishing it in, two in 2023, uh, and we are supposing to uh, produce really uh, fruitful uh, results which will be uh, adjusted to contemporary uh, social, economical and digital, let's say this way, digital uh, situation uh, in the global uh, world. Because we, we, have to, we have to underline that contemporary world and communication about health and e-health, it's crossing boundaries. It's not only uh, region or nation, but it's crossing uh, boundaries and it's a global issue. And I think we should uh, analyze it from the perspective of a human being as a whole, not only from the uh, person who represents particular uh, culture, particular uh, society. Um, that's, that was absolutely brief introduction. Now uh, I would like to uh, introduce our uh, panelists, my dear, dearest guests, uh, who came to Lublin uh, because of two reasons. First, because uh, of today's conference, which is an, an exceptional uh, event. And of course, because of our project, uh, uh, reason because we, we yesterday and the day before we had two days of uh, project symposium, very tiring but a very f fruitful days. Uh, so uh, our guests today, our speakers will be uh, Professor um, Benedetta Giovanola from the University of Macerata, uh, uh, Dr. Simo Simona uh, Tribelli from University of uh, Macerata. Uh, Professor uh, Alessio Bartocelli from University of uh, Macerata, uh, Professor Domenico Zito from University of Aarhus, uh, and Professor Bart van Rumste from University of Leuven. And one more thing, uh, Professor Domenico Zito is our guest, special visit, visiting guest, but we hope that uh, Professor Zito will cooperate with us in the project and later on, as uh, he is a specialist in nanotechnologies and very advanced uh, technologies being used in uh, e-health communication. So uh, Professor Zito is very, very experienced and wise uh, guy in terms of new technologies and, uh, and, uh, and applying new, uh, absolutely uh, revolutionizing uh, technology in terms of e-health communication. Um, so uh, now uh, I would like to take the floor to uh, our mm, guests, just we shall uh, start our debate about the crucial issues of contemporary e-health communication from the perspective of ethical issues, legal issues, uh, social issues, how 
digital technologies, how new media, how uh, cyberspace is adjusting, changing, maybe influencing uh, our behavior, uh, and what is good, what is bad, uh, from the perspective of society in terms of uh, using uh, digital uh, technologies uh, while we are searching uh, for the information about uh, e-health. And the first speaker will be Professor Benedetta Giovanola. So, Benedetta, uh, I know that your uh, main uh, research uh, is focusing on uh, ethical issues of uh, uh, e-health communication. Uh, you are a philosopher from your, from your background, so you know uh, the deepest uh, side of a human being, so you know how human is thinking and how ethics uh, may influence uh, our everyday behavior. So I would just like to ask you, what's the rule of ethics and uh, active aging ethics principles in digital e-health and why are they critical for shaping innovation in digital health industry? So thank you very much, Ilona, for this extremely kind introduction. Um, thanks everyone here, and thanks to those all who organized, who promoted first and organized this conference in such an excellent way. So we are very much pleased to be here. First of all, because of our cooperation with UMCS and with Ilona in particular, and with, with all her colleagues who are so kindly attending the conference um, today. And uh, secondly, because we really uh, uh, enjoy uh, uh, strengthening our uh, cooperation, even with this region, uh, with this area, we were impressed by how uh, um, you know uh, uh, great it is. And then the demonstration is just the fact that uh, we are a big crew coming here, plus uh, Lorenzo Compagnucci is connected online and would also join the conference. So we are strongly committed uh, to this uh, to this cooperation. Uh, now, I don't want your expectations to be uh, too high because I, I'm not sure I know how the human beings think. I'm uh, trying to understand how they, they, they act in a way, and more specifically in this regard, how human agency, how the way in which people act, behave when it comes to health-related issues uh, is shaped uh, by their belonging to the digital space um, and by their being users of digital technology. So he health technologies, and I was I, I'm joking when I say I mean not really completely joking when I'm saying um, I don't know exactly, but I'm uh, looking forward to knowing because uh, there's a joke uh, you might know about philosophy, which is always um, or often uh, considered to be like useful. Um, just for abstract thinking in a way, which means not useful at all. And the joke is that we always say, well, the task of philosophy is not to answer questions properly, is not to provide solution, but is to raise the right questions. And I'm saying it's a joke, but it's not really a joke because philosophy and more specifically ethics is about developing critical thinking which is to say it's about trying to understand the opportunities and threats uh, that um, are surrounding us. Uh, and now when it comes to, to digitalization or digital technology, especially related to, to, to health, uh, there are two main directions that are uh, meaningful um, through an ethical perspective. The first one is to understand the way in which uh, um, ethical values and ethical principles might be or eventually ought to be embedded uh, in uh, digital technologies for health. I mean, more in general in digital technologies, but here specifically in digital technologies for health. And the other concern is how ethical issues are at stake when communication is going on in the digital space. And then you know, of course, this has been strengthened by the pandemics also, that a lot of information about health-related concern is gathered through a digital uh, a media, through social media. And this is something uh, about which is questionable how much it might provide uh, um, uh, 
further insights uh, in terms of scientific knowledge of what is going on with regard, for example, to the pandemic, or how much uh, this might be sort of information that people gather that end up confirming some bias, for example, that they might have about uh, health-related issues. So this is just to say that both issues, so digital communication on health and uh, uh, e-health in terms of applications and devices are particularly meaningful from an ethical perspective, where ethics actually uh, um, it's not overlapping uh, with legal requirements. And that's something that I would like to stress here. Because nowadays, when it comes to e-health, we very much often uh, stress the attention on the legal requirements. We also have Alessio, who is a legal scholar, so we'll come back to the legal part of it. But sometimes there's a misunderstanding, like thinking that ethics overlaps with, uh, with, with the law, in a way, or that legal regulations are the same as ethical principles and values. And that's not the case. Um, because clearly, regular regulation, let's think, just to mention, a very clear example, GDPR, is something we have to be compliant with. So this is needed. Is the compliance with the rules and with the regulations is needed. But ethics is something different. Not all ethical values and principles ought to be regulated. And they have to do with each and every person's behavior. And so ethics has to do with values, the, wa the values we believe in, and the principles that allow us uh, to fulfill, to achieve these values. Uh, and so this is following on what uh, um, Ilona was saying before. So the fact that uh, technology can't be thought, uh, can't be designed, and can't be implemented uh, without uh, having always clear in mind that it is something, this is an environment where we live, but at the same time is also a tool that should foster human well-being. Uh, that should foster the good of a society. It should be for good, uh, uh, just to, to sum it up. And so uh, there's also an effort at the European level to try find out what the underlying values of a trustworthy digital you know, a space would be, more specifically, what the values, ought, which kind of values ought to be embedded in AI system, especially when it comes to health. Most of the you know, reasoning revolves around uh, capability to trust this system, so whereby this idea of trustworthy AI, but my like provocation is, is to think it even in bigger terms, try, try to understand what the values are. For example, the values of fairness that ought to be preserved especially when it comes to e-health, or the value of, of autonomy, where, where Simona is, uh, uh, is a specialist. So there are a lot of, of values that we ought to think about, uh, even beyond regulation, and that I would, I would uh, say uh, would let us design uh, um, e-health and digital communication on health uh, in a way that it's really uh, uh, for good uh, and to enhance individuals' well-being but also the good of society um, as a whole. Thank, thank you, Benedetta, for this uh, extremely important aspect uh, for mentioning it. Uh, I think that uh, ethics uh, sometimes is forgotten uh, while we are uh, thinking in a digital way and we, we think mainly uh, while uh, using the, the digital tools about uh, those um, new um, involving um, and uh, ex exciting, uh, challenging uh, structure, but we forget about uh, our um, values. Uh, I, I, I very often I, I'm, I'm, I'm observing mm -hmm. young people, and, I, and I, 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 I think that's the biggest challenge uh, between uh, young generation and old generation, both in terms of using digital technologies and also uh, in terms of uh, having in mind ethical uh, values. And uh, I think also the, the, a kind of... Uh, Mm, treatment, uh, the, the mm, proper treatment of another person. We, we are forgetting about, uh, about uh, our um, feelings, emotions, 
uh, we just are focusing about uh, on, on focusing on um, mainly uh, on those challenges as, as as we can as we can see among young young, young generations. So challenge is the key word sometimes. So maybe. Uh, challenge w one way, but do not forget about uh, value. So I think that we, we can um, even discuss it, uh, that we have some kind of crisis of values uh, in, in contemporary, highly digitalized world. So uh, I think it's an issue for, for uh, research debate how to combine both elements values and challenges of digital uh, digital world uh, th thank you thank you uh, benedetta uh, and now i, I would like uh, to uh, introduce our second speaker uh, who is uh, simona tribelli uh, from uh, university of macerata uh, simona is uh, specializing also in ethical issues but uh, especially uh, in active aging uh, elements of, of, of ethical issues Issues and uh, also uh, in a specific uh, type of the um, Simona. Let, let me. I will. I will try to to tell in details what what you are doing because it's 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 quite it's quite uh, uh, complicated. Um, moral philosophy. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's your uh, specialization and also. Ethics of artificial intelligence uh, at the Media Lab. Uh, so, um, can you, uh, Simona, can you can you tell us maybe a little bit about how active aging uh, via ethics can contribute foster uh, active aging? What are the new active aging areas on the ethical and technical standpoint that can be uh, critical for designing the systems, active aging tools, uh, how it is uh, it's been changed uh, while uh, we are um, doing things uh, with active aging. Yes, thank you, Ilona. So, yes, I'm working a lot on, you know, the era that Professor Giovanola has just outlined. So, detecting the critical principles, ethical principles that are crucial for design of e-health technology and they're working a lot also with engineers to operationalize them. So if we think, for example, about the specific area of active aging, so we just outlined that digital technology is deeply reshaping how we live our life. So if we think about active aging or like the process, the, the phase of aging, is for sure like a special, we can say, and delicate phase of our, life, of our life cycle. So here, ethics really provide the tools via principles to assess if, for example, the implementation of technology, digital technology and AI, for example, algorithms-based, machine learning-based technology, can really promote, foster, or undermine this process. Um, if we think, for example, just to mention one of the principles that I think are critical, for example, autonomy. Autonomy is one of the core AI ethics principles. It's also a critical principle in medical ethics and bioethics. And this, you know, like uh, outline, emphasize how much the respect of autonomy is important. But understanding what is autonomy is another thing, both on a philosophical point of view, on a ethical point of view, and on the other side, on the technical point of view how to operationalize the respect of autonomy. So what, I mean, autonomy entails. So autonomy, and I think it can be really like, uh, not just the principle, but the currency, the criterion to both assess the impact of AI system on active aging, so on the process of active aging, and also the measure, the design, the, the criterion to implement and design better system. So autonomy means for, on a one side, on one level, control, self-determination. So being able to choose and act in a way that is free from constraints, for example. So in a way, in a broader sense, that is connected with dignity. So choose and act, for example, in a way that is aligned to our interest, our maybe deep need, our valuable project. So living a life that can be, I mean, self-considered dignitous, that can be self-considered meaningful. So if we think about the concept of autonomy in the process of active aging is central, is critical. 
So a lot has been done, for example, in the field of AI, assistive robotics, for example, or smart environment, in order to promote autonomy as support, so as, you know, trying to um, make the person that can be disabled, for example, by certain kind of pathologies, or like if we think about elderly people, in the condition to be supported to do certain basic tasks. Um, less, and I think this is like a new frontier on which we should work a lot, uh, has been done, for example, in the field of specific machine learning, deep learning, and used, for example, by a recommendation system to improve uh, personalized medicine. That is a new field that, you know, like open, you know, like the, the doors to the application of uh, really, we can say, uh, home care and uh, personalized medicine and care for elderly people. So it's like a, a new critical import, an important area to improve. So at the same time, uh, and that can be, you know, like, uh, if you think, I don't know, um, I, be, I think that there are many engineers in the field, but if we think about uh, recommendation systems so that can collect whole data of people, health records, and use them to predict certain disease and to recommend certain action, a certain lifestyle, this can be critical for personalized medicine. At the same time, there are so many challenges. So as ethicists, we have to predict those challenges, those risks that I'll try to outline very briefly and try to mitigate them. For example, the, the first one is you know, privacy. So on one side, it's highly useful applying the predictive capacity, the machine learning capacity of algorithms to predict a certain disease on the basis of certain symptoms. So health data as an input. On the other side, it's really problematic, the idea that the, that kind of, that amount of data that is sensitive can be used by third party companies. So this is, you know, for example, <laughs> forbidden in the EU, although can be maybe also mostly regulated, but for example, in the US is, uh, we can say, <laughs> legally possible. So the fact that I can collect your data and use them, for example, to I don't know, try to push your behavior to buy certain medicine or to, I don't know, like manipulate your behavior to maybe um, prefer a certain health treatment rather than another one. So in that way, so by manipulating my behavior by my data that are part of my identity because you reflect my identity, you're undermining my autonomy. Another way, for example, to undermine autonomy by, by uh, machine learning can be um, we know that you know, like um, machine learning algorithms have this huge capacity um, to predict. Uh, so these, we can say, high-level performance. On the other side, uh, they are not infallible. So sometimes the recommendation based on prediction are, you know, like, not really accurate. So if you're recommending me a way to improve my lifestyle, but it, this way is not really, we can say, accurate. Mm, there is like a very um, I think uh, well recognized problem in the field of machine learning, the, the, the problem of symptom, symptom, we can say symptom paradox. The fact that machine learning detect correlation that indeed are not really important for a certain outcome. So if you recommend me something on the basis of reasons or input that are not really critical, you are undermining my autonomy because are recommending me a way to behave or to change my lifestyle that is not really you know, accurate, so precise. And another thing, another thing, Another, we can say, problem, risk uh, in this regard, for example, is that I'm not able to understand the process of algorithms that, you know, like undermine very often, above all when we, we deal with machine learning or deep learning that are, you know, widely used in the field, we are not able to understand the process of the AI system, in this case machine learning, that is affecting me by providing me, for example, a certain outcome, a certain prediction, recommendation about my health. So this is, these are challenges that if we are able to anticipate, prevent or mitigate, we can really exploit, harness like to the fullest the potential, the predictive potential of this technology in a way that is ethically oriented and you know like above all when we think about active aging can be really fruitful. So uh, uh, this like just you know, like few insights, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Hilona. Um, I think that uh, we are working a lot. This is like a new research that we are carrying on about, you know, like the way to rethink about autonomy from an ethical standpoint, above all in the light of elderly people, and um, how to operationalize it from a technical standpoint in the field of healthcare. So providing, you know, 
more precise, uh, um, ethically aligned uh, systems that I think combining these two elements uh, in, a, in an original way can you know, like provide us so much new material to also to, to, to use for the research and innovation in this field. So thanks so much. Thank you, Simona. Simona, I, I have one more question. Uh, yes. Um, can, can you uh, give such an, ex an any kind of example? What, what was the biggest challenge when, while you were doing uh, your research uh, in terms of uh, elderly people and, and they are confronting the, m those machines and, and the new, new technologies? Uh, have, have you noticed uh, any particular uh, problems uh, among, among people? Uh, there are so many problems, like, of course, like the, the, the first one is digital literacy. So the fact that, you know, sometimes like the person, so the, the app is not designed in a way that is not just user friendly, but is elderly people's friendly. So that they, they have like a certain kind of understanding, a certain different kind of needs, different kind of way to perceive and to also translate their needs into, you know, like input. So this is like the, the first, we can say, basic challenge. So try to understand that before designing systems that of course should be like very precise and very effective, but to be so, you know, like effective needs to be to take into account, first of all, like the, the, the way in which elderly people behave, their needs, their vulnerabilities, and thinking about the ways to really like uh, compensate them via, for example, providing like extra support via systems. So finding ways to compensate with those, um, you know, those, with, with those impairments that maybe they can, uh, mm. they can feel, they can, yeah. So that is like the, the first one. And then there are like uh, high, maybe more complex problems that concern, yeah, like uh, how to make the system really explainable to, to, for that person. But in this field a lot and in the EU where, you know, like the, the full automation of um, certain technologies is not still, uh, or at least for now, maybe <laughs> in the good thing, um, approved, so much needs to be done also in the field of healthcare provider that, you know, like do this kind of mediation between the patient and, uh, you know, the, the technology provider. So. Yes, that's that's. I think that's the biggest issue uh, to to correlate be, be, between uh, uh, users, uh, uh, people who are uh, responsible for uh, keeping an eye on law aspects and and managing the the the, the um, systems, and of course the the designers. So that's that's uh, that's the, the biggest issue. I think we, first of all we should listen to our user uh, our user needs, and then. Uh, design the the, the uh, tools for 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 them to project the system uh, the the systems for them. Thank you, Simona, for for Thanks for for, for, for great presentation. And now we have our uh, specialist in law. Uh, so it it sounds it sounds really. Uh, um, very, very serious. So we will, we will be looking but, but, at. But you know that I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Alessio, you are. You, 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 you are. You, you, you know the, the, the law very well, and especially the, the, the law of e, uh, e health system. Um, uh, Professor uh, 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 Alessio um, um, Umberto. Uh, oh. but, yeah, but, but, but it's difficult for Italian people too. <laughs> also? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, Bartolacelli. Bartolacelli. No, that, okay. You know, I, I always I'm only con I'm always confused because I'm, I mix you with Alessia Bar uh, Bartolazzi. Uh, so that's, that's and we are from the same university, and many people make this mistake. So I know, and she's also in, uh, in our in our project. So. <laughs> So that's 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 uh, that's 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 the reason. Um, and uh, Alessio uh, is specializing in uh, law and special in e health law. Uh, he is working also for the University of Materata at the law department. Uh, oh, yes, am I right, Alessio? Yeah, the, the, for, for this project, yes. Yeah. My main area of specialization is company law and corporate law, and uh, and this is why. 
and my intervention will be the most boring in this, <laughs> in this panel. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. But no, it, please, no, go on. <laughs> Okay, and I know that you are specialist in, in corporate governance, and 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 somehow corporate gover governance is is uh, is uh, strictly related to uh, to uh, to the e health management. And uh, I, I would I would I would like to to ask you: Is corporate governance relevant when it comes to digital health? And if yes, why? Uh, I know the corporate governance from different perspective, but uh, I would love to listen about the e health and corporate governance well. uh, structure. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Ilona, and thank you very much to all our uh, hosts for for welcoming us here in this beautiful city and for this wonderful occasion. I'm extremely grateful. Um, well, yes, uh, corporate governance is relevant. It is extremely relevant, as it is relevant when it comes to companies. Uh, it is very nice because, uh, well, companies uh, have already appeared in uh, Simona's intervention somehow. Benedetta was talking about the fact that uh, uh, ethics is for good and philosophy is for good. Uh, are companies for good? Um, and the answer is no. Companies are for money. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to be that brutal, but I'm rather sure that uh, most of you will be in a call with me when I say that companies are for money, for getting money, for giving money to uh, the, the shareholders at least. And this is the common attitude. And this is the general approach to corporate governance and to company law. But in other words, it's possible. Or at least there is a, recently, in the recent years in particular, an increasing movement saying, pay attention because, well, yes, Money is something that drives the establishment of new companies, for sure, that drives the management of companies, but uh, companies have also a social responsibility. This is the approach that I would like to take with, the, with reference to, to this issue. Naturally, it is not the only legal perspective possible. Naturally, also, uh, Benedetta already mentioned the GDPR, and Simone as well, the privacy problems, and these are meaningful problems that we are going to treat and to deal with during this project. And there are many other issues. Let's think about intellectual property and protection of inventions. But at the same time, I think that it's important to understand that the corporate governance could be, could find in the field of e health and in the field of manufacturing of e health devices, an important point of view. Why? Because we are here dealing with something that's extremely relevant, that is people's health. And from this point of view, the stakeholders, the possible stakeholders, are all citizens. And every citizen and the state in the moment in which the public healthcare system is purchasing goods from a company. And the patients, the citizens' patients, when it comes to the e-health um, technology that is sold directly to these people. So we have to think about how the companies that are manufacturing these devices are, are approaching their, their potential consumers. And naturally, that can be a, 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 a well, a, market-driven, um, a market-driven attitude. That means, well, let's treat health as any other issue. And means let's uh, have health treated in, in, so that we can make as much money as possible. That is a possible attitude, but there is another one that is, let's listen to people how they want their health to be managed. And their health care problems can be managed by the companies that are producing these devices. And there are many possibilities for having this made within the structure of a company. Because naturally, the company could decide this directly in its production. But what I'm arguing is that there is a possibility also to incorporate this in the core system in the core part of the company itself that is where the company's management takes place and how to make so it is possible to listen to the consumers or to listen to the stakeholders in many ways incorporating them or having them present in the board 
in the board of management or the supervisor board. Naturally, this depends very much. I'm an Italian lawyer, and so I'm thinking in terms of Italian company law, but I know that, for instance, in Poland, there, are, there is the Chutaya system with, uh, um, with the board of directors and with the supervisor board. Okay, you can put someone that is interested in these issues directly there, and giving them a voice power, also in defining the strategies that the company is, uh, is to pursue, or to establish a new board, a new intermediate board to have this done. Or again, to have periodical in meeting with this kind of, of, of people. And in all these situations, you can have a better listening to, to the people that uh, are going to use, at the end of the day, the, the device. So, from this point of view, I think that this is uh, very, very relevant uh, in, in, in general terms. In particular, I think that there is also the possibility to make a general distinction. That is, uh, having on the one hand, the leisure uh, devices, and on the other hand, the medical devices, properly speaking. Because while the leisure devices are or can be treated or may be treated as any other kind, this smartphone, uh, this uh, smartwatch that uh, measures my heart pulses, for instance, it can be held as, a, as an e-health device, but it is naturally something for leisure. Not, uh, not something, properly speaking, medical. And from this point of view, what we could uh, think about is whether at least in the most severe case, and at least in those cases in which the medical devices are dealing directly with uh, the real health of people, with uh, hospitals, with ambulatories, and so on and so forth. In these cases, perhaps, we should implement this kind of uh, uh, intervention of public directly in the corporate governance system. And this means that we are going to face the necessity, the need to have these people intervening directly in the decisional process. That's something hard. And that's something that is or is likely to be costly, but perhaps it is worth considering. So from this point of view, I think that there are many possibilities for including the consumers in the governance system and in the buttons room so that the governance of these companies can be more patient addressed or customer addressed. But this means also changing our mental attitude when we deal with, with corporate governance. Naturally, this deals also with the general problem of corporate social responsibility. Naturally, the European Union in particular is taking a lot of new initiatives in this field. There are at least four new initiatives from the European Commission that are open directly in the field of sustainability in general. But naturally, when it comes to sustainability, that is the, the big word in legal, uh, in legal sciences today. When it comes to sustainability, we cannot think it just in terms of environmental sustainability, but also in terms of social sustainability. And when it comes to health, this is a real social sustainability that deals directly with each of us. Thank you, Lorenzo. So, from your from your uh, speech, uh, again, we have one uh, conclusion: we have to listen, uh, we have to adjust, and we have to cooperate on each uh, level just to be uh, uh, as effective as it is possible in e-health communication. Uh, I have one small question uh, for for you. One more: uh, Are there specific uh, specific specificities in corporate governance that are applicable applicable? Directly to digital health. Can you can you uh, can you give some examples for, um, for companies for uh, firms who are dealing with e-health? Uh? Yeah, I, I I made a survey of the most uh, uh, most important current e-health companies, uh, and uh, there is a there is a list uh, um, available online, 
And if you look at that, you can see that most of them have incorporated some medical doctors directly in their boards, for instance. It is something that's very, very, uh, very common. It's a first step. I mean, this is just one side of the kind. There is the other side, that is the patient. It is hard to find because you cannot find the specific patient. You could find an association or you could find a foundation that takes care of this particular profile. But, uh, but in any case, um, I think that we are on that, uh, on, on that road. We are on that road, uh, but uh, uh, I have also to add that uh, uh, digital or e-health companies usually incorporate in the, uh, in the boards uh, medical doctors also because they are who had an idea. And so uh, we have somehow a conflict of interest here because those doctors naturally, yeah, they, they, they have uh, the Hippocrates, uh, <laughs> the, the Hippocrates um, uh, oath and so they, uh, they naturally must uh, operate in the best interest of patients. But if they have a company, they also operate in their, in, in their interest. And, uh, and for, uh, for this reason, I think that a, a, a stronger presence of, uh, of patients uh, and of other constituencies and of other ultimate beneficiaries in the field could be very useful. Thank you. That was what I what I was hoping to you know, to hear from your from your speech. That patient is is uh, is is important uh, in this whole story about e health and also the doctor. Uh, so and the cooperation between them uh, and the, the capacity of their knowledge in terms of digitalization process uh, all together mix, uh, mixed mixed makes the success. Uh, thank you, thank you, Alessio, for wonderful uh, speech and, and some new um, elements being uh, added to, to the um, map of uh, e-health. And um, now uh, I would like to ask for um, Teraz bym prosiła może po polsku, szanowni państ, e, państwa z obsługi technicznej, bo teraz będziemy mieli e, gościa z Włoch, który z nami połączy się e, online, profesor Lore, Lorenzo Campalucci. Campanucci. Uh, hello, Lorenzo. How nice to see you. How are you? Can you hear us, Lorenzo? We, probably sure. he can hear. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So, uh, thank you, Lorenzo, for being with us today. Uh, I see that it's lovely weather in, in, in Italy. It's sunny. It's sun, this is, the sun is shining. Uh, so um, it's, you are in, in smiling. So that sounds optimistic for our panel. Uh, every, everybody, everybody will be in a good mood. Thank you, Lorenzo, for taking part in, in, our, in, in, in our panel. It's really, it's really great to have you uh, here. Uh, I'll just give a, a, a few w words of introduction. Um, prof, uh, Professor uh, uh, Lorenzo Campanucci um, is a specialist in uh, living labs. Um, so uh, his uh, research interests are, are focusing on third mission on the university, and uh, he is uh, taking uh, um, care of uh, engagement for innovation and sustainability. And he's working at the University of uh, Macerata together with uh, my friends who are uh, today with me here in Lublin. Uh, so, uh, Lorenzo, I would, I would like to ask you just about living labs, the, the phenomenon of living, la living labs. Um, what can you tell us uh, the, about living labs? Why the, the, the living uh, labs phenomenon is so important? Um, do we uh, need a, a, um, user engagement? What's the structure of this user engagement? How to shape the living labs uh, to be uh, as effective as it is supposed to be effective? Oh. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for all the inspiring and insightful speeches of my colleagues of Macerata. Uh, if it is possible, I would like to share a brief presentation in order to uh, speak about the topic of living labs and how living labs can be uh, facilitators in the, in the collaboration between stakeholders at regional level 
in order to engage users, people in the process of innovation. Can you see the presentation? Yes, can Lorenzo, we can see. Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, I, I'm very glad to share with you um, a couple of features of our research on living labs and user engagement. Uh, we will focus on health and active aging. Um, and this work uh, was born uh, thanks to the collaboration with colleagues of the University of Lisbon. And if you would like uh, to get more information about it, uh, the paper is available in open access and it was published by the Journal of Cleaner Production. Um, what I would like to highlight, according also to the previous interesting uh, speeches, uh, is that drawing on the European paradox, according to which uh, European universities are very good at producing knowledge but they usually are not successful in transferring knowledge and exploiting it uh, commercially. Uh, we seek to understand how stakeholders and users uh, can participate in living labs activities, in particular how they can be engaged in the development of uh, innovation processes as well as sustainability which has uh, diverse dimensions uh, it's economic social and environmental dimension uh, secondly uh, this research um, was uh, focused on uh, the lisbon area because it sought to contribute to setting a living lab in the University of Lisbon uh, to promote the development of products and services uh, to support the Silver Age tourism, which is becoming a strategic sector for the Lisbon area. Regarding the theoretical uh, framework, in order to foster the conditions that support innovation, local development policies uh, have usually adopted the triple helix model of innovation, which is based on the collaboration between industry, university and government. More recently, due to uh, the complexity of environmental social issues, the triple helix, helix model has led way to the quadruple helix model. It means that along with the traditional actors, we include also the civic society, especially users who are crucial in the process of innovation. In this context, living labs, which can be intended both as physical and real spaces, represent a novel tool to put uh, citizens, users, at the core of the innovation process. After investigating the literature, we have identified three uh, gaps. And I would like to briefly highlight that uh, it is unclear which is the contribution and the role of single stakeholders, university, industry, government, in the living lab, as well as it is under-analyzed uh, a complex set of structure, methods, and practices which can be used by the living labs to engage users in the process of innovation. To, the, to this end, we have uh, developed a um, multiple case study. This is a qualitative and explorative research, uh, which is based on both a literature review and an, uh, an online survey that we forwarded to the representatives of a free European living labs. CREAHAB, which is the living lab of the University of Macerata, which is focused on cultural and creative industries. The living lab in aging and long-term care of the University of Maastricht, which is focused on health and aging. And then Hinovage, the living lab of the Catholic University of Leuven, which is focused on active aging. 
Drawing on the complex and vast literature uh, on the definitions and models of living labs, the questionnaire investigated the main characteristics of living lab in a homogeneous way. Uh, however, according to the results, uh, the area that deserves most uh, attention is the area concerning methodologies, tools and approaches to involve uh, users in innovation processes and to disseminate scientific outputs produced within academia. Findings show that uh, the most uh, useful uh, tools adopted by Living Labs are workshops and focus groups. On the one hand, uh, focus groups are participated by uh, citizens, entrepreneurs, experts, and representatives of institutions. On the other hand, we have found that uh, focus groups are usually arranged and coordinated by scholars and PhD candidates, thanks to the long-term relationships that they have established with the local stakeholders within previous regional projects or applied research uh, project. Therefore, uh, it, is, it means that uh, the university plays a role of facilitator among the local uh, stakeholders, uh, enabling them to focus on specific challenges, for example, in the field of health and active aging. Further tools to engage users are labs on innovation and creativity, which aim to foster an entrepreneurial approach and soft skills among undergraduates, graduates, and postgraduates. The, these labs offer the opportunity to work in teams and to develop business ideas to address specific challenges. It means that the knowledge produced within academia can transfer to the market and more specifically to contribute to the social and economic wellness of the local community. Another key activity of Living Labs is the dissemination of scientific outputs. The most used tools are web portals, social networks and newsletters. It is worthy of note that uh, new technologies such as uh, uh, smartphones, smartwatch, and video contents enable to raise awareness of a wide audience of users on innovative prototypes and the services developed within Living Labs. These technology uh, enables to achieve a wider audience, which is not limited to the academic uh, circle, but it includes end users and entrepreneurs. Regarding the engagement of users, of people, because we are speaking about people, not just mere consumers, uh, all the living labs highlighted that it is easy to attract the attention of users with respect to the activities carried out by the living lab. This especially happens by means of new technologies, which should be not only user friendly, but also elderly friendly uh, user. However, it is particularly difficult to make uh, users understanding the benefits deriving from participating in the development of innovative products and processes. It is even challenging to engage actively users in the development of products in the health and aging sectors. This is mainly due to uh, protection of personal data as well as personal information on health condition. On the other hand, we have discovered that it is easier to engage uh, users actively in the generation of uh, ideas for the cultural and creative uh, domain. Uh, to conclude, uh, we have um, found that living labs are experimenting new ways to engage users in innovation processes especially in the domains of health and active aging. 
Overall, the stakeholders of the Living Lab, namely university, industry, government, as well as NGOs and associations, are um, aware uh, and they have a good perception of the importance of co-creating uh, activities and initiatives. On the other hand, the generation of ideas for products and services is more consolidated than the transfer of knowledge and the commercial exploitation of business ideas. So uh, the European paradox, the gap between uh, knowledge production and the knowledge exploitation still uh, remains. With respect to uh, the stakeholders of the living labs, uh, we have found that the government and public bodies, especially the local government, uh, provide financial resources, structures and mechanisms to support the process of innovation within uh, the living lab. With uh, respect to firms, industry act uh, in order to present new business ideas, to recruit talents from the universities. universities. In addition, firms uh, provide uh, funding opportunities for innovative activities, as well as um, providing technical support to develop services and products. Lastly, regarding universities, we have found that uh, the main role of university along with uh, implementing its uh, third mission, is to provide human capital and to offer support to engage users in the innovation uh, processes. It means that the Living Lab offers the opportunity to the university uh, to increase its impact an impact which is not uh, merely an economic impact, which is uh, uh, quantifiable in employment or GDP. It's an impact uh, uh, that seeks to address also other very important dimensions, such as the social dimension, the environmental dimension, and they contribute to enhance uh, the general level, the wellness of a local community. The full, we can say that living labs deserve more attention and they represent uh, uh, not a simple network uh, made up of stakeholders, infrastructures and services. They are a new way of managing innovation by actively, actively engaging users. Users are traditionally considered as consumers uh, passive subjects to test products and services. Otherwise, users should be intended as people, people who should be placed at the core of the innovation process as co-creators of value. Thank you, I Lorenzo. would like to thank you for the attention if you are interested in getting more information, uh, you can check the paper, which is uh, uh, freely downloadable and readable on, on the web. Thank you, Lorenzo, for a wonderful uh, presentation. And the, the presentation uh, perfectly uh, targets our project and perfectly targets today, um, today's event, uh, especially from the perspective of uh, um, users and the, the, their um, being afraid of, of new technologies, so we have to do something with that, and th that's also one of the main aims of our project. So thank you for participating. Um, and we are very uh, quickly shifting to the deep technology uh, and uh, new uh, challenges of, of uh, technology and users. Uh, and I would like to, to uh, ask uh, uh, Domenico to, to, tell, to, to tell us a little bit about the importance uh, in building a national social economic system in, in a global ecosystem challenges and opportunities. What, what, what may we expect in the future and what are the obstacles which we may come across in, in, in the nearest uh, future? Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, first of all, uh, for this invitation to be here. I'm uh, really glad, uh, and I thank you all for this, and uh, I'll take this chance also to thank the audience. Um, the, I think uh, uh, there are 
discussion here could be very long, but it's clear that um, the kind of also from the talks that we have been uh, attending this morning and also has been uh, told here that uh, health it's a, a public uh, interest. So we are all interested in uh, in health, and in particular in healthcare, and. Um, at the same time, uh, it's, a, it's a service that is provided by the public itself, but there is also a lot of uh, service provided by private uh, parties. So it's uh, definitely a combination between uh, public and private. There is uh, obviously a conflict of interest there, <laughs> and they, it's not easy. They, they sit and agree. We, there was a um, uh, discussion from Alessio, which show very clearly the conflict of interest in uh, having a person inside the corporate uh, management. <clears throat> so, what will be the benefit for health? Definitely, when you decide, and has been discussed also this morning, uh, there is this um, uh, alliance, health alliance in Lublin here, so you try to build something which is uh, directly relevant to you at a city level or a regional level, or uh, even better, so the ambition to get at the national level. So it's definitely something that you have uh, ability to do. So if the governments sit together and um, all the stakeholders sit together, ideally there is a chance to build something that is valuable, meets social needs, produces social economic value for everybody, for the people, for people, and for uh, the economy, so all the parties involved. So this is the challenge. Um, apparently, there are uh, a lot of challenges hidden inside this uh, big challenge. At the same time, it's not definitely possible to think that what you are going to build here will be unique and diverse for what is happening across the world. So this means essentially um, that we need to build something that is uh, nationally relevant, but must fit into a global ecosystem. So there have been mentioned the pandemic, uh, but also before the pandemic there have been uh, the wars, there have been, there's been the internet that taught us that the world is a global village, right? So we need to think necessarily on a global scale. How we can think about, um, how we can think about having investors, big multinational company, contributing to the competitiveness of our national system, that they live on another part of the world uh, so we need to fit into an interest that is uh, good for them as well. So <clears throat> um, this is essentially the, 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 just to understand why we need to necessarily fit our national uh, system inside an ecosystem, a global ecosystem. Well, Poland has uh, about 40 million people, right? It's, uh, it, has, it is one of the country, European country with the largest population. It's uh, a good appetite for selling services. There is a good appetite for selling services in, in Poland. If we look at um, the worldwide distribution of uh, patents, uh, it's, uh, patents are also controversial, so there, there could be somehow uh, so a company try not to get another into that business uh, patenting. So patenting can be a, 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 can introduce some limitations to um, uh, innovation, but uh, it's definitely the way our company can try can somehow secure investments. So in that area, right? So thinking that it will take benefits in a certain time. If we look at this world. Um, scale, we see that uh, uh, essentially um, Europe, so European Patent Office, if we look at the 10 most uh, widespread, most, most relevant uh, European uh, Patent Office in the world, 
So um, the European Patent Office releases every year, so at least it receives application that is one thirteenth of what is received in China. So this to need to understand that what is going to happen with patents in Poland depends on what is happening in China, in Japan, in Australia, in Canada. Uh, they are more or less the same level with uh, European Patent Office is essentially scores in between these big giants. And, uh, so it's definitely a global affair, <laughs> right? So you cannot think about that it's something that it's nationally relevant for Poland alone, right? So just to come to uh, a point, uh, if we look into the European framework, uh, so the European Patent Office, what we see is, uh, I'm talking with the mask, I didn't realize. Uh, I, at least I proved that it's possible. <clears throat> so we see that uh, medical technology scores as top of the top 10 area of uh, patents, right? So this means that it's definitely re relevant and it's an area where there is a huge, huge, huge interest. So, but uh, there is another maybe surprise that can come from this. Uh, if we look at this uh, top 10 list and um, and um, we see from where this comes, we see that actually there are um, countries like um, Ireland, like uh, Denmark, that they have, uh, Denmark uh, is about uh, eight times the patent receives, eight, uh, provide eight times the patent application from Poland, but it's only five million people. So one eighth of the um, population in, um, in uh, with respect to the population. And if we look at Ireland, it's uh, twice, almost twice Poland, and it's the same size, so five. So we see well, the strong presence of companies, or in particular, for instance, in Ireland, the multinational company, because Ireland looks like a gateway between US and, uh, and Europe. So this is to say, again, that um, uh, definitely there is a lot to do in, in Poland <laughs> to get uh, uh, to a better uh, positioning, right? International positioning. Poland right now is in the top 50 countries. Uh, it's about scores about 27 with around uh, 500 patent applications per year. And then the very last surprise. So if we look at for where, from where these uh, patent uh, applications uh, are uh, coming, we see that the top 10 companies are all IT companies. So semiconductors and IT companies. So I would expect to find a medical company, a strictly medical company there. Now, if you look at this, you see uh, Huawei, um, LG, all these uh, even new companies that are strong from East, right? So it's definitely a global affair. And uh, the question is uh, now much more important. So um, how do we organize, let's say for Polish, how do we organize this in our country? And the only chance is to understand the global scenario and uh, think ahead. It's not a question of all organizing, okay, we have this solution for this technology, we can do that, there was COVID. No, you need, to, we, so the, the, the big work here is to rethink society at, uh, at, uh, entirely. So it's not a question that you can run behind technology because two years in, in this high tech is uh, like 10 years in, in uh, daily life. So my technology ages every two years. I need to look at something else because it is gone. So this is fast process. And maybe for the first time in, uh, in our history, we are dealing with something which is running beyond, so at least running faster than our ability 
to perceive a reality, to perceive society, to perceive where we want to be in a certain time. That's the point, Domenico. Thank you so much for, for such a great presentation. Uh, and I think this is a closer link to what Bart is going to tell us in a, in a second, uh, because uh, this fast uh, run towards the new technologies uh, may be a problem for some um, elderly uh, people and how uh, technology is far away from us sometimes and we have to do something uh, to uh, help uh, to users to get adjust to those new challenges uh, so uh, professor bart van rumste uh, uh, our uh, specialist in uh, technology, in new uh, technology. Uh, he's our uh, diamond in, in a team because he knows really everything about how new technologies may be uh, applicable uh, to um, the society uh, needs. So uh, before Professor Van Rumste will tell us just a few words, I suppose, we would like to play a short uh, video just to uh, give you an overview. So what we saw this morning uh, with the team of rectors here, a very positive view to ML. Uh, and, and I'm also a technologist. I'm also very, I have a positive look of, of technology. But there's a, another side to it. And uh, the other side uh, is illustrated in the movie that I like to show. And what I try to elaborate after the movie is how we can take this, this other side into account to make better products at the end. So um, maybe if you can show, it's a five minute movie um, of an, yeah. If you could maybe the audio. Alison has learned what time of day an attack is.
Okay, so you see a movie that uh, where technology also could lead to maybe uh, miss or other use than it was expected to to to, to made where, where it was made for, and the idea is how can we uh, compensate or or, or uh, uh, for, for for that that sort of second use of, 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 of the technology and uh, the ideas came and it's also a bit related to what uh, Lorenzo has uh, has presented the the ideas came uh, actually to involve uh, engineers um, in a care home and so it's also a sort of um, smart living environment and that's maybe also interesting uh, for the Lublin area to think about that to to make a sort of a biotope uh, where you can as an engineer come as early as possible in your design of your system in contact with all your stakeholders and uh, typically in, in, in a, now I'm going to talk a bit in uh, in extremes because I'm, uh, my kid is, if I look at my, my son, who's as an engineer as well, what the, I, I'm, I'm an engineer too, though, though he, he's <laughs> sitting uh, a whole day after his computer, and likes to program, likes to uh, make uh, uh, watches, uh, detect stuff, and on all the, in his breaks, he, he plays on computer games. He plays com so he's a whole day on his computer, and then, these kids are asked to, let's design something for older people. And so they have, they think, oh yeah, that's a cool, a cool, uh, a cool topic. Let's, let's make something flash for older people. And maybe if you can show the first slide that I've sent you, or I don't know whether uh, you have it or... You, no, there is no slide. Ah, uh, there is no slide. Oh, they, never mind, if there are no slides, no worry. So, um, then they, um, well, they, they try to design something, but uh, it's, and you see there's a lot in research as well, in, in, in research that uh, researchers sort of a bit further away, te technology driven researchers, a bit further away from, from, from the use case, from the application, they have all fancy ideas about how older people should uh, use their technology, a bit like in the movie. But if they then go in practice at the end of their PhD or at the end of the project, it's the users or the users are not happy or they, 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 they will not use it or, or uh, so the idea here is can you uh, get this kid uh, from away from his computer and put him in, uh, in contact uh, with uh, the target group, the care home uh, uh, 
inha inhabitants, for example, or the patients in the hospital? And can he, as early in his uh, research track, interact with these groups? Because we, I, f I find this uh, also for, for my students uh, very important that they get to know uh, the, the target group and that they can, in a way, interact with, with these people uh, as early as possible in their, in the, in, in their uh, design process or in their smart app that they are making. Or, or, or a bit also what, what uh, Lorenzo said in, in his uh, talk. So uh, for that purpose, uh, because that's also, and that's what uh, you have the valley of death, eh? and the valley of death uh, is probably known by people who are in innovation, is that there are a lot of ideas at the university, a lot of uh, nice work with uh, um, lots of papers and conferences, and, and but if it then comes to implementation, you s uh, or commercialization, you see that a lot of nice ideas leave, uh, don't leave the the the, the 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 research environment and are not implemented in in a, in a company to to be produced in mass and and, and so on. Um, and uh, one of these reasons is what, what what I said. So the the fact that. There is a the, that the needs of the of the end user should be taken into account. What we also see, and we uh, I think uh, Han Lore Stroven, who's, who's here, can can also uh, add some uh, information about that. That some products that are coming on the market are often coming too soon on the market, which they're not enough validated, and uh, this also has. Uh, sort of uh, um, results in the fact that they not grow or they are also crashing in that valley of death. Um, and then another point uh, to overcome this valley of death uh, next to these two points is the fact that, um, and that's maybe a cultural thing, uh, that you have in uh, Europe versus the US, for example, or, or Israel, for example, that there is a, a, a sort of spirit of entrepreneurship in these countries that maybe um, on universities here is not yet as well established. Uh, um, as I had uh, with a, co a colleague, I had a discussion yesterday with one of the colleagues of our group, and indeed it is true the, the uh, European universities are mainly concerned and, and in a way that uh, you, you can understand it, in publications, and uh, good publication, good journal, good conferences, maybe less in IP. Uh, IP is, is of second secondary use, of, of course, IP is changing, but that's another discussion. Um, while in these other countries, IP is um, uh, more on the forefront of their mind. So that's also something, and I get signs everywhere that I have to stop, uh, so I will stop. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's uh, more or less what I wanted to say. Thank you, Bart, uh, for the for wonderful uh, summary of our today's uh, meeting. Uh, I would like to thank you uh, for uh, all of my guests. Uh, I know that uh, one hour and a half is not enough for uh, so social scientists and engineering together to discuss the uh, e-health issues. Uh, I hope we will carry on our discussion later on and we will have some uh, ideas for new projects. Thank you one, one more time for participating in this panel. Thank you, organizers, for giving us the possibility of being here. Uh, I wish everybody uh, a very fruitful next uh, session and um, a lot of new ideas for the future projects. Thank you so much. Bardzo dziękujemy, Pani Profesor. Podziękowania także dla, dla gości zagranicznych. Dla tych z Państwa, którzy rzeczywiście chcieliby skorzystać z króciutkiej przerwy kawowej, to zapraszam, ale dosłownie, punktualnie, za dwie minuty będziemy zaczynali kolejny panel. Zapraszam więc na króciutką przerwę kawową i za moment ostatni panel.
miasta Lublin panel pod tytułem Znaczenie europejskich, krajowych i regionalnych ekosystemów innowacji przekazuje panu głos. Dziękuję bardzo. Witam państwa bardzo serdecznie. Pomimo tej dosyć późnej, popołudniowej pory myślę, że będziemy świadkami bardzo ciekawego panelu, ciekawych dyskusji, ciekawych wniosków. No bo jakby będziemy rozmawiali o rzeczach chyba fundamentalnych tak naprawdę dla innowacji w opiece zdrowotnej, we zdrowiu. Będziemy mówili o tym, jak wygląda ekosystem. Wsparcia ekosystem na poziomie regionalnym, na poziomie lokalnym, na poziomie też narodowym. Bo tak naprawdę to w jakimś ekosystemie odbywają się... This ecosystem is an organizing um, and facilitating or, uh, or disempowering um, uh, framework for innovation, government uh, and the effectiveness of uh, innovativeness or innovative implementation and so on. A lot of things that build up this ecosystem. I uh, am enormously pleased to welcome participants of our panel. Uh, so I start with Damian Marlitz, uh, Marshal's Office of the Lublin Vivodship, Department of the Economy, Acting Deputy Director. Uh, Robert Wugowski, um, board member of European Business Angels Network. Uh, Mr. Uh, Bartłomiej Grobelski, who is Director um, uh, of the Regional uh, regional Coordinator of ETA European Network, Director of the Center of Innovation Technology Transfer uh, in, at the Medical University of Łódź. Uh, director Radosław Starownik, uh, Director of Independent Public Clinical Hospital Number 4 in Lublin. Uh, Dr. Ewelina uh, Iwanek, President of the Board of OAC Foundation in Poland. Uh, Tomasz Szymajda, President of the uh, Puławy Based Science and Technology Park and a platform, uh, WAB uh, Startup Platform. And uh, another uh, leader or President of the Lublin uh, Technology Park, Magdalena Stachyra. Uh, Łukasz Gołąbek, representing uh, Innovation Center Network Groups, which is uh, the uh, company supporting uh, development of innovative uh, concepts um, and uh, uh, President uh, Elżbieta Iwanicka representing Towarzystwo um, Wolna Wszechnica Polska, Lublin Branch, Lublin University of the Third Age. Let me show, before we start our debate, a couple of slides. Uh, dealing with how we um, imagine how we uh, how we uh, perceive of how we how we have a conception Lublin based conception of innovative network of innovative ecosystem we have experiences of um, uh, of, of building the uh, uh, Lublin based uh, medical cluster a cluster that started seven years ago, and it's the biggest medical cluster in our country, and I think it will, may provide good context for our debate, uh, because some of you represent the Lublin region, so in a way we could point out uh, success factors for the cluster, the, the potential uh, sources of impetus, uh, catalysts, and how to change these, how to transform these systems into Danish-like, American-like. Um, uh, though I can't say that published systems Polish systems are, so to say, uh, bad in a way, but still there are, the, there, are, uh, there are certainly certain good practices to follow for us, uh, like uh, Danish uh, medical valley, uh, and, uh, valley and, and others. Okay, I would like to ask for screening the, the first slide. So, um, let me start with presenting the uh, ecosystem for uh, 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 Lublin Medicine Cluster, who is a co-organizer of our conference today, our event, has a um, long history and has very interesting membership. Uh, because it shows the way we should think about structures and development relations and cooperation within uh, events or within uh, units like that. I'm myself a strong advocate uh, of, uh, of uh, cluster structures. Uh, 
And I think innovative, uh, innovative technologies or innovative areas uh, seem certain preferences, show certain preferences for cluster approach. Uh, our cluster, the, cl the Lublin-based medical cluster, is a cluster of um, institutions and people who decided to to. Uh, uh, to to take part and decide whether they are making progress or not. So we have a number of uh, a number of figures like uh, the members together, more than 160 public administrative units, two universities, ten uh, public hospital, ten technological um, companies over 70, uh, medical service providers plus 50, and uh, business surrounding or business environment institutions nine. That shows that um, uh, that shows that a cluster needs to uh, involve uh, numbers, numbers, uh, huge numbers of state stakeholders to build wide networks of ideas and projects uh, to make them effective. We should build in, uh, moving from moving from uh, moving from um, classical institutionalized clusters towards ecosystems of many, many players. I could go on end with uh, with with, uh, with presenting the cluster, but um, that's not the point. Uh, having the slide as a, as a background showing the showing the complexity which has obviously its advantages and certain risks I would like to ask uh, our panelists uh, for what's their role in clusters like this how you feel this mission in the of developing the ecosystems we are part of and how business can uh, take advantage of, uh, from being member of such ecosystems and what it can give to ecosystems it's, uh, themselves. So to keep certain logic of our presentation, we need we, we are very uh, strict uh, time-wise. So we are going to have only one question round uh, because actually an hour and a half is not that long. So we have a, a round for each panelist and ten minutes for each of you, each panelist to answer the issue or address the issue. And then maybe just uh, round up one minute, um, one minute per each person, and the final question concerning uh, concerning what what shows up in our what what shows our debate. I'm uh, looking at our first uh, uh, panelist, uh, and uh, I'll ask uh, a representative of uh, uh, Lublin Vice Marshal's Office, Damian Malets, an extremely important person on the map of providing healthcare. Uh, and organizing healthcare, but that also means a lot of problems uh, to face, to address. So, how do you see that? And how do you, um, what are your objectives for the new financing perspectives? Uh, in in the sphere of um, in the, uh, what are your priorities in the healthcare sphere? Thank you very much for inviting me to the debate today. And answering your question, I would like to to give my answer in the context of two main strategic documents developed in uh, our uh, voivodeship. First of all is um, a voivodeship stra stra uh, voivod, uh, development strategy up until 2030 and innovative strategy for the voivodeship again uh, up until 2030. These are two uh, main, uh, main documents, strategic documents, um, that uh, uh, circumscribe the, um, or outline the policy we take in terms of innovation and health. And the two main objectives there are that I would like to address is um, economic development based on resources of the region, and the second is uh, enhancing uh, social capital of the region. The first objective. The strategy to develop and to promote uh, e-health services and related active aging and, and related uh, uh, related uh, services. 
shows a need to strengthen modern top-notch solutions in health, 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 uh, health care, e-health, care and, uh, and rehabilitation, prophylaxis, prevention and expanding the uh, infrastructure and systems that will allow the development of telemedicine, telecare or tele-rehabilitation. For the second objective, we can see a clear declaration of, uh, uh, of our attempts to develop top-notch solutions in healthcare services units, including uh, ICT technologies, key to improving the quality of medical services delivered by these units, and also to strengthen human potential human capital in our region. As far as the um, uh, document devoted to uh, uh, innovative development of our survivorship, I would like to stress that uh, out of five smart specialization of our survivorship uh, address, e-health, one is health, healthy society, and uh, the other is a digital society. The first specialization, this first uh, smart specialization, focuses on uh, specialist issues in digital healthcare that may become sources of uh, strategic de developmental directions for our survivorship. And uh, this means ideas such as telecare, telemedicine, tele uh, data analysis. Um, uh, to, uh, for therapeutic diagnostic and rehabilitation purposes, innovative uh, systems, uh, circuits and sensors for medical solutions, AI algorithms for medical use, biosensors, medical robotics and biorobotics, virtual reality, and all kind of simulation technologies to be used in me for medical purposes. As far as uh, research and economic uh, smart specialization for the region, these are completed by data collection processing, digital processing of resources, virtual reality and simulation technologies, development of software and technologies dealing with uh, AI uh, algorithms and machine learning. It's not without importance that our regional strategy for innovative development in its diagnostic part, underlines the role of Lublin as an expert center in a number of medical or medicine-related specializations and one of the better developed uh, IT environments or media is in, in Poland. These two documents, these two strategic documents, outlines, uh, they are official documents that function in public space, and um, they were accepted by our board uh, of the Voivodeship Marshal's Office. But let me also mention um, uh, another set of documents that are being uh, designed or under social consultations that will become uh, and will be approved as strategic documents for us. One is a project for program for strategic health protection for years 2021-22, and this program defines the main developmental directions for health policy in the Voivodeship by showing areas requiring special care and support and developing recommendations for each, uh, for each direction. One such direction is uh, resources needed to protect health, public health, and one sub-element uh, needing uh, calling for support for regional uh, health policy is uh, integrated IT system system for healthcare, for e-health.
formułując dla niego rekomendacje. And recommendations were also formulated for it. And recommendation concerns are in rebuilding or upgrading hardware infrastructure, intelligent hospital, enhancing security of data exchange, diagnostics, and other changes leading to digital transformation of data and services in the field of e-health, building central repository of medical data, Digital medicine, digital e-health is also present in other areas uh, requiring support or um, uh, eligible for support mentioned in, in, in the strategic documents. Oncology, coordinated care, uh, and uh, uh, recommendations are also formulated in that respect, like uh, in enhancing quality of cardiological care, enhancing uh, oncological care, uh, expanding access to telemedical services to uh, uh, old age uh, citizen and uh, developing exchange uh, mechanisms uh, for um, medical documentation. To end my um, speech, I would like to mention one more document, uh, also strategic uh, for, for our voivodeship. Uh, one which is under public consultations is, uh, is uh, uh, the project uh, uh, European funds for our voivodeship 21-27. And we have a list of recommendations for e-health and, uh, uh, and the digital medicine. Uh, which we submit for consultation. And what we can find is direct address. What we can find in this uh, design document is direct address to e-health and IT uh, transformation of e-health uh, units and direct mentions of projects uh, in cyber security and enhancing the quality, uh, the security of uh, uh, IT systems related with medical services. The program uh, European funds for uh, Lublin Vivership 21-27 is in a way a tool, we consider it to be a tool uh, to realize our strategy. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Director. I have one more question. This program seems uh, very ambitious, uh, and the goals are very comprehensive and broad, so they cover what we need for digital transformation uh, so that in 2030 we face uh, a completely new reality. I, I do like these solutions. Uh, patient-oriented solutions. I also like the platforms and the way you, uh, you collect medical data across different digital platforms and then managing this data, creating certain patient history uh, that will be made available to doctors. And this is indeed the future of medicine. Uh, so I want to mm, really appreciate your, your effort um, in this program. But my question is, do you know financial allocation to, to the specific specific goals in the program? I, I still, well, the project is at a social consultation stage. Uh, so I'm not um, in a position to give you specific numbers, specific figures. Okay, I, I understand. Well, yes, uh, I can see some of you smiling, and this is when you talk to uh, members of local government. Uh, they always are uh, very, very uh, reticent as regards uh, providing providing. Figures. Anyway, uh, we keep uh, we'll keep your promise. Um, we'll get the figures soon. So let's uh, switch to business. Um, Robert, you have a great experience in supporting uh, young businesses, uh, startups. 
innovation and perhaps you will be able to to answer quickly whether a specific innovation system can produce a, a very interesting unicorn or a promising company uh, but this is not what I'm going to ask you about I want to talk about clusters and money for uh, clusters and certain tools available in the coming in the coming months or years whether networking and cooperation and the development of cluster initiatives how do you how do you assess this kind of um, area does it make sense to support such projects because the opinions are divided and the efficiency of uh, cluster support has been criticized many times in our country as uh, not necessary or producing uh, no results so based on your experience with with ecosystems do you think clusters are necessary they deserve support <laughs> thank you for inviting me let me refer also to uh, to the, the perspective that we talked before speaking about innovation and innovation support there are two ways to approach it one is horizontal that is we spoke speak about people getting together to to innovate where the academia comes together with business where young people are encouraged to follow uh, an ambitious path of uh, implementing innovation and here among panelists we have um, people representing such organizations I'm glad such organizations do exist and operate in um, Lublin and the region and I know that uh, Lubelskie is particularly focused on medicine and digital transformation, but um, we cannot uh, ignore what happens after. And we know that the best uh, drivers um, of any development are um, positive success stories <coughs> I mean when we can refer to something that has worked that has succeeded on national or international scale and as an investor I'm interested in a number of startups I've been investing for for more than 10 years my company helps develop uh, the sector of, of private investors at the European level we we have business angels Europe mm, this is a chamber a platform that works uh, on this ecosystem at the European scale and I'm also involved with um, investment funds in um, the Silicon Valley in California so I can say I have uh, some experience uh, of that uh, best-in-class ecosystem so all research reports um, experiments show something that has been common property for, for many years so they, they say that you need uh, two people to give birth to a child and you need the whole village to raise this child and this is also true about startups to make a startup grow to make it successful on the market you need multiple elements of this ecosystem and only after that when this is all harmoniously integrated there is a chance not guarantee but there is a chance for this innovative business uh, to succeed what we are witnessing um, in Poland a lot of effort is channeled into into the, the setting up of of startups incubation 
and development of a new product and fine because this is uh, this is missing and the Polish ecosystem is now learning this, um, these new elements, but, uh, and of course there are startups that should go ahead and take uh, the next level. So we should work perhaps on support tools at the national level, but also work on uh, synergies, partnerships with uh, partners, markers, or elements of ecosystems in uh, in the, in the global dimension. So we had two representatives of universities before who share the same project in digital health. I think we need more, more such good uh, uh, cases because this is not only a chance to uh, uh, young startups to, to grow, but it's a good mechanism to work together to transfer knowledge and look at what startups develop from a broader perspective than the local one or even national one, because innovations that emerge in Lubelskie, in Lublin universities, so such innovations should be really uh, fighting for international success, whether this is uh, uh, digital or, or other. And especially digital solutions are relatively easy to implement on a larger scale. But still, we need to look broader, take know-how, contacts, make the best of what we have to enter these markets. It's because we're pressed for time, I, I'd like to stress that beyond this layer where we support the early operation of startups, I think we should put more pressure on how to make startups really make it on the market and I believe that these uh, points of contact, knowledge transfer, uh, uh, including at the international level, uh, this should be uh, growing in numbers, and I, I think I will support it. Uh, but uh, please uh, keep the microphone. I still have a couple of questions. Uh, I will not let you go uh, before you answer my, my first question, which is the effectiveness of institutions like clusters or business environment institutions, agencies of entrepreneur associations, because they all make up this, this um, ecosystem. And I am a, a researcher myself. I have even re researched the, the effectiveness of support uh, of, of uh, businesses in this environment. Uh, I, I, I have produced a report, and um, entrepreneurs have rather a negative idea of um, institutional support. So what is missing in institutional support in Poland? If you look at um, the stages of development of innovative businesses, what um, what doesn't click um, here? But somehow it works in the Silicon Valley. Or perhaps uh, institutions should not actually intervene because the business will anyway manage uh, contacts, uh, be able to find solutions. I think uh, this early impulse, uh, early stimul stimulus is important, and these, these programs for startups are really essential uh, maybe to not only initiate but reduce uh, certain business risk. And, <clears throat> Perhaps uh, if we look at this uh, later on, and this is always the case in management, that with, with hindsight we are much wiser and maybe we would have done things differently before, but certainly the, these, these programs 
have their limitations. There is uh, maybe too much red tape, and from the startup's perspective, one of the major obstacles is certain processes take uh, much time, and the market cannot wait that long. Even a couple of months can be decisive for, mm, for success or failure. And it's always better to have to have this support than not to have it. And another thing, a meeting like today's, this can help create a certain platform of exchange. Uh, if we take, for example, digital medicine, uh, one of the basic problems is that doctors, medical personnel, they have their own world, their own language, their own problems. Um, IT people or digital economy people, they have their own world. So these two worlds cannot communicate. On the other hand, we know that this is necessary and that this may resolve many uh, challenges, many issues of every day, but even related to our civilization and our, our general problems. Medicine in 10 years from now will probably look differently. Ev perhaps um, every patient um, in a hospital will have uh, all the data on the treatment, medicaments, uh, or diseases, or the history just at hand. And the question is whether we'll be able to use it effectively. This will not happen by itself. We have to think it through, and some of these um, ideas need greater support. As a country, we do have a chance to stand out because we have uh, good IT good IT resources, we have smart doctors, we do have a problem with uh, healthcare services, and wherever there is a problem based on global experience, there is a greater chance for a solution. Uh, rather than when everything is fine or seems to be fine. So I'm glad that Lubelskie, um is a pioneer in, in the digital medical care because I, I don't think we'll be able to build another Facebook or, or another Google in, in Poland. But if you look at digital health, we ha have a great chance, a real chance to develop new programs and new solutions. <coughs> Okay, uh, I think uh, I need to just uh, ask you yet another question. What would you invest in as far as e-health is concerned? What's the hot uh, thing? Uh, is it IT, medical IT, or is it uh, hardware? Just a short answer. In my opinion, it's digital digital services, digital services like AI, database uh, products, database services, data science. I think these are uh, solutions that are very likely to change the business models of pharmacology companies and treatment within five to ten years. Uh, so that's an investment uh, perspective that when you start dealing with it within na right now, Within five or ten years, you should have you should have return on investment and a very very strong competitive advantage. Many many thanks for your voice and let's move to Wuj. Uh, I would like to say good morning or good afternoon to Mr. Bartłomiej Grobelski, uh, director of the Center for Innovation and Technology Transfer at the Medical University of Łódź. So what's your perspective? Um, we are in Lublin, but we are looking at different ecosystems in Poland and all over the world. Can you very briefly um, explain to us uh, your model, your a AIT, a network, uh, what are the assumptions, or what are the effects? Uh, this is our answer uh, that 
that uh, that we uh, used to address the challenges uh, we the challenges we faced. First of all, we try to protect our. Uh, Mm, our, our intellectual capital. Then we uh, then we decided to uh, add uh, to our ecosystem new uh, new life uh, startups up, start ups. And uh, AIT Health, which is part of European AIT, EIT. This was a, a part of the actions were acceleration, and we started applying for support programs. Uh, we started with education, mentoring, and uh, uh, various trips, uh, uh, trying to seek some synergy with industrial um, practices. And we grew in a tool that we are able to use to help starts up uh, and we have 33 starts up which are not supported by external uh, external means, financial means. Uh, five of these survived and have five million of uh, uh, assets and turnover uh, uh, together, taken together. Will they, will they exist without EIT? I don't think so because the support granted by the network uh, collecting the, mm, we uh, we, mm, uh, we needed to uh, get partic to get engaged into projects with other company, with other partners from other mm, states. So um, this kind of competition, developing programs, allowed our faster learning to towards uh, faster uh, fast development of our projects, like food camps. Uh, with uh, 20, 25,000 euro with four months of a project, and we are able to collect ideas uh, from all over Europe in a particular domain and try to deliver it to industry in a particular industry. Uh, and we are also uh, running for products where our industry partners are hospitals. So we are trying to reach hospitals. And uh, as uh, as as said before, um, telemedicine in uh, strategic documents of Lublin. Well, that sounds very interesting. Maybe we uh, should be looking at Lublin and uh, and, uh, and and get interested in what you do here. We are a big uh, so EIT network has a. Uh, a number of uh, a number of uh, concepts, leading concepts. One of it is I, I, AAT Hub. So we decided to develop funds to get funds for our third mission, because what we are working on at the World University is uh, transfer, is development, uh, is uh, um, uh, commercialization. Uh, uh, that's actually a change in a legislation uh, of pub in publish um, uh, uh, publish uh, educational law, uh, so, uh, and and the mission is uh, possible and strengthened or emphasised uh, by the legal regulations. We very much focus on uh, startup. Academia will stay academia, industry will stay industry, but if you find someone from the academia to build a ship to reach the waters of the business, we are very proud and we try to help as much as we can. But we help other units because um, we have a project, we have a, we have a, a, a scheme, a system uh, where we offer a particular methodology for uh, acceleration and incubation. Of course, COVID was partly a problem, but um, hybrid solutions somehow help uh, as well. I think it, it, we can manage quite well at least one startup by year, uh, year by year. Uh, we will see what's going on in the second part of the year. We will try to organize partner assembly of the past and future partners and investors. And this is like a connection convergent points for our uh, meetings. Joining EIT, 
we obviously had certain challenges. We needed to uh, uh, take effort to become a partner, but uh, altogether, the university uh, only taken into account financial means um, achieved a lot. And me, as a transfer person, I got a lot of knowledge for those different transfers. Uh, uh, if you could show us a number of uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, European centers, uh, Amsterdam uh, centers that inspire you a lot. Well, Amsterdam Polytechnic uh, developed their own center, uh, tr technology transfer offices, and uh, Polytechnic students uh, help, were helped as much as, they, as, as possible to make them uh, implement the uh, products. Uh, batteries, chargers, uh, a lot of stuff that developed there. I learned a lot. Uh, I learned the most there. Um, it's uh, obviously I realize this is a polytechnical university. Uh, mm, and the second case is the Mola in Budapest. Uh, it's actually uh, Eastern uh, Eastern uh, Europe. A very similar uh, situation as in uh, Poland, but uh, but um, but uh, the unit is far free in its operation. Gets a workshop and uh, uh, allowing the students to become someone else and just the academic student. Uh, when, so when I went to uh, Amsterdam, I saw how well organized it is, and the MOLA, where I realized where the situation is as difficult as Polish, but he's he, but, but they are very successful, and I think these were two main: the Dutch and the and the Hungarian inspirations were the most important. Coming back to Łódź, let me ask again about Łódź ecosystem. We had certain suggestions concerning Lublin, but how do you do it in Lublin? How do you work in this ecosystem with with um, with uh, in, in this medical context? So, do you cooperate with the city uh, with a so-called city hall? Um, Łódź is a big uh, university center. It's also a big medical center. Is there any way? Is there any attempt for uh, from the part of the city to coordinate the efforts. Yeah, in Łódź we have big three big universities: uh, University of Łódź, um, uh, which has its own accelerator and leads its uh, center for uh, technology transfer. They sell uh, licenses and they obviously work in from chemistry to philosophy. Uh, we also have the uh, Technological University of Łódź, and there is a lot of people who try to start with technological solutions and Medical University of Łódź, which may seem is relatively um, of, of uh, fewer chances of uh, uh, entrepreneurial success. Well, how many patents, how many innovative ideas you can have in medical uh, departments? But actually, uh, it turns out this is not true. Uh, I'm surprised myself to find out how many doctors are open to uh, to, to uh, innovative initiatives. City uh, supports uh, generally, without dividing universities, uh, offers. Um, uh, office office uh, space uh, and certain contests, whereas the Marshall uh, whereas the Marshall Office of of Lu Łódź, um, is far more active of uh, Marshall Office of uh, Mazowiecki is far more uh, active. Uh, co uh, there is an academia, uh, entrepreneurial academia, and uh, these initiatives. Perhaps the the best, uh, the more advanced financial investment of the city was building a nanopark in Łódź, 
The idea was to build laboratories that will allow the infrastructural entrepreneur uh, infrastructural um, uh, framework for the system, but medical uh, branches are not very well represented. We'd we'll be happy to talk about your experiences. Um, we as Lublin and you as Wood, I think we could perhaps have a lot of uh, uh, ecosystemic inspirations. Now we move to a public hospital. And I would like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Sterovnik to uh, Radosa Sterovnik to to talk about the role of a hospital unit in this uh, ecosystem. Uh, well, it's a, you, uh, you represent the biggest uh, Lublin's hospital. I actually was born there. Um, so, uh, OK, but more seriously, uh, your vision is somewhat different uh, for, for the functioning of the hospital. It's opening to the space, opening to uh, to the world outside, cooperation and so on. How, how did you do it? Because it wasn't, uh, dev it wasn't easy in so very fossilized, uh, so strongly fossilized structure. Uh, so can you can you answer this? How to do? I think openness is a keyword keyword for success. And the motto of our of our hospital uh, that somehow emerged when we when when we reached 20, 55 years of functioning is experience plus innovativeness. Experience is something that comes with a function functioning with reflexive functioning. Innovativeness is not actually a new concept. It's actually a core of each and is a, a, a core process is everyday activity. And you can have a number of examples. Two years, something that two years was considered state of the art today, uh, or avant-garde, today is just daily bread. So um, particularly as far as medicine is concerned, we have basically two main areas, two main spaces. Innovativeness uh, works over, uh, should, should be active or should be visible in those two areas. One area is a purely medical activity called medical service. Um, our, our core mission, uh, something that we learn when we work, um, uh, all the medical knowledge we, 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 we get uh, from, um, uh, from conferences and research, uh, robotics, uh, medical services, and so on. We know that more than um, a hospital is very well equipped, technologically developed, but also um, ready for pharmacotherapy in all clinical uh, areas. Area number two, uh, mentioned by a number of my uh, pre-speakers, uh, looking from a more pragmatic uh, point of view, and maybe, uh, let's say, of a, of a practicing medician, uh, medics are overworked, that's true, but maybe because they are overworked, they are looking for certain shortcuts, certain, um, maybe this is not uh, the best term, but certain simplification areas, areas for simplification, areas for um, uh, uh, making things making things more effective in shorter time, and uh, telemedicine uh, exchange Change of data with use of uh, um, IT platforms is certainly that area. I know that a lot of that uh, was mentioned because colleagues from my uh, uh, from my uh, hospital did talk about it, but neuro uh, surgery, cardiology. Um, the, those uh, domains that perhaps are leading areas in, of our medical activity, and in a way we are successful in both the uh, experience and innovative areas. We are developing modern, top-notch uh, uh, solutions in that respect. Data exchange, um, imagery, we are pioneers in building the system for patients with uh, uh, with uh, cranial uh, uh, problems and passing data as the only in our voivodeship to passing the data from diagnostic um, test uh, in a distant procedure. So openness. 
And also, in, uh, we do not have, uh, let's say, non-medical or extra-medical areas, um, but, um, but openness is obviously the, the word that defines what we do. Cooperation with uh, entrepreneurs, with industry, again, uh, openness, uh, because we have our needs, we, um, we, we make them clear, we analyze them, we try to learn them ourselves, and we try to areas where we could be supported, but we are not, uh, it may be that we do not know that we need something, and uh, some ideas come to us from outside, from the world. Uh, uh, sometimes we are not sure whether these ideas will pay off, uh, but we are open to, um, to invest into new ideas uh, if they are promising. Okay, so we have a hospital, we have a clinical hospital, professors, world-class contacts, and there is a kind of culture of, of, um, of buying the best practices, uh, and I can understand that. I mean, openness is, is important, but, um, but I would like to say about this other uh, side of openness, uh, experimenting, I mean, and I think you did mention that. We have a business angel, we have a startup who wishes to sell something for you, test something at, at your unit, or do some kind of, or some kind of test, testing. Uh, do you have this kind of openness to external world, entrepreneurial world? Yes, the answer is definitely yes. We in terms of clinical research, clinical um, testing, as a, a hospital, we are running innovative therapy unit. This is our internal unit that uh, has a legal status to help uh, clinical testing in our uh, hospital. And we are among one of uh, several uh, units in Poland that will build its own internal branch um, to support clinical research uh, as financed by um, uh, Ministry of uh, Health and Ministry of um, uh, Science. Now, your main question is openness to other uh, options and uh, alternative options. We do cooperate with medical cluster, and I think it's a very good example uh, how to build cooperation uh, from our side, obviously, we perhaps do not add new proposals to the list in the cluster, expectations or even proposals for building cooperation. But we are, have a coordinator in the hospital to communicate with the cluster. And we are ready to cooperate um, whenever a concept or an idea occurs. We analyze it and we try to look for possibilities to engage, to get engaged or support an idea. As I say, we are absolutely ready to uh, to use the option not only to look for what we want, but to um, but we are open to what we can be given by others. And we absolutely are open in this sense to things that come to us. And very, very analytically, diligent analytical uh, 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 processes, very often quality uh, uh, enhancement comes from very tiny solutions. Telemedicine obviously is not only televisit. Uh, televisit is, you know, just uh, uh, telemedicine is, uh, is just uh, shortening the way between uh, doctors, between doctors and patients. I think it's definitely uh, the future of how we do the medicine, how we practice medicine, and, uh, and, it's, and I think it will dominate in a period shorter than 10 years. The revolution started and the pandemic uh, gave the effect of the snowball 
to this revolution. Okay, some comments from uh, uh, from um, from Robert Wugowski. Um, I would say my sincere congratulations, and I will, I'm ready to direct some of those of of uh, startups I know to to talk with your hospital, to contact your hospital, now, because sometimes it's an, again another you know, set of barriers that we face. Mm. And sometimes there is just not enough awareness, not enough power to seek for innovative solutions. Uh, to develop new spaces for uh, startup initiatives. So I'm extremely happy to be able to cooperate. I can see the problem on the other side of, of the story. I mean, the question of money. Uh, I find these ideas very, very attractive, but OK. Uh, if there is an idea, we can negotiate it and we can look for money uh, from priorities um, uh, relating to European Union, European funds. Um, I think that this is what we are interested in. As a clinical hospital, I hope to be part of the ecosystem. Because, as you said, we are the largest Lublin-based, or actually Lublin region-based uh, 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 hospital in Poland, and we uh, we are the ninth largest published hospital. So uh, I can't imagine our being out of the cluster. Okay, so we have actually lines and vistas for direct cooperation. I also would like to uh, say something that our partnership has a project where Startup Plus grant can be directed to your hospital. So maybe I'll be talking more about it soon. Okay, you can see this is a fast track for innovation and for... Okay, 30 seconds for strategic summing up of what you are doing in the future, what you are doing in, the te in, in your 10 years. Uh, we can see that what can be done has no horizon, no end. So what, what would you do? What, what would be a topic areas that you would like to follow in this strategic period of 20 years? up until 2030. I think three of them have been mentioned. Um, I, I can only confirm what my colleagues said before uh, during our meeting is cardiology that we would like to develop more and more and uh, developing the, um, uh, um, the uh, European Center for Cardiac Diseases or uh, cardiovascular diseases. Uh, Again, this was mentioned before that each uh, implant uh, in cardiac uh, area uh, communicates uh, with the world outside, like smartphone applications, smartwatches, and so on. All these devices are communicative devices apart from being cardiac devices. So this is definitely the field that we would like to uh, enhance on. So, e-cardiology uh, uh, all over the survivorship. Uh, also, uh, neurological uh, uh, and cranial diseases uh, and the data passage between uh, uses and neurosurgery, uh, data trans uh, transfers, uh, consultations uh, mentioned by Professor Radak, uh, the uh, you know reducing the distance between the hospital, uh, video consultations. Uh, I think these are our leading directions for change and uh, for new services. Each of these areas for products and services has an option for further scaling up. Um, it's just a field of our interest, but we can add new domains and new ideas. So these are three areas for today, but we are absolutely open that uh, new concepts and new directions may come to the list. Thank you very much for, for this.
Uh, now we are going to listen to the presentation by uh, Ms. Evelina uh, Ivanek, uh, president of the board of OEC, with a huge uh, experience in supporting entrepreneurship uh, skills and people. So how do you support the um, regional system of innovation? Can you synthetically uh, describe this to, to us? I'm not sure if I can put it synthetically. Our foundation has been uh, around for about 30 years, and our mission is to support uh, the social and economic development of the region by designing and implementing uh, consultancy programs, educational programs, and by supporting new ideas for business, um, innovative ideas. We also help design and implement new technology. So 30 years behind us, 30 years of experience also in the area of entrepreneurship, um, including um, since when we uh, have been able to access EU funds. Now uh, we benefit from structural funds and uh, we are effective indeed. We have closed uh, 250 projects funded from the EU, uh, it's almost 300 million zlotys. So this has been uh, our mission, as I said, from the beginning of uh, our foundation. And now uh, we focus on, on Unicorn Hub, where we incubate innovative business ideas. and. The platform has an, the whole ecosystem of support for startups. It's uh, more than 10 different institutions in our ecosystem. We have uh, Sanitas uh, Healthcare Center, we have uh, the University of Economy and Innovation, we have venture capital funds, we have Findastra, a summer agency, a number of partners that make up this ecosystem and support new startups. This uh, Unicorn Hub started in January 19, uh, 2019. It's a platform funded under European, European uh, EU operational program Eastern Poland under an agreement we signed with the Lublin Agency for Entrepreneurship Development. And in this platform, we incubate um, ideas and we're going to continue up to 2023. So there's still a lot we can do. We have incubated 158 startups uh, through five uh, rounds. Now in uh, the sixth round, we have uh, 43 startups. Out of these, all these startups, 55 uh, left the incubation um, stage and uh, enter the market of medicine and health. In, uh, in this round, we have nine medical startups. ICT, generally speaking, uh, it has 115 startups in, in our system. Money, of course, big money follow the initiatives. We can support all applicants with uh, the amount of more than 18 million. So it's uh, one of the very important uh, legs of our business, support for innovation and startups. But on the other hand, under the regional operational program, uh, Lubelskie, we also uh, deal with and absorb funds uh, from different uh, resources, uh, money that can help set up a new business. And uh, among such supported initiatives, we also have certain diamonds. We have been able to support uh, more than 700 uh, new business entities during the previous programming period, 2014-2020. 
And we allocated uh, 33 million zloty to it. Speaking about money, which is of course uh, necessary to help startups grow, we also have um, uh, a credit fund. Startups can uh, borrow money uh, from us. These loans, this is in fact EU funds, so these loans are, are really cheap. Uh, some of these uh, are up to 1 million slotties, so this is the amount of money that you can really uh, use um, and, and benefit from that. Uh, these funds uh, were usually expanded to upgrade existing machinery introduce new production lines or new technologies. These EU funds at this moment are still available at the regional level. This, this credit fund is still open. Uh, we have applicants for smaller loans up to 200,000. And I'm sorry if I may interrupt. Speaking about funds, can you can you tell us what your medical startups uh, uh, deal with? Is there any any prevailing specialization? Or is it uh, IT in medicine or AI in medicine? Is it is this some, some medical hardware? That's my first question. And second, out of your credit funds, do you lend money to businesses dealing with, with healthcare or medicine? Well, yes, answering your second question, yes, we do support, we do offer loans to medical startups and they do they do take advantage of this support. So yes, in other in other words, they can expect our support at the, the further stage of development. Mm. Although, yes, although startups leaving our incubation and, and the startup platform, they, of course, uh, run in the, in the competition, uh, one million worth of competition under measure 111. They, uh, this is the, the, the dream uh, funds for, for uh, operation. Out of all the startups that have left our Unicorn Hub platform, 66, as many as 66 startups managed to get funding from the National Agency of Entrepreneurship Development. They were able to raise uh, 54 million in total. Out of our medical startups, I'm, I'm not sure whether they are medical startups in a strict sense. They're usually interdisciplinary teams where medicine merges with, with ICT. And so, in other words, I can say the success of the platform is the success of our startups. Just a few um, cases. We have uh, Biomesh. This is a, a startup. Uh, that develops tools to monitor the presence of mold in food and, and corn. We have startups that have been qualified to European Tech and Startup Days uh, contest. Uh, these, uh, they are telemedical startups. For example, Reminds is, is a web-based uh, platform offering virtual reality that can help in therapies of patients with neurological conditions. There is a Femi Box startup. It, uh, it, it won the ranking of Business Club Poland 2021. And they will be uh, given a chance to showcase the product at a startup event in Copenhagen. They develop mobile applications for uh, post delivery care. Another one, very interesting, is Polygon. They, they have developed a, a platform 
for development of new uh, medicaments, especially with special focus on amino acids. Um, they have also been very successful. They, they have been invited to take part in MIT forum in, in Boston. Uh, I'm, I suppose I, I don't really understand at least the last part of your of your talk, but I do believe this is something important and successful. Congratulations. And my, my next question is uh, to Evelina. You co cooperate with Lubin Medicine Cluster. Uh, what are the benefits of it? Well, like uh, every startup needs certain ecosystem, an ecosystem of partners who are mutually complementary, who uh, help a startup to grow. And the key element is the incubation program. If, if we're not in our ecosystem, project ecosystem, if you're not able to help a startup, if you cannot assist them in developing the, the idea, then we uh, refer to Lublin Medical Cluster. This uh, support, this cooperation is very valuable both during the incubation program and after that. Many startups after the period of incubation, they continue to cooperate with the uh, cluster. Well, thank you. Then uh, we know why this is uh, so so important to, to, to keep it going. Well, we need to uh, go on. We have uh, 30 minutes and uh, four panelists uh, to ask a question to uh, Tomasz um, Schmeiter, uh, Lublin Science and Technology Park. Puave Science and Technology Park, a new initiative of WAB startup platform, WAB. So tell us what startups you support and are there any medical related or healthcare related solutions or just traditional IT, which is the most popular these days? In the Lublin region, there are two startup platforms that build a uh, ecosystem for uh, uh, for supporting uh, startup. We are not uh, we are not um, we rather complement each other's action, uh, and uh, when realizing projects, we distribute it over certain branches and industries. So we in Puava took a food industry ecology and we build a strong consortium to um, enhance and build um, uh, to, to enhance uh, business ideas and a representative of uh, uh, one of our guests here uh, is part of this uh, is part of this consortium uh, I'm, I'm talking about mr. Gowombek who representative Netrix group but also universities and research institutes and uh, coming together we decided to collect and strengthen than our business ideas and obviously at the beginning we kept thinking how to make it I mean we will have we will have business ideas to the east of Poland and honestly after so years we are surprised by the cornucopia of ideas coming to us the huge effort that we needed to to undertake last uh, in the last years um, you had uh, previously mentioned where something like 150 start startups we have had over 200 startups so basically we have have over 300 startups in the Lublin region. Our startups from the program 112 uh, and the operational program uh, got over 50 million slotties. Some of those startups decided to have this physical activity in the Lublin region, Lublin Vygotship in Puave, 
launching their own businesses and uh, hiring uh, office space. Uh, in uh, Puławy uh, uh, Technological Park, but also uh, in uh, Institute of uh, Chemical uh, Synthesis. And uh, they are uh, applying for further grants and developing uh, further uh, products and concepts. The uh, branches, the industries that uh, make part of our that, that are somehow constitutive for our uh, for our uh, vivership like food industry and ecology we wanted to use the uh, the, the strongest uh, resources of our uh, vivership of our region Puławy have the first uh, vertical farm where the startup running this farm uh, produces in optimal or optimized conditions produces herbs where, which are then extracted uh, technologically to produce uh, dietary supplements. Mm, so we don't have to choose, uh, we don't have to choose directly the uh, e-health uh, uh, or digital uh, medicine to support medically uh, uh, the, the medical branch bioproduction. OK, one more maybe controversial question. Uh, in fact, um, Puave is a very strong uh, research center second after Lublin. Do you think that there is cooperation between Puave and Lublin? Or is it like an ecosystem where Puave and Lublin are dominating partners? Or do you think that Puave go towards building its own ecosystem? You can see in Poland that there are certain, uh, instead of regional ecosystems, there are more like uh, competitive uh, advantage and cities like centers are trying to build systems on their own. So what's your approach or what's your opinion on that? Maybe we should rather seek for synergy rather than division. I agree. Uh, some time ago, years ago, this was true that uh, Lublin and, and Puaw, they uh, obviously, the, these are centers and potentials of different scale, but Puaw did have a strong agglomeration of a research world. And uh, there were not too many connections between these people working, uh, but uh, from uh, since some years, uh, uh, I mean, uh, over the last uh, period, we are building a common offer, an offer of the region, an offer of the vivership. We also uh, cooperate or engage in developing the new developmental strategy for the Vivature, showing how we can come together to highlight the competencies we have in our region and can be used. That, uh, that obviously uh, concerns um, food uh, and agricultural industry. Uh, we are developing uh, projects as Puave and as part of uh, Lublin Vivership. And I hope that our um, efforts will soon show that we are effective and we have some, so many opportunities to offer uh, that we can, uh, that the business can come to us and get get our support um, uh, uh, as far as knowledge is concerned, uh, research is concerned, but also business-wise um, from, uh, from uh, business support institutions. In a way, you're right, this could be a systemic element on the map of a vivership and in a way a cluster of a, of a kind, so that's a good direction because you're also running certain uh, concepts and ideas that are not present, that are not initiated in Lublin. Um, and, and the project that we are running is the WAB, is very interesting for new businesses. It's a pilot project supported by uh, Ministry of Development, 
as a uh, technological park in um, in Puave, cooperating with the University of uh, Na Natural Sciences in, in uh, Poznan, we applied for a project how to uh, a project dealing with pre-incubation stage of business ideas. We prepared this proposal uh, quite well because we were chosen as leaders of the project. So we start with the project, we, we commence the project just in, a, in next uh, Thursday on the 13th of, 14th of, of uh, September. And uh, uh, we are developing a model for supporting uh, leaders of innovation and various types of uh, inno innovators, uh, showing pathways uh, and ideas uh, how to move from idea to business. Uh, wholehearted congratulations. Uh, I wasn't aware um, of, of that starting point, so I'm really happy to know that. Okay, because we have a representative of, um, of, of the company you mentioned, of a partner in your, in your cluster or in your partnership, uh, uh, that is to say uh, Netrix, a private company that is extremely effective in getting grants, getting Euro European grants for innovative solutions and also having Mm, a, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, so how do you see your role as a unit that is not financed uh, from the city from a state budget or European budget so what's your offer and how do you address it how do you manage to address it to the uh, medical sector? Many, many thanks for the invitation. Um, I would say our role is larger, is, is wider than this. We are actually, um, we take part in legislative works in building um, the ecosystem, and we are consulting all the projects uh, the, mm, within the new financing perspective, and we uh, support our inno innovators cooperating with uh, in their efforts to build innovative solutions. Uh, we uh, offer incubators and other support. Uh, uh, projects like um, uh, 20 projects for IT uh, re-infrastructure, um, uh, 20, 20 um, projects with uh, rebuilding the infrastructure of 20 uh, medical units. We also directly support uh, start -up, startups. Uh, we have 30 companies that we invest in one third of which are, uh, belong to broadly understood health industry. Obviously, this is medtech, this is IT solutions, organizational uh, stuff uh, addressed to uh, uh, management and, uh, and health organization. Uh, structural organization of health units. We strongly believe it may be profitable. So you want to say that this medical brand, this medical strand, uh, can be can be something uh, strategic for. Uh, uh, I know that we have a background. I know that we have a good background in IT. But what about medicine? Yes, uh, my answer is true. Uh, medicine meets with uh, uh, IT in Lublin. This is exactly the spot. Apart from Wrocław and Warszawa, where, who are well known for their IT regions, and uh, Lublin's distinctive point, Lublin's competitive advantage is IT plus medical, uh, medical, uh, medical um, potential uh, that will be able to attract medtech uh, innovative solutions. We buy them, we develop them. We have many hospitals, so we have to we have a we have a laboratory to test the solutions and then to go with them to global 
market. So what would you expect from the city or from the vivership in a process of supporting, uh, or maybe from the cluster in, in, in terms of support? Perhaps still there is something to be done. How do you define help? Well, actually, uh, a lot depends on talks, uh, relations, and and um, and there must be animators that uh, lead this, um, that are driving forces like engines for developing ideas. A good idea would be to build a platform for a simple, uh, for starts up to. Uh, to uh, register, to uh, signal that they have ideas, and uh, and in this way look for brokerage, a platform that would broker uh, the, uh, and allow building starts up or building consortia with uh, with uh, uh, with, for instance, research units that are interested. Um, uh, and a uh, startup will uh, develop applications that will have testing possibilities uh, and then implementation will be easier. <clears throat> Actually, uh, before I came here, I did talk about a company that develops um, that develops a uh, application how to handle traffic on the corridors of a uh, of a uh, hospital unit, um, and this pilot uh, application could be financed. There is there, there is money for that. Uh, so we could launch this. Uh, things are going on. Uh, do you, in your portfolio, in, in the Netrix Ventures, do you have medical companies? One third of your portfolio is, is, is medical. And in Lublin, all of them are either from Lublin or from Lublin region. Puave is um, yeah, this uh, startup platforms from Puave and medical. Uh, which has ended uh, WAB uh, uh, incubation period. It builds support for uh, uh, for uh, kids with uh, asthma uh, and presented its uh, solutions uh, on huge medical fairs. Wholehearted congratulations. We can see uh, things are going on, things are happening. There is perhaps a number of elements uh, for us to become a Silicon Valley or met Silicon Valley, but things are going on. Yeah, what is missing, and I strongly wish it that, that, that Lublin is able to have it is a unicorn it's uh, let me call it a, um, uh, to develop it like a people um, people decided to build a startup and they sold it later on with huge success and they started a new uh, uh, a new uh, or a branch of new um, uh, startups so a mafia means that people who started the first start up startups build or invest into further startups it's like a um, uh, like a um, uh, again a cascade effect uh, we strongly believe yes that we are going to our our successful initiatives will bring more interested uh, uh, investors. Okay, let me, in my last questions, um, I would be back to this mafia stuff, uh, but but um, but I would like to ask uh, uh, Magdalena Stachyra, representing um, uh, uh, your present for 20 years, uh, the innovative park, the technological park, what's your role in medical uh, ecosystem? Our main idea is to support beginners, beginning companies, beginning ideas. Uh, and our help is done through uh, EU funds, uh, majority of projects. And uh, we use this uh, ecosystem of our uh, technology park and uh, uh, with a, a technological incubator. And the companies in the field of IT, but also others, leading technological industries uh, that are uh, in match with uh, smart uh, smart uh, specialization of our viva chip. So uh, I believe figures will tell us uh, 
what we are talking about. So two years of help, of incubation, uh, each startup gets from 30 to 70,000 zlotys. And uh, mm, we enter into grant projects. Uh, they are very, very needed. They are very required for the beginning. Uh, let me show you that in our last application uh, contest, there were 250 people trying to apply for a grant. No, I think this is a relatively good number, and this also allows us to choose the best or the optimal activities that can pay off, that can that can be successful on the market. Two or three years ago, uh, there was a project in Nova uh, uh, announced uh, by our uh, technology park, invested nine million and twenty startups, um, a capital venture in these uh, startups. Um, the park uh, promised us a new Nokia some years ago, but uh, we are at the beginning of the project, and I think to sum up in statistics, would be 20 startups stays uh, and survives. I'm um, sorry, was it like a Nokia like a thing? Um, 20 startups, uh, only four at the end of uh, last year were, uh, were financially sound, were profitable. Yeah, in Lubartov, you know, let me add to this um, a company that developed with the UMCS, innovative, um, uh, uh, innovative solution for 5G. If this company starts, this can be a Nokia stuff, but this did it develop in technological park. I'm not sure, I can't sure about the history of this, but I know about the project. They did a test for with big American partner and with Orange, and they um, they B b they managed to beat the record for uh, uh, throughput and uh, actually it's top-notch technology over the Japanese and Chinese technologies available right now. If this comes true, this can be our, your, uh, our, our Lublin star, very, very close to what Nokia did when they started. Okay, so uh, uh, basically we see that uh, investing in what we are good at uh, is, 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 is always a good uh, su uh, suggestion. Okay, let me be clear. I didn't want to be pessimistic. It's not the fact, it's not the case that when certain concepts uh, die in the way of implementation, it does not mean that the companies disappear. What I wanted to say is that this 20% is, you know, is the cost of learning. Uh, and uh, those companies come back with new ideas. But what I wanted to say is that innovativeness, uh, investments in innovativeness requires support. This is basically the point. The point is they need support because there is huge risk, there is a lot of unknown at the beginning, and investment is absolutely necessary. So this 20% is not a bad result. The money we hope to get uh, from buying out uh, our shares in these uh, um, in, in these ventures, we will re, uh, recapitalize or reuse in further capitalization. And I hope new ideas will be extremely interesting. OK, what about your project Poland Prize? I think it's another step towards the developing of startup uh, ecosystem to, uh, to get uh, startups from abroad. Yes, we are an operator with a big scale, uh, with a 10 million for a project Connect Poland Prize, and there are four stages where we want to have 26 startups, young people from abroad, we are mostly thinking about Ukraine, who would like to register their company in Poland, in the Republic of Poland, and then they will get money to start with. It's 50,000 zlotys for the beginning for the registration, uh, which is slightly over 10,000 uh, uh, euros. Then they get 25,000 zloty uh, for implementation, uh, and uh, this is slightly over 50,000 euros. So what we, uh, we uh, provide them with the ecosystem, 
Uh, so, you know, meeting places like ours is, is good because hospitals could also be good business partners. Uh, when you have a, mm, a startup with a grant for implementation and there's no better place than a hospital to test it, to, to test, to, to, um, to early test, to implement it. So 26 partners. Okay, fine, that's good, but I need to, I'm sorry, I need to to, uh, uh, to ask a question about uh, Belarus. Uh, we are where we are. We tried uh, what we did to attract Belarusian startups to Poland. Um, Ukrainians uh, somehow worked much better, and Kiev attracted over 50 such uh, startups. We failed. So, my question is in our actions, should we be more proactive? Shouldn't be more aggressive in a positive sense? Should we look for uh, only those close uh, market or should we maybe look for um, a startup uh, uh, environments in Kazakhstan, uh, Armenia, uh, to look for, you know, to look for early stage level? We do not know what will happen in, in Ukraine soon. Yes, absolutely agree. We were looking for Belarus and, and Ukraine. Belarus is out of the system, so certainly we are focusing on Ukraine, but you're absolutely right. In following uh, rounds or re, uh, re additions of the system, and we also hope for the city. Yeah, as a city, uh, uh, as a city, you may help us. Yes, certainly, we also have our directions for looking for students in the countries I mentioned. So um, yes, uh, I strongly believe that uh, our medical students in Lublin will also help us. Thank you very much for this voice. I'm afraid we are running out of time. Uh, I would be happy to learn more. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps it's not very fortunate, but old age and active aging uh, is a topic uh, that comes to an end. I would like to ask Ms. Uh, President uh, Ivanitska, uh, you as an institution coordinate various kind of uh, initiatives for, uh, for uh, old uh, age uh, citizens. Obviously, uh, it's very, very fashionable to talk about uh, old age uh, uh, e-health services. Um, uh, what's your opinion? What's your experience? What are the experiences of old age citizens uh, in the functioning in healthcare? Um, so, so what's the business here? Well, we are witnessing uh, an unprecedented uh, development of technology, and everybody should have access to technology regardless of, of age, whether this is a mobile phone or the internet or, or electronic mail. Uh, whether this is actually happening, I'm not sure. I think seniors are not part of this revolution to, to such an extent um, as we would like to see. Many, many seniors don't have computer computers or, or latest uh, mobile phones or smartphones, even if they do, uh, they can't use it effectively. So this new digitalization is a challenge. Some of, uh, some of seniors uh, born in the 1940s or even 50s, they can't uh, receive uh, and operate messaging systems. And the internet, uh, they say they don't like it, perhaps because they can't use it. There are many reasons behind it, and our organization, uh, the University of Third Age, uh, we, we know it. We have many students, we, and we hear from them that at the beginning of, of the pandemic, we, we, we try to uh, we try to offer some, some training sessions, uh, how to operate the internet, how to navigate websites, but somehow it failed. We even invited uh, speakers, trainers from local universities, and these online classes had very low attendance. Um, 
just a few dozens of uh, uh, of students, uh, trainees. So we weren't even able to uh, complete all training sessions. So those who have a computer at home and know how to use them, they are quite um, happy uh, and, and familiar with um, e-health uh, services. And this is probably the most popular uh, among seniors, because seniors like to browse the net for, for, for advice, for recommendations concerning health uh, status. Maybe not everybody know how, knows how to use yeah, the e-patient account. They do want to do it, but they, but they don't know it sometimes. So digitization uh, was a challenge during the pandemic. We even designed a, a program for, for our participants, for our students. We wanted to promote um, digitization, uh, but they insisted on having their handouts or lecture materials printed. They wanted hard copies. And this is when uh, we realized that simply because many of our students are excluded, are digitally excluded because they cannot use the internet effectively. So even when learning about it, they wanted to have uh, printed copies of uh, teaching materials. Well, this is a very interesting subject. Maybe it deserves the whole extra panel involving business because the senior environment is also diverse. We all have parents. We know how different they are. For example, my parents are not so old, but they, they use online banking. They use e-health um, services. Uh, of course, at some point they had to learn it, but they are uh, they're quite happy about using it. So whether this is children, grandchildren, maybe business, they all should come together to help seniors make uh, the best of uh, what the digital era has to offer. So there must be a system behind it. But it seems like we haven't started even to think about it. Well, true, uh, we should think about including the young generation. Perhaps uh, will be students, uh, because may, many of our uh, third university, third age university students need this kind of classes. So even during our uh, computer classes, uh, they were held at the technical university, and there was a group of uh, trainees. And during the classes, they unfortunately they, they they tended to forget what they were taught. So they had nobody to talk to about this. They had nobody to practice with between the classes. And especially if they don't have a computer at home, they they cannot simply contain it. Well, uh, thank you for this contribution. Uh, we, we realize this is a very important subject, and uh, this needs a separate conversation. Uh, we are open to your ideas, to your suggestions, how we can help. We are, we'll be happy to help. Mm, well, this is half past four, so we should be closing now, but uh, there is a final round, so everybody please Answer my last question, just five to ten seconds. What else should we do as, as an ecosystem, as a municipality, as a cluster, and so on and so forth, to bring us closer to the best medical ecosystems in the world. Director, back to you. 15 seconds. Well, our region has great experts in medicine, in uh, 
uh, information technology. To to jest nasza szansa. Just use them. Mamy odpowiednie dokumenty, które są This is our chance. We have albo w fazie strategy documents które pozwolą nam either approved or about to be approved that will help us uh, apply for funding. So just make the best of what we have. I believe this is possible and I wish that to myself, the region, so that when we come together in a couple of years, we'll be proud of ourselves that others want to learn from us. Well, uh, on my part, we should learn from startups. I think the best methodology for startups is to get to work, learn through errors, uh, draw conclusions, and keep working, keep changing. This is how the startups should work. Well, my idea is to include seniors, uh, people with disabilities, uh, excluded citizens into uh, innovat innovative uh, processes. Well, I think we should have uh, some kind of a voucher for clinical tests, mm, clinical tests across hospitals, uh, healthcare facilities. They will also uh, this will this can this can help improve uh, the quality of services. So what what we need, I think we should keep growing this ecosystem. Keep we should keep inviting new partners, expand the the, the possibilities, because there are new institutions uh, entities coming up that maybe contribute um, may may contribute. So we also need funds and. I'm afraid I have to stop this at this moment, so thank you, man. Well, Director, well, we have to cooperate in uh, searching, um, identifying needs, and we have to be very precise of our, our own uh, needs. Well, cooperate, share tasks and objectives, uh, be open to cooperation with with uh, everyone. And, gentlemen, well, we should believe in ourselves and keep going ahead. And we have uh, our guests uh, on, uh, online uh, from Łódź, Bartłomiej. What would you recommend? Well, uh, uh, talking to Elżbieta, we have a Silver Star program uh, for innovators. Łukasz, innovation vouchers. I think uh, Agency of Medical Research has them, so you can uh, use them as well. And what else can I recommend? Be patient. Uh, working in a transfer phase is working with failure. Uh, what you can do certainly is to scale up, invite more and more participants. Uh, there will be a greater chance to have more unicorns. Well, thank you for this recommendation from Wuch, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, for this panel. Uh, for me personally, it's been a very interesting exchange. I hope the same for you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for your applause. Thank you for all your proposals, all your solutions. Thank you, Mariusz, for chairing this uh, final debate. The conference is uh, drawing to an end. I, I think the greatest advantage of this event was uh, a, a very broad audience of stakeholders. We have heard a number of discussions, a very uh, substantive content as a takeaway. So as we promised, this is just the beginning of a series of um, meetings, of events. We'll keep you posted on our agenda, our schedule. Uh, have a good afternoon.